Hello world, welcome to Espresso DevCon 22. You're watching the second day of our live broadcast from Brno in the Czech Republic. We have prepared for you a day packed with exciting talks by guest speakers and Espresso engineers. So let's cut straight to the chase. We'll start our broadcast with none other than Espresso's Vice President of Software Platforms, Ivan Grochotkov who will deliver the second keynote speech of this conference. Ivan is the go-to person for all sorts of advice here at Espressive, but he has also gained a reputation for providing great support to the entire community of developers out there. Ivan will talk us through all that's new in ESPIDF version 5. His talk will introduce new features and important breaking changes in the latest version of ESPIDF. He will also revisit the release and maintenance policy of IDF in general, and he'll also discuss expressive strategy for upgrading to new IDF releases. Then, Sergei Silnov from Espressive's office in Brno will talk about the IDF Component Manager, which is a relatively new addition to ESP IDF. Nevertheless, dozens of components are already available in the registry. Sergei will help you find out how your project can benefit from using the component manager. The third presentation of our morning session will be delivered by Espressif's Tomasz Rezucha from our office in Brno. Tomasz will talk about board support packages and the ways in which they help developers start prototyping even faster. Tomasz believes that a development board is a great way to start prototyping on Espressif chips. However, it is not always easy to put together all drivers for onboard chips and to configure your shiny new development board for something more profound than a mere hello world example. Board support packages can help IDF users tackle this challenge. Our morning session will finish with our colleagues from Espressive's Pune office in India, Yogesh Mantri and Sunika Rafi. Their talk is entitled ESP hosted using ESP32 as a connectivity coprocessor. It will explain that ESP hosted is a project with which users can take advantage of ESP32's Wi Fi and Bluetooth connectivity directly from a different MCU or Linux host, which is connected using an SPI SDIO UART interface. But first, Let's listen to Ivan's keynote speech about all that's new in ESPIDF version 5. People take notes. Hi, everyone. My name is Ivan Grohotkov. I'm Vice President of Software Platforms at Espressive. Welcome to the second day of Espressive Developer Conference. My talk today is about ESP IDF 5.0. Before we get started, let me tell you very briefly about ESP IDF, just in case you haven't used it yet. ESP IDF stands for Espressive IoT Development Framework, and it is an SDK for building IoT applications for Espressive chips. It is not the only software framework for Espressive chips, but ESP IDF is the project where we first introduce support for all new chips and chip products that we release. ESP IDF is an open source project with many active contributors, both inside and outside Espressive. And it is also a foundation for many other Espressive software frameworks, applications, and solutions. Now that I've briefly introduced IDF, I will tell you about the purpose of this talk. We will start with an overview of IDF release and maintenance policy, and also look at the status of the currently available releases. Then we will cover important changes in 5.0 that you need to keep in mind if you're upgrading. And I will also give you some of the reasons why you should consider upgrading. Finally, I will mention a few things coming to IDF in the future. And by the end of this talk, I hope that you will know enough about IDF 5.0 to apply it in your project. So since 2016, when we released the first version of IDF, there have been 66 releases of IDF project. 
When releasing a new version, we use semantic versioning model, and this model defines the meaning of release numbers. In semantic versioning, the release number contains three components, major, minor, and patch. The patch uh, component of the release number is incremented to indicate that the release contains bug fixes. The minor component of the release number gets incremented to indicate that the release may contain bug fixes and new features. And the major number is incremented that aside from new features and bug fixes, the release may also contain breaking changes. Now, se semantic version describes how to interpret the release numbers, but it doesn't define which release numbers the project will actually use. Uh, to meet the needs of our users, IDF maintains a release branch for every minor version. And I will explain what that means in a moment. The lines in this graph show branches in ESP IDF Git repository. The development primarily happens on the master branch. This is where only features are implemented and where, where the fixes are made. The circles on this graph are releases. Uh, the bigger ones are minor releases. The uh, filled one is the major release and the smaller ones are bug fix releases. For each major dot minor version, for example, 4.4, we maintain a release branch. And release branch is necessary to make bug fix releases for a given minor version. So release v4.4 is the branch which we use to make bug fixes for v4.4. For example, v4.4.1 and v4.4.2 are the two bug fix releases on this branch. Unlike master, development on release branches primarily occurs using so-called backports. And a backport is the term we use for taking the changes that were previously done on the master branch and then applying them to one of the older release branches. And this is done using Git rebase or Git cherry pick. <laughs> so this illustration is uh, simplified because the positions of the circles on the uh, horizontal uh, axis on the, on the timeline, uh, it doesn't actually match uh, what it was in, in reality. Uh, this illustration is just to explain the concept of release branches and bug fix releases that happen on those branches. Normally, we only backport bug fixes into previous release branches, and normally we don't backport features. Sometimes, however, we do backport features uh, when several conditions are met. First of all, the risk of regressions from backporting the feature is considered low, and also if the feature is relatively self-contained. Uh, one case when this happens is when introducing support for new chips. It is very common that a new minor release of ESP IDF adds support for one of our new chips. However, in the first release, not all features of the chip are implemented yet. In this case, subsequent bug fix releases on the, on the given branch may add support for the missing features for the chip that which was supported on that branch. Doesn't mean that every feature will be supported, but typically some features will be added in subsequent bug fix releases. However, even if we consider fixes, not every fix will be backported to all the release branches. So to understand when we backport a specific fix uh, and to which branches we backport it, we have to talk about the IDF support period policy. The latest version of IDF support period policy was introduced together with IDF 4.1 release. Uh, under this policy, every release branch is maintained for three, sorry, two and a half years. Uh, this two and a half year period is split between a one year service period and a one and a half year maintenance period. During the service period, uh, since the release of the first, uh, first release of this branch, so the, the certain major dot minor version, this release branch is recommended for new designs. So if you are making a new product, then look at the supported releases and pick a release that is in the service period. If your development timeline is longer, you may want to look at one of the branches that hasn't reached support period yet, 
so for example, one of the pre-release branches. Uh, however, for typical development timelines, pick the uh, release that is in the service period. During the service period, we try to fix most of the bugs that are found in this release uh, and backport them to the, that release branch. Uh, we also sometimes may backport some of the features for the newly introduced chips. The subsequent one and a half year maintenance period is when we only backport high severity bug fixes and security fixes. So in this one, one and a half year period, the branch is no longer recommended for new designs. If you have an existing product which is based on this branch, you can continue using it. But this is the period where uh, there will be less support provided for this branch. And as you uh, go closer to the end of the maintenance period, you should consider upgrading to the, one of the supported branches so that you don't end up using an end of life release. If we look at uh, another graph, and this is the graph you can find on the front page of ESP IDF uh, project on GitHub, uh, you can see how these support period periods are uh, aligned right now. For example, uh, as of now, the 4.4 release is in service and the rest of the releases are in their maintenance periods. So if you're starting de developing for a new product, then 4.4 at the moment is the uh, release you want to develop with. However, 5.0 release is close, so you, if your product development is only starting just right now, you may want to consider um, using the 5.0 release, and this is going to be what we will talk about uh, the rest of the talk. Here is another way how we can look at the current support periods of the release branches. In this table, you can see what is the latest bug fix release for each of the branches. And uh, Keep in mind that if you're watching this talk later, this table probably will get out of date. So check ESP IDF uh, GitHub repository for the, laser uh, for the list of latest releases. Now, if we look back at this diagram, uh, suppose you have a product based, say, on version 4.3.1. When the new release comes out, should you upgrade? Uh, should you upgrade, for instance, to 4.3.2 or 4.4.1 or 5.0? So let's talk for a second about what to expect when upgrading to a new release. If you are upgrading to bug fix releases, uh, what you expect are fixes for security, stability and performance. Uh, sometimes if you're using a newly introduced chip, you may also expect certain features to be added in a bug fix release. If you are upgrading to a minor release, typically upgrading to minor release uh, is more work because um, more changes might happen. And for example, the release notes uh, for minor releases are typically longer than for bug fix releases. So you need to uh, check uh, more things uh, when upgrading. The reasons to upgrade to a minor release typically are to get new chip support, to get new features introduced in this release and to avoid using an end of life release. So for example, if you're on a branch that is already in the maintenance period, you may want to upgrade to the branch which is in the service period to avoid using an end of life release. And that would mean upgrading to one of the next minor releases. And finally, what does it mean to upgrade to the next major release? Typically, the motivation is similar for upgrading to a minor release. So get new chip support, get new features, avoid using end of life release. But there is higher effort to upgrade. And this is because of the breaking changes. So let us talk about the breaking changes next. ESP IDF aims to maintain source level compatibility between releases. Uh, what this means is that if you have a project that could be compiled and would run correctly with the previous version of ESP IDF, then if you compile it with the next version of ESP IDF and you run it, it would behave correctly as well. Um, so anything that prevents 
that correct operation would be considered as a break-in change. We try to avoid break-in changes to not violate semantic versioning in bug fix and minor releases. Sometimes, however, break-in changes uh, still occur, and this happens primarily for two reasons. One is that uh, sometimes break-in change is necessary to fix some higher severity issue. For example, a certain security issue might be fixed by making a break-in change. So let's say um, a certain uh, cipher or a certain uh, cryptographic protocol that has that is now considered insecure might be disabled by default in one of the new bug fix or minor releases. And technically that would be a break-in change, but this is a break-in change that is aimed at improving security, and this is why we still make it. Um, other category of the break-in change is uh, unintentional break-in changes. So unintentional break-in changes occur when we miss certain way uh, in which an API can be used, or uh, we miss a, a reason why the, the change would be a break-in change when doing code review. Uh, it is easier to notice break-in changes in APIs, like changes to function signatures or changes to uh, names. Uh, it is more difficult to notice break-in changes uh, that are behavioral changes. So something that used to work in a, in a certain way, an API that used to uh, produce a certain result, it might start behaving differently in a new version. And this is sometimes uh, what we miss during uh, code review. So in this case, we appreciate reports or uh, issues on our uh, ESP IDF GitHub repository. If we find some, uh, if the users find some breaking change, then typically we we'll try to fix it in the next bug fix release. So more information on API stability, you can find in the uh, API stability page of the ESP IDF programming guide. So now uh, that we talked about the breaking changes in general, let's move on to the main uh, topic, and that is the 5.0. So breaking changes in 5.0 have been uh, breaking changes in 5.0 can be broken down into three categories. So first is uh, the changes that we just couldn't implement in a normal breaking way. And uh, therefore we were waiting for a major release to introduce those uh, breaking changes. For instance, uh, this is the uh, change of the uh, time T type from 32 bit to 64 bit. Uh, which we did in 5.0, and I'm going to tell about this later. So in this case, essentially the feature or the change itself requires to be uh, to make a breaking change, and uh, therefore it has to happen in a major release. Another category of changes are uh, some changes that we do to make development and maintenance of ESP IDF uh, possible uh, in the future. So this is cleaning up or removing APIs that have been previously deprecated, improving naming and uh, code structure, improving some design like uh, adding return values or fixing bad API decisions that we've done uh, in the past. Uh, and finally, the, the last category is switching to safer or more secure defaults. Uh, so that includes, for instance, uh, the example that I gave with uh, security. So if a certain protocol or um, a certain method is considered insecure, then changing the default to a different method that is considered more secure might be a breaking change, but it is uh, an example of what we uh, could do in a major release. Another change in 5.0 is that we have started actually collecting the list of uh, changes in the migration guides section of the IDF programming guide. In the previous releases, we only mentioned the breaking changes in the release notes, but uh, release notes are already quite long and it's uh, sometimes pretty easy to miss something there. So putting the breaking changes and the migration uh, instructions for those changes into the programming guide hopefully will uh, allow you to, uh, to, fi to find how to upgrade to this release easier. So we will continue maintaining this migration guide section in the future, and in the programming guide, you will be able to find entries, for example, migrating from IDF 4.4 to IDF 5, uh, migrating from IDF 5.0 to 5.1, and so on. 
So now on to the major changes in 5.0. I listed here as several categories. Most of the changes I'm going to be talking about, or actually all the changes I'm going to be talking about, they are mentioned in the migration guides section of the programming guide. So if you want more details about one of those changes, uh, please take a look at the programming guide. Uh, these changes that I'm going to talk about, they're arranged in several categories. And I'm going to start with uh, probably the most noticeable one, uh, and that is the components that ESPIDF actually contains. Previously, when developing ESPIDF, uh, when introducing a new major version or minor version of ESPIDF, we would often add new components. The new components typically provided some additional functionality, additional features, um, support for more protocols, libraries, peripherals, and so on. ESPIDF 5.0 is uh, no, here notable because it's the first release where we actually remove components. Uh, here is a list of components that have been removed. Uh, primarily those components, we consider them to be relatively high level, so not very close to hardware. And these components, uh, for instance, uh, the LibSodium is a cryptographic library, Seaboard, Jasmine, and XPAT are uh, protocol parsers, uh, uh, NGHDP, SHTLib, CoAP, also uh, protocol related libraries, uh, ESP modem, MDNS, ESP WebSocket clients, ASAO, also uh, protocol related, and uh, free Modbus. Uh, it's a Modbus library now, we call it ESP Modbus. These libraries and also several other uh, libraries that have been present as components inside examples folder of ESP IDF are now no longer available in ESP IDF, but that doesn't mean that you can't use them. So uh, these components are now maintained in other repositories under expressive GitHub organization. For example, we have IDF extra components, which contains many of those that I have uh, mentioned. Uh, also ESP protocols, ESP Modbus, and several other repositories. The reason why we have moved these components out of ESP IDF is to make the release cycles of these components independent of ESP IDF. At the moment, you would have to wait for the next ESP IDF bug fix release if uh, you want to upgrade one of those libraries to the next version. So it means that we couldn't release bug fixes or features for those components quickly enough. Now that these components are outside of ESP IDF, they can have separate release cycles and we can release bug fix releases as often as necessary. And you, know, you don't have to wait for the next IDF release if you just want to upgrade one of those components. These components uh, can be found at our component registry, componentsespressive.com, and they can be easily added to the project using the IDF component manager and IDF by add dependency command like shown here. Uh, ESP IDF Component Manager is one of the major features that we are introducing and relying on in IDF 5.0. There is another talk at developer conference about Component Manager. I encourage you to, to watch it. I think it's one of the uh, really nice features that uh, we are adding. The second category of major changes that I'm going to talk about is related to header files and APIs. Uh, you will probably notice this if you're uh, trying to build existing code that was written for IDF 4.x uh, or 3.x even with IDF 5. Uh, so it will typically show up as some unresolved inclusions, um, missing declaration of some functions, and uh, missing declaration of some identifiers. The reasons for those uh, errors or uh, uh, compiler warnings would be because some, some header files have been restructured. First, we have uh, cleaned up some implicit dependencies between header files. A couple examples here, ESP system is a header file that previously used to include a lot of system related functions. Uh, subsequently in uh, IDF uh, 4.3, I think, we have moved some of those functions uh, into more specialized header files, for example, Random number generation was moved from ESP system to ESP random. But for compatibility, because IDF 4.3 was a minor release, ESP system would still include ESP random so that including ESP system, you would still get 
declarations of those functions. Uh, in Now that we are in IDF 5.0, we had a chance to clean this up and now ESP system includes just the bare minimum and ESP random, ESP Mac and ESP chip info are separate. Another example here is that for Yata's header files, which commonly are included in a lot of uh, source files uh, in IDF and in, in user projects, Priato's header files used to include a lot of um, header files from other components of ESP IDF. For example, including any Priato's header would also uh, result in inclusion of a header file esptimer.h. And that meant that you could use ESP timer functions like ESP timer get time without actually having include ESP timer.h in your source file. Um, and this this actually uh, also led to problems that we couldn't break the dependency of free autos on ESP timer because of those implicit includes. Uh, so in 5.0, this is being cleaned up and now free autos header files no longer include ESP timer.h. So if you use some ESP timer function and you haven't added in this include into your source file, you will need to add it. Um, the final category of those changes to header files and APIs are some typo fixes, for example, something that previously used to be called um, ESP JTT encrypted um, mitten. So with the missing T, uh, this was now, the typo was now fixed and uh, the name is now correct. Uh, this is something that it, we do in 5.0 just to clean up those APIs and so that in the future, if you stumble on those names, they, they will look uh, more reasonable. Now moving on to the next category, and that is the tool chain. In 5.0, we are upgrading GCC to uh, one of the newer releases. Previously, IDF 4.x have been using GCC 8.4. Now we are moving on to GCC 11.2. That by itself uh, can be a break and change for some of the applications because GCC now produces more compilation warnings and compilation errors um, in this uh, more recent release. So GCC notices more problems in the code uh, that will manifest themselves as warnings or errors. So depending on your project's uh, settings for compilation warnings, you may get new warnings or new compilation errors. And the best recommendation here is to actually go through them and try to fix them. Um, although compiler does sometimes produce uh, false positives, um, warnings or uh, well, rarely errors, it is usually better to make the compiler happy and that typically results in a better quality code. Uh, we have the GCC release notes and migration guides linked from IDF migration guides, so check out the programming guide, the migration guide section, and you will find uh, the changes that you may need to do from the GCC perspective. I also already mentioned the time T change. Uh, so that is to resolve the year 2038 problem. In 2038, the 32-bit Unix uh, epoch uh, time T will overflow. So um, the software needs to upgrade to 64-bit time T type. Uh, this has been requested a long time ago, uh, but we couldn't make this in a we couldn't make this change in a non-breaking way. So this had to wait until the major release and now with 5.0 we are finally switching the default type to 64-bit. So this probably will not actually cause breaking changes to most of the applications uh, but if you are dealing with time t like doing some conversions or arithmetic you need to check whether uh, you are mixing any 32-bit type uh, anywhere accidentally. And the last two changes in the tool chain area they are kind of related uh, this is related to the way UIN32T and IN32T types are uh, defined. Previously in 4.x releases, the way those types were defined were, was actually different for Extensa and RISC-V architecture. For example, on Extensa, UIN32 was defined as unsigned end, and for RISC-V it was defined unsigned long. So we are unifying this, and in 5.x, uh, this type will be defined the same way as unsigned long, both for Extensa and RISC-V. 
And actually, this is also the way this type is defined in upstream GCC for 32 bit ARM risk five extensor architectures. So we are just removing this uh, behavior that in expressive tool chains, expressive extensor tool chains, UN32 has been defined as unsigned in, in the past. Uh, however, do note that other compilers like CLang, for instance, define UN32 as unsigned in still. So uh, this is something that you have to be careful in your applications when writing the code to not make assumptions about the way UN32T is defined. Uh, the practical way this manifests in most applications is through format string errors. For example, in the, this code, um, if you're printing out an IN32T value uh, using the percent %x modifier, uh, for, sorry, format specifier, then when upgrading to IDF5, you will get uh, the warning or the error actually uh, that is shown here. So the compiler will, will tell you that the format specifier says unsigned int, but actually int32t is uh, uh, a long. So and lo long to int conversion uh, cannot be done implicitly well, in the case of uh, format specifiers. So the compiler uh, asks you to change this to percent %lx. Now, the recommended way to solve this is to use uh, the header, header file called intypes.h. And this header file provides uh, macros, like here shown PRIX32, which ex expands to the correct format specifier for the 32-bit uh, uh, fixed width type in 32T um, and with a hexadecimal representation, so X. Using this format uh, macro, PRI X32, will work correctly with every compiler, with every IDF release. And this change is backwards compatible as well. So if you have a project that needs to be built both for IDF 4.x and IDF 5.x, uh, this way, if you change it this way, it will be built successfully. So now on to the next category of changes, the build system. Uh, the most noticeable change here is that we are finally removing the support for legacy GNU make based build system. Uh, this build system has been the default uh, for IDF since IDF 1.0 to IDF 3.3. In IDF 4.0, we have introduced CMake based build system and make uh, based build system was made legacy. And in this release in 5.0, the make-based build system is removed. If you still have a project that has been using the make-based build system, you can upgrade it to CMake uh, using the script that we provide. Uh, this script you can run in any of IDF 4.x releases, and it will try to convert your make-based project to CMake. <clears throat> it will work primarily for uh, simpler projects that uh, stick to uh, ESP IDF uh, build system usage as we show in the examples. If you have some very complex or custom component, then that will you will have to upgrade to the CMake based build system yourself. If you have been using other chips than ESP32, so ESP32 S2, ESP32 S3, or ESP32 C3, then it means you have you are already using CMake based build system and there is nothing to worry about. Only ESP32 was supported in the legacy GNU make based build system. The second change here that you probably will also run into when upgrading to IDF 5.0 is that dependencies on certain components have now to be declared explicitly. In previous IDF releases, in all 4.x releases, with the CMake build system, you could actually include header files from the components mentioned here, driver, EPUs, ESP timer, and so on, without declaring dependency in CMake. Uh, this was actually not intended. It was just a result that some of other components, which we consider common components and components that do not require to be uh, dependent upon explicitly, like free autos, uh, these components had dependencies on those other components from this list. And that created a transitive dependency. So uh, because your component by default would depend on free autos, it would also get a dependency on ESP timer or driver or some other components. 
In practice, this resulted in a difficulty to reduce the size of the build. So even if you have a very simple application, it was difficult to build just the bare minimum number of components because of those dependencies. For example, even an application that used no networking at all, it would still compile LWIP, uh, ESP Wi-Fi, ESP event, and some other libraries. So in 5.0, this is cleaned up and uh, a number of those uh, dependencies are removed. So you will have to declare uh, dependencies on these components now explicitly. And this is done by adding these components to the requires or pre-requires list in your project, uh, sorry, in your components CMake list file. Uh, typically, the way the, 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 those missing dependencies will manifest themselves is that you will see that some header file is not found. For example, you're including GPIOH or you're including ESPTimer.h and the compiler complains that it cannot find the header file. And this most likely is because of missing requirement in the build system. Um, another couple of small changes that you're less likely to notice, uh, the way extra component di directories uh, variable is defined uh, in 5.0, this now has to be a CMake list. And actually the reason for this change is that in 5.0, we are finally adding support for building IDF projects with spaces in the path. Previously, uh, this was not supported, but uh, for example, on Windows, it's very common to have a space in the username uh, or a space in some name of some directory. So uh, this change was necessary to support um, building with spaces and parts. We are also upgrading CMake to a more recent release, 3.16. Uh, 3.16 is possible to install on most up-to-date Linux distributions and uh, on macOS as well. Uh, but if you're running an older Linux distribution, then you either need to upgrade or you need to install CMake uh, by other means, for example, by compiling it from source or by adding some other package registry where a recent enough CMake version is available. This doesn't affect Windows users because for Windows, we always install uh, CMake as part of ESP IDF installation. So it's already one of the latest versions. And now on to the peripheral categories. Um, for peripherals, a lot of drivers in ESP IDF 5.0 have been rewritten from scratch. And uh, this is the so-called driver NG next generation model. Uh, the drivers that have been rewritten, they now have different APIs from the old ones. And the most important change that these APIs are kind of object oriented. So uh, you do no longer work with specific channels of the uh, peripheral. For example, if you have a timer group, uh, you no longer have to care whether you're using timer zero or timer one or timer group zero, or timer group one the driver will allocate channels so that multiple components can use the same peripheral without conflicts and without having to explicitly say which component is using which uh, channel. It also helps when mixing uh, projects, for example, uh, that contain components from different authors because those authors might not have been aware about each other and they end up using the same, uh, the same channel number or the same peripheral instance. Also, the uh, APIs of new drivers are more consistent. So naming and uh, the way configuration structures are declared uh, and semantics of the driver, uh, this is now more uniform between different drivers. Previously, for a lot of drivers, uh, each driver had some unique APIs and uh, moving from uh, working with one driver to the next driver, you would notice that there is some kind of uh, different uh, way in which APIs are defined. So this is now more, more uniform. The legacy drivers for those uh, peripherals that have been converted to driver NG are still supported in IDF 5.0. For example, the timer group uh, driver is still there. And your app can use either the old driver or the new driver, but not both at the same time. So uh, this is strictly speaking makes it not a breaking change, but it is important enough change. So I mentioned it here as well. Uh, typically, you will get co uh, compilation warnings or link time warnings when you use the old driver, and you can continue using it uh, when you're first upgrading. But uh, going further, it is recommended to upgrade to the driver and G drivers and the new APIs. 
And finally, a few other major changes that I want to mention. Uh, Embed TLS, which is a cryptographic and TLS library that we use in IDF, has been upgraded to a major release, uh, 3.1. And this is actually, this brings uh, some of the breaking changes in case you have been using Embed TLS code directly. Uh, if you have been just using IDF components, then this is not a, a, a breaking change for your project because we have already dealt with uh, all the incompatibilities between Embed TLS 2.x and 3.x. But if you have been calling some APIs, for example, for hashing or encryption, then you need to check Embed TLS 3.x migration guides and update your application accordingly. Also removed are some of the deprecated functions and types in FreeRTOS. For example, the XML4 handle type has been deprecated as of, I think, FreeRTOS 8. And, uh, but this definition was still provided in IDF for compatibility reasons for a long time. So now you have to use the new definitions uh, which are available since FreeRTOS 8. Uh, that's, for instance, XML4 handle underscore T instead of XML4 handle. Uh, typically, uh, this is pretty easy to search and replace, and also these uh, semaphore handle T types, uh, they are available in previous versions of ESP IDF, so you will not notice um, a lot of difference in case you need to compile the project for the older IDF release. We have removed TCP IP adapter library, and TCP IP adapter has been um, a, a layer that, or library that provided uh, APIs to configure networking interfaces in IDF uh, 3.x. In IDF 4.x, we have introduces, introduced ESP NetIF APIs, and for the 4.x releases, we have maintained compatibility with TCP IP adapter, so you could still use it. Um, if you have started developing your application with IDF 4.x, it is most likely that you're already using ESP NetIF, so this uh, change will not apply to you, but if you have a project that was started at the times of IDF3 or earlier, then you will need to migrate. Um, a few other changes uh, mentioned in this slide, I, I will skip them. They are not very significant, and uh, you can also find them uh, in the migration guide sections uh, of the programming guide. So in general, if you have uh, some code base that you still want to be able to compile for IDF4 or if you are developing a component for other users and you want users to be able to use this component both with IDF4 and IDF5, then there, there is a tip how you can do this. Um, ESP IDF provides version macros. For example, ESP IDF version uh, and ESP IDF version val. Uh, these macros, they allow doing compile time checks for the current IDF version. <clears throat> and you can use integer comparisons uh, like shown here. So you can check, for instance, if the version is uh, less or greater than ESP IDF5. And this way you can add code that works for 4.x and uh, a code path that works for 5.x. And then finally, when you're removing 4.x support for, from your code base, you can just delete this part uh, that is in the if and if block. And similar in CMake, you can use IDF version major, IDF version minor, IDF version patch, macros, um, sorry, variables, um, and you can use CMake version less, version greater, version greater than equal uh, comparisons to compare the version numbers and have custom uh, code in your component or project CMake list file for 4.x and 5.x. For instance, you may need to do this if you're using ADC calibration library because previously it was in a separate component called uh, ESP ADC Cal. And now it is in a new component ESP ADC, which contains both the ADC driver and the calibration library. So uh, you will have to add dependencies on this component in a different way for IDF 4.x and IDF 5. So now we are done with uh, all the major changes. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not the exhaustive list. Uh, you can still uh, find the complete list in the IDF programming guide, in the migration guide section. But let's now move on to the major new features in IDF 5.0. This is also just like with the uh, major changes, not an exhaustive list. I'm uh, highlighting a few things um, that you might be interested in and that, that might motivate you to upgrade to IDF 5. 
Uh, there are five categories, uh, and I'll start with the component manager. As I said before, when talking about components that were removed from ESP IDF, the component manager is one of the most important features that we are introducing 5.0 and which we are relying on. Actually, component manager is available in older releases of ESP IDF as well. Uh, it's just that 5.0 is the first release where we start relying on component manager for some of the functionality. Uh, if you have a project that needs to be built with IDF 4.4 or IDF 4.3, you can also use component manager there. It is supported just the same way as in, as in 5.0. The component manager um, adds three things that you need to know about. Component manifests, those are the files that declare dependencies on other components and it basically allows you to install components that are maintained outside of your project and are available either in the component registry or in a Git repository. The component manager is the tool that is used locally to install components and also to for component developers to upload components to the registry. And the registry is the online service and website where um, those components are actually stored and you can find components written by other developers. At the moment, component register, registry is, uh, uh, is already available and contains a lot of components developed by Espressif and a few other third-party developers. Uh, soon we aim to open component registry to all developers so you can uh, share uh, code that you have written and components that you have developed with others. Component registry essentially is like a package manager for ESP IDEA. We have a talk about Component Manager in the developer conference. I highly recommend watching it, and it contains a lot more in-depth information about using the Component Manager uh, as a project developer and as a component developer. The next category of changes or uh, major features that we are introducing in 5.0, I already talked about uh, tool chains a bit uh, in terms of breaking changes, but now let's look at this from the feature perspective. Uh, upgrading to GCC 11 adds support for C++ 20 and C17 language standards, and we are using those newer language standards by default. Uh, so especially C++ users should appreciate that uh, because a lot of more uh, recent C++ features become available. Uh, we are upgrading a lot of other tools. For example, CMake is upgraded to the latest release at the time when we are uh, making IDF 5.0 release. Um, we add support for color diagnostics that has been a requested feature by many users. Uh, GDB is upgraded to version 11.2 and we are also adding Python support. Previously only GDB for Linux has been built with Python support, but now users on Mac and Windows can also benefit from uh, Python modules. And we are actually releasing one uh, such Python module for uh, free artist analysis. So this is a free artist GDB plugin you can find more information about this uh, plugin in the list. And we automatically load it when you run IDF by GDB. So using this plugin, you can issue some commands uh, that start with free RDOS, and you can look at the list of tasks, queues, uh, semaphores, and so on. So very useful for developing RDOS-based applications and trying to understand your application in more detail. And finally, another highly requested feature has been pre-built tool chains for ARM64, Linux, and Mac. Now we have uh, those uh, tool chains available, and we also have ARM64 Docker images. So if you're running, for example, Docker on Mac, you will now be able to use ESP IDF, official ESP IDF Docker images without having to build them yourself. In the tools and build system, there have been several improvements. The installation scripts now support optional features. So uh, we don't no longer require you to install all the Python packages that every single ESP IDF feature depends on. Uh, this helps with installation times. This also helps uh, uh, put the packages that are more likely to produce some installation uh, issues into separate features so that most developers will not have to install them. Uh, for example, one of the features that we introduced is PyTest, um, and uh, it is uh, basically if you, are, you, if you are writing some tests for ESP IDF uh, applications or components using PyTest, then we have a 
feature that can be enabled during installation and that installs PyTest and all the other required packages. I already mentioned support for building uh, with um, building in directories with spaces and paths. This probably will be appreciated by Windows users. Uh, we are just adding this feature in 5.0. It is possible that there is still um, a bug or two related to this feature. So we have tested in it for a lot of ESP IDF examples, but uh, there may be some issues. So if you are a Windows user and if you want to build with uh, directories with space and paths, please try it out and let us know. We want to get it uh, working and uh, so that it will not matter what kind of path you use for ESP IDF or uh, for your project. Uh, also to other features that you, you may notice, uh, the support for reproducible builds has been requested by many users that have uh, multiple developers working on a project and they want to ensure that they get the same result when building ESP IDF by all of the developers. Uh, this uh, is documented in the programming guide, search for reproducible builds. Um, uh, there are some hints how to configure your application and uh, what uh, suggestions to follow to get reproducible builds in your case. Another feature that we are adding um, is the hints on compilation errors. Normally, when you build a project, if uh, the compilation fails, then you get the error that is printed by the compiler. Sometimes that error doesn't actually tell you what you need to do to fix the problem. Uh, this is the case in the example that I mentioned earlier, and that is uh, when you're missing some dependency on a component. So let's say you may have uh, include esptimer.h in your program, but uh, the, if the component doesn't have a dependency on esptimer component, then uh, the, the compiler will not be able to find this header file. In this case, the compiler will just say that the uh, uh, dependency is uh, un unresolved, so the header file is not found. <clears throat> However, that uh, doesn't tell you how to fix the problem, and that is by adding ESP timer to the requirements list of your component. So this feature, hints on compilation errors, is uh, a feature of IDF Pine, which uh, analyzes the compilation uh, warnings or compilation errors, and print suggestions how you can fix this. So over time, we will be including the number of hints that uh, IDFPy knows how to print. So we can give you recommendations how to solve uh, compilation, certain compilation errors um, and uh, get uh, on with your project faster. Uh, so for a lot of break-in changes that have been mentioned before in the stock, we have already added those hints. Uh, so see, you will see this as a uh, yellow or orange text um, added by IDFPy at the very end of IDFPy build output in case compilation has failed. I already mentioned the driver NG, so the new set of drivers um, that we have introduced in IDF 5.0. Um, this, uh, this is just some subset of drivers, so we will be adding more uh, drivers uh, in this driver NG model. Uh, in future releases of ESP IDF. <clears throat> and also in, in 5.0, we have added some of the uh, uh, examples for certain features that we didn't have previously. Um, USB host is one such case. Uh, there are new examples for uh, mass storage, uh, USB video class, and uh, CDC uh, that you can find in IDF examples folder. Uh, actually, these all examples rely on external components that are maintained outside of ESP IDF and are installed using the component manager. And now, finally, a few other major features that we have introduced in 5.0. Uh, we have a preview of Amazon Freeautos SMP kernel. Uh, there was another talk about Freeautos uh, at the DevCon. If you haven't watched it yet, highly recommend doing this. It goes in depth about different versions of FreeRTS kernel and our plan to migrate to the latest uh, Amazon upstream SMP version. Uh, this feature is now in preview, so you can enable it in your project, try it out, and then let us know uh, if you find some issues. <clears throat> we plan to uh, move to, uh, to the SMP version of FreeRTS by, def uh, by default in one of the future releases. 
We also have now the support for tracing over UART. Previously, this was available only through JTAG. Uh, AppTrace and System View uh, features, which System View depends on AppTrace, can now work over UART. <clears throat> so if you have if you have a spare UART and you want to enable tracing but you can't use JTAG for some reason, then uh, you can get a fairly high speed uh, System View traces um, if you have a high speed enough external USB to UART adapter. Another new feature is the tool to create FAT file system images. We already had a tool to create SPIFFS file system images and NBS images on the host. So now we are complementing this with a tool to create FAT file system images in case you prefer to use FAT file system and not SPIFFS. Uh, this tool, just like the one we had for SPIFFS, allows taking a directory with files and creating a file system image that will be flashed to the FAT, file, uh, FAT partition in your device when you run IDF by flash. And we, we have another talk uh, at the developer conference about this tool, so watch that if you're interested. Uh, Pre-encrypted OTA has been a highly requested feature, and ESP IDF now has an example for uh, handling OTA updates when the update that is downloaded from the cloud uh, is already encrypted. <clears throat> um, something that you might not notice if you're uh, just uh, using ESP IDF as a project developer, um, is that we're switching to the PyTest Embedded Test Framework. Uh, PyTest Embedded is a plugin for PyTest. And uh, this uh, test framework allows us to write very concise um, test cases for the behavior of the embedded application. Um, in IDF, if you go to examples folder, in many of the example folders, you will find files that have PyTest in their name. And those are those PyTest test cases. Um, although this is a feature that we primarily have developed for our own use uh, in ESP IDF and other projects, uh, you can use it in your project as well. So if you want to uh, test your application or test your components, then you can also use PyTest for this. Uh, we have a separate talk about uh, testing in ESP IDF and how you can apply it for your projects at DevCon. Uh, so again, there are more details there. And the last feature I want to mention, um, that is the board support packages. Uh, this uh, board support packages, uh, they are components that, again, are distributed using the component manager. So you see that component manager is indeed one of the uh, features that gets used in 5.0 a lot. Board support packages, they uh, allow you to get started with some of Espressive's development boards really easily by providing you out of the box the drivers. Um, and the, uh, all the header files with pin definitions and some helper functions in a convenient package. So if you get, uh, for instance, an ESP box or Kaluga kit, it comes with a lot of peripherals. And now you can uh, simply install the board support package for this uh, development kit using the component manager, and you will instantly get all the required drivers for this board. There are many other major features in uh, ESP IDEA 5.0. So I encourage you to take a look at the release notes of IDEA 5.0 and see if you find something interesting for your project there. Finally, I want to very briefly mention the uh, future plans we have for the next IDF releases, um, IDEA 5.1 and later. Uh, as you probably expect, we will be uh, releasing new chips and uh, new next IDF releases will come with support for those new chips. Uh, we do want to improve uh, the way release notes, notes are presented and how we track bug fixes across releases. This has been a, a thing that uh, a lot of users uh, mentioned to us on our GitHub uh, issue tracker. So it is at the moment pretty difficult to see whether the fix you, that is important for your project has been already backported to one of the older release branches. And we want to improve this process and make it more transparent and uh, so that we also don't forget to and backport those uh, fixes to the releases where you need them. More drivers will be converted to the driver NG model, so APIs of those drivers will also be unified. Uh, more components will be available outside of IDF, and you will be able to install updates for those components without having to upgrade the entire ESP IDF, so just by upgrading certain components. And this will use the IDF Component Manager. And we do plan to enable uh, Amazon uh, pre-artist SMP kernel 
by default in one of the subsequent releases. At the moment, it's not clear which release it will be, but uh, anyway, I encourage you to take a look at this uh, feature and try it for your project and let us know whether it works for you. And with that, thank you very much for the talk. I hope it was useful for you to, um, for, to learn about ESP IDEA 5.0, and you will be able to efficiently apply ESP IDEA 5.0 in your project. Now I have some time for the Q&A. Hello, and welcome for the second day of the Expressive Developer Conference 2022. So my name is Pedro, I'm Developer Advocate here at Expressive, and now I will invite Ivan for the Q&A session. Thank you, Ivan. Hi, Pedro. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for being here today. So we have some questions here. I will uh, pick the first one. So. Um, yeah, so when will ESP IDF 5.0 go live uh, for developers? Uh, excellent question. Um, so at the moment, ESP IDF 5.0 is uh, in uh, beta state. So we have the beta 1 uh, version published on GitHub. Uh, we are pretty close to getting to the release candidates. Um, I know of just, I think, three or four issues that our QA has uh, marked as blocking issues for this release. So uh, we are trying to fix them properly and uh, we will be doing regression tests next, next week. If that goes well, then uh, we will be able to publish the release candidates. And then typically, if there is no problem in the release candidate, then we should be able to make the final release, tag the final release a week after the release candidate. So um, fingers crossed, a couple of weeks and we will have the release. Yeah. So the second question, uh, do we get with ESP32 C5 new slash expanded USB function API or can we use the time USB2? Yeah, uh, C5 at the moment is uh, still at the engineering sample stage. So uh, we, I can't tell exactly uh, not only because I don't want to tell, but also because I don't know yet uh, what will be the specification of the final chip that will be in the mass production. Uh, if there will be USB, then I'm pretty sure that we will have Tiny USB as an option. Aside from Tiny USB, we also have a USB host library that is developed by Espressive. So there are two libraries that we use: one for device side of USB and one for the host side of USB. But for the device side, we do plan to make some improvements for the USB high-speed uh, capable chips, such as ESP32 C5. Um, in particular, we will be implementing DMA-based uh, support to increase the transfer performance. Okay, thank you. So next question. Is there any way to verify all code compilation process during upgrading compiler to the newer one? Uh, it seems that there are, can be some hidden bugs or errors that can be founded hardly. Yeah, this is a this is a very interesting question. Um, it is indeed pretty hard to find those uh, errors that can happen after upgrading the compiler. So you will obviously see some errors just while doing compilation. So you will get a bunch of new warnings or errors, but then you might have you might notice some behavioral changes. Um, 
typically before we upgrade the compiler in ESP IDF, we run uh, a very large test suite that we have for ESP IDF. And that sometimes points out some new issues for us. This time we did uh, actually notice a few behavioral changes in the code after upgrading to from GCC 8 to GCC 11. And uh, all those issues were in fact cases where there was some uh, kind of undefined behavior in the original C code. And it just didn't happen to cause a problem in GCC 8, but it does cause a problem with the newer version of the compiler. Um, aside from actually having a test suite for your project, for the code that you write, that you can run, and then you can verify the functionality, I don't have any uh, better suggestion of how you can find those things there. OK, thanks. Um, so next question. Uh, how does the stability of 5.0 compare to 4.4? I'm usually cautious about updates. So this is a really good question. Oh yeah. Um, so you, you've probably seen from the presentation that there are lots of changes in 5.0. So um, inevitably there will be some bugs. Um, typically it depends uh, on what, so basically whether you will use 5.0 now and whether you will upgrade depends on what stage you are in your project. So if you're in the early stage of the project, I would say that it probably makes sense to upgrade to this version and then you will not have to pay the cost of going through the upgrade process later in the project lifetime where it's already more stable. So doing this upfront, I think, will pay off. Uh, we will be releasing bug fix releases for 5.0 for sure. There will be 5.0.1, 5.0.2 and so on, where we will be fixing the bugs that uh, we, we, get, uh, uh, we, that we get to know of. Uh, so, yeah, initially the, the stability might not be so great, but if you are in the early stage, I would still recommend that you try to upgrade it now. Okay, thanks. So next one is related to Arduino. Is there support uh, to use Arduino libraries in ESP IDF with Arduino as a component? Yeah, this is possible um, in, um, I think yesterday we had a talk from uh, my colleague Rodrigo, who explained how to use um, Arduino as a component. At the moment, you have to write a CMake file manually for the uh, Arduino library. Uh, usually, this is a very simple CMake file where you just need to add your source files and header files. Uh, we are thinking about adding some kind of automation that will generate the CMake file for you. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah, so can you please let us know more the new chips? or the newer chips that will be uh, supported or will support it on 5.1? Yeah, in 5.1, we aim to support two new chips. That will be ESP32C6 and ESP32H2. Um, of course, the final level of support will depend on, uh, you know, once we get to those actual chips, we will test them. And if, we, if there is any problem, then we will see how we can fix it. But uh, yeah, from uh, from the IDF team side, we, we, we are trying to support those chips in 5.1. Yeah, okay, so thank you so much for your talk and also for the live q &A. Thank you so much, Ivan. Thanks, Pedro. Good luck. Okay, so now we have a talk about IDF Component Manager. So I hope you enjoy the talk. See you next q &A. Hello, my name is Sergei Silnov, and today we are going to talk about IDF Component Manager, a relatively new addition to the ESP IDF. It helps you to manage dependencies of your ESP IDF projects. To begin, let's start with the common structure of uh, CMake ESP IDF projects. Today we are going to talk only about CMake ESP IDF projects and not about legacy uh, make-based projects. Uh, how typical project uh, organize uh, itself? It consists of the main component. Uh, everything in ESPIDF project is a component. Even the code of the project itself usually plays to the main component uh, in the root directory. Other components uh, that may be used in your project typically located inside of components directory. Uh, 
However, if you have some other components that you want to share between uh, many projects, you may have them uh, laying somewhere else on your disk and just specify them in CMakeList.txt file as extra component dirs, and they will be loaded from this bus. Also, ESP IDF itself contains tons of different components that can be uh, useful for a typical project development. Uh, this is nice, however, this situation is not perfect. Uh, first of all, it's hard to share components between projects. Of course, as I mentioned, you can specify components in extra components DIRs. However, if you want to move your development setup to a different machine or you work in a bigger team where all the developers need to have the same uh, components, it's it causing some troubles. It's especially harder if your components are not that simple and uh, have their own dependencies and their dependencies have their own dependencies. When we have a relatively deep tree of requirements um, by components, um, handling all these things becoming really tough. Also, it uh, provides no means to control uh, version compatibility between components and make sure that you're using correct one. Um, another uh, plane of problems is uh, if your arises uh, if you're an open source developer and you want to share your components with the community. You can share them on GitHub, but and advertise them on e Espressive Developer Forum, but there is no standard way to find uh, new components, discover new features. Um, and it's also worth mentioning that having uh, all the components that may be used by wide variety of different projects inside ADF causes problems too, because IDF release cycle is relatively long. And if you want to add new features to some particular driver or uh, network library, we have to wait for the next minor or major release of ESP IDF because we cannot introduce new features in bug fix releases. So it slows down the addition of new features. Um, okay, so now it should be relatively clear what kind of problems we have. And luckily we have a solution. Our solution is to design our own registry of um, uh, components. It's a web service that hosts um, uh, uh, archives with component files and some information about them, allowing easy discovery and uh, uh, centralized control for components. Also, in addition to this registry, uh, ASP IDF now includes an IDF component manager, a, a CLI tool uh, that integrates uh, uh, ESP IDF CMake build system and downloads uh, all the components. Um, IDF component manager made in such a way, so if you don't know about it, it still may work for you. It may be as much magical as possible while keeping it still transparent. Um, it, uh, component Manager is made uh, secure by default and all the components uh, have their cryptographic hash sums stored and checked every time to make sure that um, your uh, dependencies always the same as they used to be. Um, technically, IDF Component Manager is a Python package which is delivered with your ESP IDF uh, setup. 
It works with all currently supported ESP IDF versions starting 4.1. However, it was mentioning that it is included by default um, to IDF 4.4 and older IDF releases only included by default in most recent bug fix versions. Uh, good thing, thing to know that ESP IDF Component Manager has its own release cycles. So new features um, um, are delivered uh, much quicker and even for older IDF releases, you have all the available um, uh, stuff every time. Let's try using IDF Component Manager with our own project. Let's go to the registry. It is hosted on http uh, components.espressive.com. Here you can find uh, dozens of hosted components. You, can, you have some filters and um, ability to search them. Um, at the moment, um, there are a lot of components uh, of different kinds, network protocols, uh, peripheral drivers, and board support packages. Convenient bundle of um, all the drivers you may need to use uh, all official um, expressive uh, development kits. Here we will go with example component, which is named example CMP. Uh, please note how the name is. Uh, looks like. It consists of two parts, uh, namespace example and component name itself, CMP. Namespace is something like a username or organization in some other um, public hosting services, for example, on GitHub. You can find some other useful information on the component page like a list of uh, all available versions, uh, a license of the component, a list of dependencies, and the readme file with uh, detailed in information. To add the component to our project, you can either manually create idf underscore component dot yaml file in, in, the in any component directory of your project, in our case, it may be main IDF component. Uh, and add two lines, dependencies and the name of component alongside with version specification. Or you can achieve the same uh, by running command idfpy add dependency and passing the name of component optionally with version specification. Um, you can find this command to copy on uh, component registry page. Quick note about specification formats. Uh, you can use a number of different syntaxes to specify uh, version formats. If you do not care about version, you can just put an asterisk and most recent version of component will be downloaded. Uh, uh, you can specify a whole range of versions, uh, comma separated uh, list of rules. You may include, exclude some particular versions or set upper or lower limits. However, the recommended way to specify dependencies is to pin the versions that you actually need and then a current uh, symbol in front of it. So the most recent compatible version will be always downloaded. Uh, versions of components in the registry mainly follow semantic version specification. So if you are familiar with semantic versioning, you should understand how versions work in the IDF registry. Okay, now we have a, a requirement added to our uh, project, let's run CMake build system. Um, during a, a run of CMake, Component Manager will be called and all the dependencies will be processed. 
Here in our example, you may find that component manager processes actually two dependencies, example CMP and IDF. Even though we only added only example CMP to our project. How did it happen? Um, this is because uh, IDF dependency comes from example CMP manifest itself. Here you can see that uh, example CMP depends on IDF and specifies it version uh, bigger or equal for than 4.1. It's important to mention that IDF as a dependency is a bit special. Uh, it allows to specify a uh, version requirement of ESP IDF. However, uh, Component Manager never installs any, any versions of IDF itself. It only checks that version you're using right now is compatible with all the components participating in the build. Um, while in our example, everything went smooth and we didn't have any issues solving uh, components, Component Manager is smart enough and provides a lot of details when um, solving of dependencies when thrown. For example, here, if we uh, run uh, uh, Comp uh, component manager for some components that require a newer IDF version uh, on uh, older IDF release. Uh, you will see a detailed um, explanation which component requires which version and why it cannot be satisfied. We are putting a lot of effort to make this error messages clear and useful. So if you find any error message that is not clear for you, it consider it an issue. So feel free to report it. Okay, we have Component Manager run successfully. So let's take a look how the project will look now. Uh, there are a few files added to the project directory. First of all, a whole directory of managed components. Uh, where our component example CMP was downloaded. Take a note on the name. Even though we added the dependency as example slash CMP, in the file system, they are stored as example double underscore CMP slash replace with double underscores. And with this name, components will be visible to the build system. So if you have some build issues from the build system, you may find these names in some cases. Don't be confused. Take a note that manage components directory can be easily recreated. So it is recommended to edit to git ignore file if you store your project code in git repository. Another file that was added is a dependencies log file, which contains whole list of dependencies generated by the co component manager. One more file worth mentioning here is dot component hash uh, file in the managed components directory. Uh, it contains hash sum of component as it was downloaded to the managed components directory. Um, Files in this directory are not meant to be editable by user. And if you accidentally or intentionally modify uh, some files, um, a component manager will complain that files are not in the same state as they used to be before and will suggest you to either overwrite your changes or move your component to the components directory of your project and continue modifications here. Um, as I mentioned before, um, dependencies log file contains a list of uh, information um, about all the dependencies. In our project, we have only two. Every, every dependency uh, also has a hash sum and the source um, where it was downloaded from. 
Also, this file contains manifest uh, hash sum. It's a hash sum of all manifests of all components in your project. Uh, this number is used to make sure that your log file will never be updated once your requirements solved. Only when you add new dependencies or modify versions, component manager will run again. But it won't rerun if you just rebuild your project. Um, one more note is about naming. Uh, as I mentioned, if you modified some component in um, a managed components directory, component manager will suggest you to move this component to component directory of your project. Um, so it's clever enough to actually find possible candidates for components that you uh, in the requirements file that actually may already be included in your project. So if you have uh, two components in your components directory, one is named CMP and one is named example double underscore CMP, it actually won't be sure which one you meant to use if you have a dependency uh, example slash CMP or uh, some other in your manifest file. Um, also, you may not reuse uh, components that are already in IDF. Uh, however, we have yet another feature to solve this issue, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, component manager also tries to use as little network as possible. So even if you use the same components in many different projects, they won't be downloaded many times. Um, every component version is downloaded to a system-wide um, uh, cache for your user. Uh, location of this cache depends on your operating system, um, but you always can check what files you have there or uh, clean this cache if you want. Also, component manager caches uh, 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 API responses for the short time. So um, uh, solving a lot of dependencies won't load server too much and will be much quicker. Okay, we uh, built our first project with ESP IDF Component Manager. Let's take a look what other features it provides for you as a a user of hosted components. First of all, normally when you're adding some dependency through CMakeList.txt files, you have to specify how the um, component will be required. Will it be a private um, requirement or a transient one? You have the same option with the component manager. By default, all components required as private ones. However, you can specify them to be public or set required to false. In this case, component will be only downloaded but not included to the build. It is useful for components that only provide some CLI tools or uh, CMake uh, extensions. You can also um, specify when the component should be downloaded. It is useful for projects that are built for many different um, targets or should work with many different IDF versions. For example, it's useful if some component is included in older IDF uh, versions, but was removed from IDF itself and moved to the component registry in newer releases. For convenience, you can also use your existing uh, components in different Git repositories. Uh, you can specify Git repository URL uh, 
uh, to download your components without using submodules. This uh, may be simpler because it doesn't require any extra steps to set up your environment on a new machine. Also, uh, if you notice, you can use environment variables um, in manifest files. This can be useful, for example, if you don't use SSH for authentication of your uh, uh, Git repos and rely on HTTP basic auth. Um, if your Git repo contains more than one uh, component or component it's just not in the root of the directory, you can specify the path. It's important to mention, however, that um, Component Manager doesn't support any out of the tree dependencies uh, in CMake files. So if your component uh, um, requires something outside of its root uh, directory, it won't work. And you have to find uh, another way. Also, if you're developing your own components that I mean to be shared on the registry, you may find uh, useful to mention them in a test project uh, using relative paths. And um, Component Manager also supports um, specifying local directories as uh, sources of components. However, in this presentation, we won't focus on how to upload components to the registry and only how to use ready available components. Okay, so far we already listed a number of features that are available for you right now. However, we are working to make uh, component manager as good as it possible. Usually in embedded world um, tools, not that always great, as great as a, for example, in world of web development. We are checking many different systems available uh, these days and trying to um, involve the best practices in our development. So uh, we are working on a standard way to write documentation for your components. And very soon, uh, templates and documentation hosting will be available. You can find documentation in standard way in the component registry. And when you're writing documentation, you will be able to preview it locally. Also, uh, uh, component registry will have a special care um, about components examples, and you will be able to create a new project out of an example with only one click. If you don't trust a uh, registry hosted somewhere else, you will be able to create your own local mirror with only one command. At the moment, uh, uh, component Manager is available uh, for everyone for downloading components. However, to upload components, you have to fill form uh, for a private preview. Uh, but very soon we'll open sign up for everyone. And we are looking for your contributions. Don't hesitate to share components. Also, IDF Component Manager itself is uh, an open source software and developed on GitHub. You can uh, find source code on an uh, expressive account under IDF Component Manager name. We accept merge requests and uh, issues, so feel free to contribute. Thank you so much. Now it's time for your questions.
Hello, I'm back for the next Q&A with Sergey. So now I'd like to welcome Sergey to the Q&A. Hey, Pedro. Hey, how are you? So um, we have um, a question here. So uh, let's start by when the component registry will be available, available for public sign up. Well, actually, it already is. We launched a form for preview sign up. It, uh, it's for users who already have uh, their components ready and just waiting for the time when they can upload them. Uh, as for more um, automated sign up, it will come in in a, a few weeks uh, after we uh, figure out how how we can work with uh, contributors and solve uh, uh, their issues. Uh, because uh, we figured out that component manager uh, can be used in a number of different ways and different companies develop components in, in a different way. So we want to make sure that um, component manager supports most of common workflows before we open it for everyone without any limitations. Nice, okay. So we have one more question. Uh, am I right thinking the dependencies.log file effectively functions like package log.json in NPM? Yeah, it's correct. Basically, a log file contains hash sums of all components and flat list of all the dependencies. Uh, so you make sure that your builds are reproducible. If you uh, add a dependencies log file to your Git repository, um, dependencies will be the same on all computers. Okay, thank you. So we have more three questions. Um, will component documentation be based on Doxygen? Yes, uh, this is what we are working on now. Uh, uh, um, there will be automatically generated API description based on Doxygen output, and also you will be able to write a human written documentation in Markdown. Okay, so next one. Um, can I have a private registry hosted on premises? Um, at the moment, you can only have a read-only mirror of the public registry if you want to have uh, an access from your local network. Uh, however, if uh, we will have more requirements uh, from our customers to have such option, uh, there is nothing stops us. So um, it depends more on um, desire of our customers. Okay. Uh, so it will require some. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay. So, next one uh, where we can find a list of components available on the Espressive server? Uh, Components.espressive.com. Uh, you can just type and this uh, server, you can list all the components there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey, for, for answering the questions. Thank you, Pedro. So now we have uh, a talk about BSP board support packages. And I hope you enjoyed the talk. Hello everyone and welcome to this talk about board support packages. My name is Thomas. I work as embedded software engineer at Espressive and today I will show you our new project that will help you getting started with development boards built on Espressive SOCs. 
so as you can see, there are only four points in our agenda. So we should make it something under 20 minutes. So let's get started. A development board is a great way of starting prototyping on expressive chips. However, it is not always easy to put together all drivers for onboard chips and to configure your shiny new development board for something more profound than just a mere hello world example. So the first point uh, is a mock example project where we will clearly see how painstaking it can be to bring your new dev board to life. And in the second point, we will see how BSPs can help you tackle this problem. Following that, we will take a look at how BSPs are distributed and what role IDF Component Manager plays in uh, BSPs deployment. And last but not least, we will take we will talk about how you can contribute or request new features and uh, what the future might bring to BSP project. So as the name Boards Pro Packages suggests, we will be talking about development board today. And I picked one ESP32 S2 Kaluga kit to present you a problem that many developers face in their beginnings and how BSP can be of use in this case. So consider this. You just got a brand new ESP32 S2 Kaluga kit in your box and you open it and you see what you have inside and uh, you just want to put this hardware into action. So first thing you see uh, is the camera display and uh, camera and the display. Uh, so it sounds as a, as a good idea uh, to get image from the camera onto the display. Uh, then you find that in the box, there is also a small speaker. So you start thinking that your first project uh, could play some music too. There's actually a connector on this side of the board. We can see it here, but there's a power amplifier and a connector for speaker. So now, uh, if you are a novice, you might fall a prey to a naive idea that accomplishing this might be a, a piece of cake without any higher level software component. I'm not saying that it's extremely complex, just that it's rather daring goal for a very first try. Anyway, you can get inspired with many open source examples that are available on GitHub and try to get it, get all these pieces of code of different origin uh, working together. Although it is possible, we wanted to provide users with better experience uh, when they start developing or exploring new features of their development boards. But now uh, let's take a step back and let us have a look at how many things you have to configure before you can get this simple, in quotes, project done. In this picture, you can see a block diagram of ESP32 S2. Uh, it is taken from ESP32 S2 datasheet, so uh, you might have already seen it somewhere. I will zoom in on the peripherals and sensor section uh, so we can start thinking about what we need in our example project. So uh, we definitely need a display and the L LCD interface. Uh, we also need a camera, so that's camera interface and some GPIOs. Uh, and then we need uh, audio, so that would be I2S peripheral and uh, I2C for uh, configuration. Uh, we'll also be using uh, free art DOS and some graphics libraries, so we will need some general purpose timers. Uh, then we also, it would be a nice feature if we could control the brightness of the display, so we would use the PWM module for this. It sounds that uh, that might do it, but uh, you will soon find out that the ESP32 S2 does not have enough internal RAM to hold frame buffers from the camera and the display. So we also need support for external RAM. Uh, now, what is not in this picture are DMAs, because you also need DMAs. We certainly don't want to spend our CPU time passing huge data frame buffers from one place to another. 
So setting up DMA for the camera, for the audio and the LCD is uh, just a must. Uh, moreover, uh, DMAs will get even more complicated once, uh, once since we need DMA access to external RAM. So as you can see, we use a large number of peripherals in this chip and we just started. But uh, the, the list is still pretty far from uh, being complete because you also need drivers for the external components. So we need a uh, driver for the audio codec to play the music. We need a driver for the display driver to get uh, the, the image on the display. And we also need another driver for the camera module. But we still need to move forward. We also need to know the board's pinout. We also need some graphics library to serve the display. And the last but not least, uh, we need some code that will put all these components together. So maybe there is something that I forgot to, to mention, but this list sounds uh, complete. So as you can see from a simple example, we have a rather complicated problem and uh, it will take a significant amount of time to configure all the name peripherals and to put this all together. Now, this is where a board super package comes in handy. BSP solves uh, all the name problems and allows you to start developing your first application a lot quicker. Uh, you can see a typical BSP composition in the picture on, on the right. Uh, typically, BSP contains complete pinout of the board that is convenient for both using uh, the macros in your code as well as form of documentation. So you don't need to have the schematic of the board open all the time. Uh, next, we have some uh, default configurations of uh, internal peripherals or external components because many software components have thorough configuration, but uh, usually it's good to start with defaults and then later you will see what you need to change. Uh, then uh, we move to drivers for external components themselves. Uh, it could be sensors, audio codecs, or uh, any any other peripherals. And lastly, we get the glue. That is uh, a number of helper functions that will save you a lot of time by aggregating few to several functions and configurations into one. For example, you would need just a simple one-liner to mount a micro SD card or just another one-liner to initialize your LCD display with touch controller and the graphics library. Uh, now, when you look when you look at the picture again, uh, you can see that these external components are are marked as there. There is multitude of, of them. Uh, that also means uh, that uh, these external components are not like integral part. They are not hard coded in the BSP, but they are rather separate components. Uh, they can be used separately. They have their own life cycle, uh, own, own and own versioning but uh, the BSP depends on them. Uh, I will try to explain it a little more in, uh, in next slides. Uh, okay, so if you want to use BSP in your project, you need to add it to your project as a dependency. Then during build, it will download all the required code, including the external components, and then it's ready to use. So going back to the example project that we discussed, Older, relatively complicated configuration is now just few lines of code, or five lines of code, as you can as you can see here. Uh, so, looking at this code snippet, firstly we initialize I squared C that is used uh, for both camera and audio codec configuration. Then, with BSP display start, we initialize SPI that is used uh, for color and configuration interface to the LCD. We set up LVGL, the graphics library, and allocate required memory and start the free task tasks. Uh, then on the next line, we turn on the display backlight, which essentially just turns on uh, the display. Uh, the last two lines are for uh, camera configuration. 
uh, these functions, functions and configuration structure uh, comes directly from ESP32 camera package. Configuring the camera component is, is rather difficult. There are many different modes the camera can operate. Uh, and, in, and in Kaluga BSP, we want to keep the flexible interface ESP32 camera offers. So we provide default configuration macros, such as this one, uh, that will shrink the complicated configuration into one line. Uh, so after you run these few lines, your application is configured and uh, ready, to, ready to get frame buffer from your camera to external RAM and then through LVGL and SPI to your display, all while another frame is being fetched from the camera. And with a few more lines, you can get the audio coded working with, uh, in a similar or similar manner. So I really believe that uh, BSP can save you a lot of time, mostly in the beginnings, and a lot of trouble. And you can get your first prototype working faster than, than before. Now, uh, let's have a more detailed look uh, on how uh, BSPs are distributed and integrated into ESP IDF project. So to get uh, a specific board support package into your project, you shouldn't clone the whole ESP BSP repository because it serves as catalog. It contains source code of all BSPs and their components. You only want the one BSP that uh, you really, really need for your board. So this is where IDF Component Manager uh, plays an important role. There is a separate talk about IDF Component Man Manager at this conference, so I won't go into too much detail about, but the important thing is that BSPs are distributed via our IDF Component Registry. It's fully integrated in the IDF build system, so in most cases, you don't need to know the internals. You just define that your project depends on a BSP and that is all. I'll show you how to do that later. But um, apart from the integration in uh, IDF build system, the IDF registry also offers a nice web user interface where you can browse all IDF components, including BSPs. For example, on this picture, uh, if I search for a word board in the IDF component registry, it will show me a list of relevant components. That is uh, BSP for b Rover kit or uh, for Azure kit and or, or about the Kaluga kit that we are working with uh, today. If I click on one of these, uh, I get to the main page of that component. I can see uh, the readme, the license that this component is released, uh, its version, and a list of supported targets. Uh, now here I can see a uh, idf.py uh, command that would add this BSP into, into my project. So it's just idf.py add dependency, name of the component or BSP, and then optional version. And then uh, BSP is in your project. Uh, then probably the most interesting part is on the on the bottom right is the dependency section. Uh, it lists components that will be added to your project with this BSP. Uh, so you can think about BSP as a software software component that depends on or needs other software components. Uh, we have separate components for uh, camera modules or the ES311 audio codec. And uh, these are automatically downloaded and added to your project together with uh, this BSP. With this way, we have a modular software architecture where individual components are separated from each other, offering clean interfaces that can be reused across projects and development boards. Uh, now we are almost at the end. So uh, in this final slide, there are a few pieces of information that just didn't deserve their own slide. Uh, as almost all code in Espressive, ESP BSP is open source on GitHub 
and uh, you are welcome to contribute, file issues, or uh, suggest new features. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Another point is that uh, ESP-BSP is kept up to date with ESP IDA Master and uh, release version 4.4. Uh, we do our best to provide fixed APIs to access BSP functions. Anyway, uh, we have semantic versioning in place, so you can work with fixed version of the BSP and, and uh, you don't have to worry about changes in uh, BSP or IDF. And this uh, is actually connected with uh, another thing, because although uh, compatibility with latest IDF is in general a big advantage, for some, uh, this can be seen as disadvantage. Since BSPs depend on ISP IDF drivers, they are intended for usage with ESP IDF. So if you are a fan of uh, ESP Arduino project, you will have to use their solution for development boards. Uh, at this point, I should also add that um, we don't want ESP BSP to be only for development boards from us, from Espresso. But eventually we would like to have support for third party development boards too, if they are built on yes, Espresso ships, of course. Uh, and the last point uh, I would like to highlight is uh, support for multiple small devices, such as sensors, display and touch controllers, some of which we discussed today. Uh, because, as I said in the beginning, uh, we wanted to provide you with complete package that uh, contains drivers for external components too. The most notable is the display framework built around LVGL graphics library, where we keep updating a list of supported LCD and touch drivers that can be used not only in BSP prototyping, but also in custom board projects. The most notable features that are implemented in this uh, display framework that, and that, that were missing previously are multi-display support that uh, you can have several displays connected to ESP32, uh, display rotation, and improved touch support. Uh, these software components can be used also without the board support package. That means on your custom boards and products. So if your application contains graphics, you should definitely check it out. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you like the ideas and I'll be happy to hear from you at our standard channels. That is ESP32 forum and ESP BSP repository on GitHub. Bye bye. Thank you, Tomás, for your amazing presentation. Uh, now we have a presentation about how to use ESP32 as a connectivity uh, coprocessor. So hope you enjoyed the talk. Hi, Yogesh. Hello, Sonika. As you already know, we are here to discuss on a project on which you are currently working on, which is ESP hosted. Basically, I'm working on a solution where I want Wi-Fi connectivity on my Linux best host, but I don't have Wi-Fi controller on it. So could you please help me to understand how ESP hosted will fulfill my requirement? Definitely. So I think you have come to correct place. So ESP hosted can actually uh, give uh, your connectivity solution. Overall in the market, in the uh, ESP chipsets are actually used as a microcontroller or MCU, a standalone MCU. Here in ESP hosted, we are not using as a standalone mode. So we are introducing one di different mode, which is a communication coprocessor. Within which we are actually attaching ESP chipset to your Linux SOC so that you can get the Wi-Fi connectivity on your your chipset okay so communication co-processor that sounds interesting 
so but uh, i'm little bit confused here so can you please tell me like how can i directly get uh, wi-fi connectivity and my host i mean how is that possible so if you can explain in detail it will be really helpful uh, definitely so but first i will try to give you a uh, brief what is esp hosted and then we can discuss that so overall esp hosted is a open source solution that provides a way to use expressive modules as a communication coprocessor the solution provides wi-fi connectivity like wi-fi and bluetooth to host microprocessor or microcontroller allowing it to communicate with other devices this solution can be used with both rtos based and the linux based systems in this solution there are two different variants one is esp hosted ng that is the next generation and another one is esp hosted fg which is a first generation key so uh, i will just try to dig little ahead and we will uh, as you are using the linux based uh, device where you want to get the esp hosted i will just go to the next generation can you see the block diagram here yes so overall i will try to explain this block diagram in this uh, you can see there are two uh, major parts one is the down part which is esp chipset and the above part is linux host and you can see the legends in the bottom the yellow colored components are esp idf components in the blue color esp hosted ng components are there basically esp hosted software will be in the blue color and the gray color is for the third party components basically these are the components we are going to use it, but we are not going to change it okay so i'll try to explain esp part first and then we will gradually move to the linux counterpart in the esp you can see the blue colored esp hosted ng firmware this is a software a small software which you need to burn or flash on the esp chipset just down uh, you can see two components that is esp wifi driver and esp hci driver these two components are used from the esp idf and they are used as is so there is no change at such now we will try to go little up towards the linux you can see there is a standing uh, line or arrow in between esp and linux host and just above that arrow bus driver sdi spi or ui so what i mean to say is esp and linux are connected with sdio or spi or ui or combination of these we call this as a transport combination now we will try to understand the linux host part overall linux is divided into two parts one is the kernel space and another is the user space the user space is more of used for the user applications and the kernel space will we will have the kernel driver here right uh in the user space you can see there are three legs first is the wps applicant second is the networking applications and third one is the bluetooth i will try to focus on the wps applicant first wps applicant is a standard software which is run on general all the linux based systems this software is actually used to get wifi connection working on your linux okay so whenever you are starting your system this wps applicant by default will be running on your linux will be communicating the underlying nodes like libnl in the user space itself then going to nl802.11 in the kernel space interacting with the cfg802.11 and then communicating with the esp hosted ng driver now let us stop here this vertical line we are we are seeing that wps applicant libnl and so on so forth till cfg802.11 these are all gray or gray color these components are as is used we are not changing anything out of it now we will assume that when the wp supplicant is up it will try to get the wifi working so with the configuration it has it will communicate till cfg802.11 and you can see the blue colored esp hosted ng driver which is actually integrated with cfg802.11 apis 
now whenever the request comes from the wp supplicant it will enter into the esp hosted ng driver and following ahead uh, it will go through the bus driver like sdi spi uart or the uh, peripherals we are connected it will enter into the esp hosted ng firmware okay. so esp firmware and below it esp wi-fi driver is actually uh, whenever the request is coming for uh, wi-fi uh, wi-fi related needs it will communicate with your ap and get it back whatever the response we have got till wi-fi uh, wp supplicant right so this is overall how the wi-fi uh, or uh, wpa supplicant uh, actually tries to configure something it will travel this path Mm -hmm. Now, once this WP supplicant has got the Wi-Fi active Wi-Fi connection, there is a one uh, new network interface which we are going to introduce. Uh, that is, that is going to be ESP Star Zero, for example. That will be, that will be used ahead. I will just tell you. So, in the second leg, in the standing second leg, you can see the networking applications. So, this networking application, you can assume it as a kind of something socket or something being run uh, in the user space now it is going to it it wants to transfer something on top of uh, tcp ip stack so now your esp star zero which we had uh, got up whenever you are transferring it will go through that network interface end up in the esp hosted ng driver and the path remains same it will follow through Till Wi-Fi driver, it will go to the Wi-Fi and back and forth the data transfer happens. So you could understand. So I just wanted to highlight the WP supplicant leg is for the controlling of the Wi-Fi. Yeah. The networking application is the data path. What we are talking about. Now third leg, which is last leg in this slide, uh, is Bluetooth applications. We have Bluetooth control utility, uh, which is given by the BlueZ itself, which runs in the user space using the uh, whenever we are trying to communicate with bluetooth this utility will in turn communicate with bluezy code which lies in the kernel space and that particular uh, 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 will communicate with esp hosted ng driver and the communication will go further down it will end up in esp hosted ng firmware here it will take another path esp esp hci driver Right. And it will communicate with the uh, using the ESP chipset's Bluetooth controller. It, it will communicate with your uh, other devices of Bluetooth. So this is overall how the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth comes in picture. How they are communicating over the ESP hosted uh, software. Okay. So here I can see. Uh... Wi-Fi and Bluetooth both are supported by ESP hosted. So can I use it simultaneously? Uh, yes, uh, so overall ESP hosted uh, software was designed such a date that it was expected to be coexistent like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth both will be working at the same time. So you can and by default the settings are like that Wi-Fi and Bluetooth will be exposed and you, you can directly use it out of it. Okay. So from this block diagram, what I have understood is like uh, blue color components are ESP hosted components, which we are uh, using for connectivity and all gray color components are are the services which are provided by Linux host, right? Yes. Interestingly, that is the uh, main point. So overall, all the gray colored components are not touched upon or not modified anything out okay. of it. We are only introducing the blue colored uh, softwares. In the Linux space, it is a kernel module. You just have to, uh, you just have to uh, install it in your Linux system, or insert it in Linux system, and that's all. You don't have to do anything other than that in Linux subsystem. With that, you should get the wi wireless connectivity solutions easily. Okay, I think Yoga is just so much informative, you know. So if you could give me some uh, practical example, it will be really helpful. To understand it practically now i will try to take you to a demo so that you will understand how things are done and how easily it could be done so when we try to google esp hosted you can see there is a esp hosted repo you and i'll, I'll just uh, try to go through the repo so this is the repo how it looks like i'll just move to uh, the detailed documentation 
and uh, here we will go in the setup so overall there are multiple combinations available transport layer uh, sdio spi and uart combination of those right now we will just try to look at spi because it is my devices are connected with the spi right now and these all combination transport combinations are detailed enough uh, in the right side when you expand you will get to know all the details now this is spi demo we are talking about you can see in the left side the linux subsystem will be sitting here we have taken raspberry pi as an example in the in the right side uh, there is a esp32 it could be any variant like uh, room or any other esp32 variant you can use these are the pin combinations actually uh, above here are connected now this pin configuration uh, the pin uh, uh, length of the jumper cable should be minimal enough we are suggesting it to be less than 10 cm okay let's go to the software counterpart in the software setup first thing we need to do is load the esp binaries basically flash the esp firmware so these where where this firmware comes from so we have already have uh, releases where we are giving the uh, binaries which you can easily flash so i'll just download this and let's go to the terminal so that i can flash that so i have gone into the repo uh, the releases uh, i will just show you what are the files here esp32 here if i do ls you can see all the transport combinations are and the binaries for these all are present here right now we will focus on spi now you can see there are many files here binary files and there is flushing command.txt we'll just cat that file copy paste the command and change the two things here one is the flash border rate basically the border rate at which the flash should happen and we'll change the serial port this is the port where esp is identified to your system it's here so the flashing has started and it is just one command that you need to trigger to get the flashing done okay as you can see it is already flashed now now we will go back to the documentation this is not needed now i'll just close we have covered this esp binary is flashing now we will go to the raspberry pi configuration so this configuration uh, below is specific to the raspberry pi and these are only one time needed activities and that is already present in my setup so we can just move ahead with this okay so this is the github repo we, where we are right now I, we need to clone this is already clone so we will go to the build and load kernel module this is the important part here the wp supplicant by default will be up on your system but it can interfere our testing so we'll just try to kill it first okay so i'll go to the raspberry pi let's try to kill it now we need to go to the uh, repo and fire these commands so this is rpi init.sh is actually a bash script which is for building the kernel module in the linux system and inserting it when we insert this module it will create a esp star 0 interface which is network interface which is compatible with 802.11 so once this is done we will check i have config and I, iw config to verify the interface is created or not just allow one moment so i have config if i do see these esp star 0 is created and you can see it is up it doesn't have ip address 
I'll just try to IW config. And here ESP star zero is also there. And you can see, you can notice the, uh, it is not connected, not associated. Now we'll go back. So overall this, this is uh, done. Uh, so we will move to the next part, which is actually connecting to Wi-Fi. So I'll jump to this uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth over the setup. Here you can see Wi-Fi uh, user guide is there. Uh, I will just try to scan existing a uh, APs. So it is listing all the APs. I'll just try my AP here. Okay, so it is uh, the AP is hosted WPA2. I created with WPA2 uh, security. So there are two types of uh, modes available, open mode. Right now we are having WPA2. So I will jump to the security mode WPA2. WPA2 passphrase, we will try to create a configuration which is understandable by the WPA supplicant. So SSID we have to change and the password we have to change. By the way, this, these commands are standard. So WPA passphrase and we, we are not giving it uh, anything. It is already available. We'll try to start the WPA supplicant. We'll try to run it in background. So here you can see the event connected is fired. So it is connected already. Let's verify it. Now you can spot the difference. ESP star zero has access point listed. So it is already connected and it is connected with the SSID, which is hosted uh, WPA2. So this is connected. Let's try to get the IP now. So DHCP we will try. Okay, IP is there. Now I'll just ping. See, so in very less uh, time and very less commands, we are able to get the Wi-Fi up. And this is all about, uh, you know, Wi-Fi subsystem. Now I'll try to focus on Bluetooth also because it will be easier to showcase that. BT, I will try to enter. Uh, BT for BT, you have to do Bluetooth CTL. And we will try to scan the neighboring Bluetooth devices. Okay, so my device, my mobile is actually having the uh, A2DP source. So we will try to exit from this because we need pulse audio because otherwise it, it, it cannot go ahead for the so let's exit and pulse audio. I will just start. And uh, we will try to rerun the pseudo Bluetooth control. Now we will try to scan neighboring devices. So I have uh, uh, my device named as hosted. So it should be scanned here. See, this is my device C2 ending with, but uh, name will also come. Let's see. Okay. This is a paired device already. So I don't want it to be used. So I'll just remove it so that we can create a fresh pair request. It is removed. I'll just pair it. Okay. It is detected as new. Now I can pair it. Yeah. Okay. So I have got the request on my mobile. I'll just accept it. And see the pairing is connect. The pairing is successful. I'll just try to connect it. Okay. It is failed to connect. Sometimes uh, if the scan is ongoing, this may fail. So we will just uh, stop the scan and retry the connection. Okay. It is connected and the services are resolved. So it is uh, connected now. Now I will just try to shut it off the Bluetooth of my mobile and let's see if it is disconnected or not. I stopped the, yeah, see momentarily when I switch off it, the connected becomes no. So this is, uh, so it is momentarily you can see all the status. This is all about Bluetooth. I'll just show you HCI config, which is a utility. You can understand 
how is the uh, HCI zero is working. So right now the connection is on the SPI bus as we has we have already done it on the SPI. Okay. So this is all about the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth getting up in your uh, Linux subsystem. Okay. Was it good enough? Or yes, was it yes. actually it gave me a fair idea on that how ESP hosted works. So thank you so much for the demo. But uh, here, what I have observed that we are using Linux host only, right, for uh, this particular next generation. But what if I uh, have MCU based host and I want Wi Fi con connectivity on it? Then how can I use this solution? Definitely, I will uh, try to showcase that as well. So, this ESP hosted next generation was more focused about uh, WPA supplicant or more, more focused about the Linux subsystem or Linux devices. Now I will try to show you how the MCU counterpart or MCU host can work with the ESP hosted. So can you see the uh, diagram here? So ESP hosted, yes. this is specific for the ESP hosted first generation. Uh, in the previous diagram, it is almost similar to the previous uh, block diagram. Uh, you can see the ESP components and the yellow colored, blue colored components are almost same. Uh, you can spot the difference. There is a, a one extra blue colored uh, box in the MCU host side. Right. So I'll try to explain in a stepwise manner. So ESP uh, in the bottom, you can see ESP hosted firmware. Uh, uh, first generation firmware is there instead of next generation. Mm -hmm. Below that, ESP uh, Wi-Fi driver and ESP HCI driver. These are same uh, inherited from the ESP IDF components. It uh, above that, the connections are same uh, transport combinations you can use in the FG and, uh, NG and FG. So th those are SDIO, SPI, UART, and combination of those. Above it, in MCO host, you can see blue color ESP hosted FG driver, which is basically our software, which you can use with the MCO host. Okay. Just above it, in the left side, you can see custom control path. Why this control? Uh, this is the main uh, difference in between the FG and NG. That is first generation and next generation. So next generation had WPA supplicant in the Linux subs ecosystem, but in MCU host we do not have WPA supplicant running or anything like that. So what what approach we tried to do is we introduced our own custom control path, basically some APIs that could be easily integrated with your networking application. Through the control path, you can actually invoke those APIs and, for example, one function with SSID and password, and that is invoked, then it will translate through the uh, uh, down and will get connected to your actual API with that SSID and password. So overall, control path will try to get you the connection of the Wi-Fi. Once this control path is done, the data path in the right side you can see the network can, application can push some data or uh, any throughput or anything data. It will go through the TCP IP stack. Again, same path, it will translate and uh, to the ESP IDF components and will try to push the data and back and forth. So uh, I hope this is clear, uh, understood properly. Yes, so uh, I can spot main two difference over here. So for next generation, it is uh, basically used for Linux based host and first generation is for MCU based host and the uh, custom control path, which you have mentioned. So in Linux based host, we have WPS applicant for getting Wi-Fi connectivity and all. And so in first generation, we have custom control path, right? So Perfect. Okay. Yes. So what uh, other differences are there? I mean, are there any other differences in between two uh, two variants? Uh, okay, so I will just try to show you what all the possible differences uh, are existing uh, in the system. So this is the overall comparison of the FG, like first generation and the next generation. Okay. So in the left side, you can see ESP hosted first generation. And in the right side, you can see ESP hosted next generation. In, and I will just try to go through uh, this list feature by feature. So supported platforms on the first generation, those are MCU and Linux host. And in the next generation, there is Linux only host. Okay, so you can hold on here. So I can see uh, Linux host is supported by both the solution. So yes. uh, what is the difference then? I mean, if I can use Linux host in both the cases. Okay, that, that is good. Uh, I was expecting this question. So uh, 
first generation is uh, usable by the MCU and the Linux host both. In if you remember, in first generation we had a custom control path, which was usable by the MCU and Linux host both. So they can both use. Okay. But in the next generation, because it is 802.11, uh, uh, what you say, configuration or WPS applicant uh, based configuration, you can only use with the Linux ecosystem. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, custom control path, even though it is uh, wow. usable in MCU, it could be usable from the Linux as well. Okay. Understood. So I'll just go to the next items Wi Fi configuration mechanism. So here, as we discussed, in first generation, we are giving the custom control interface or control path to connect it with your Wi-Fi. And in case of next generation, it is NL802 or CFG802.11 based uh, or WP supplicant based connection. Right. In the network interfaces available, basically after inserting the module, these are the exposed type of in Ethernet interfaces what uh, we are talking about. In the first generation, we expose 802.11, uh, 802.3 Ethernet interface in case of first generation. But in case of next generation, we expose the 802.11 Wi-Fi interface. Basically, why? Because we no want to configure it through CFG802.11. Mm -hmm. The next line, we were talking about uh, how it is uh, MCU and Linux. So although it is uh, uh, the first generation is supported by the MCU and Linux host. You see the recommended host type, we are mentioning it here as MCU host for first generation. And in the next generation, we are talking about Linux host. Okay. Okay. So CFG802.11 or WP supplicant way makes it seamless way for Linux ecosystem. Got it. Okay. Uh, the coming up next is Wi Fi features. We are exposing, we are. Uh, supporting 802.11 BGN in case of both. The transport layer, as we discussed, remains the same. The transport combinations also remains the same, which are based on the SDIO, SPI, and UART. The Wi-Fi mode, uh, in case of first generation, they are supported as station mode and soft tapping mode. But in case of next generation, we are supporting station. In case of uh, Wi-Fi security protocols, we are supporting open WPA, WPA2 and WPA3 in case of first generation. In case of next generation, we are supporting open WPA and WPA2. For Bluetooth, we are supporting classic BT, BLE 4.2 and BLE 5.0 in case of first generation. In case of next generation, we are supporting classic BT and BLE 4.2. When we come to chips which are supported for these solutions, for first generation, we support ESP32, ESP32C3, ESP32S2, ESP32S3. And in case of ESP hosted next generation, we are supporting only ESP32. I will just uh, come to important part, which is IPUF throughput. So overall, the data path remains the same for both of them. So we have achieved 25 Mbps in case of RX and TX both the cases okay so uh, one more thing here i can observe that uh, first generation uh, variant supports more features than next generation so uh, do you have any plan uh, to support this in next generation these features uh, actually uh, so first generation we have developed already and okay. we just so we wanted to have the experience of the seamless way so 802.11 is uh, the next generation we have recently developed so the missing features in the first, in the left side, basically from the first generation, like soft TP Wi-Fi mode or WPA3 security protocol or BLE 5.0 or the chipsets which are supported already in the first generation are going to be supported in next generation uh, in the phase wise manner or the release manner. Okay. So on top of it, so apart from these features, we are planning to go ahead and uh, plan next features as well. I'll just try to show you what are the next upcoming feature set will be. Okay. So what next? The next features are Wi-Fi 6 support, the BLE 5.2 support, USB support, 802.15.4 support, basically through the thread. 
And then next ESP chipsets which, which we are going to support in future are ESP32, C2, C6, C5, and H2. Okay. Uh uh, one more thing, like, uh, do, uh, can you tell me what are the application for this ESP hosted or uh, who are the car target customer for this? Definitely. So when you talk about the ESP hosted, uh, there are two ways how the solution can be integrated in your solution. You can have uh, already developed your system or software, like a, say legacy system. I'll just try to formulate example. Consider vacuum cleaner that you have already developed and you want now now you cannot change it already developed solutions so you can just attach esp uh, chipset to that particular soc or you know, the chipset and get the esp hosted integrated with it and you can actually make that uh, cloud connected or connected that particular system so this is the one way of looking at other way we can uh, embed uh, integrate the esp hosted when you are thinking about creating new solution from the scratch. So whenever you're anyway, you will need the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connectivity in your solution. Yeah. So from the start, you think that you are going to use ESP hosted so that you can really focus on only your business logic with what you are going to develop. So this way, you, these two ways, both the ways you can integrate your solution uh, and you, you can benefit out of it. Right, right. Okay. So one last question. Okay. So uh, suppose I want to uh, integrate this ESP hosted with my solution and if I will face any issue, so uh, will there be any help provided? I mean, how can I get resolved my queries? Understood. So uh, we have given the troubleshoot document that is already present in the repo itself. Okay. And ESP hosted is an open, open source uh, solution. So this repo or the issues are already visible for you mm -hmm. publicly. So even if you're facing any issue that is that must be faced by somebody else already. So you can find out through those uh, issues. And even if it is new, just raise a, uh, what do you say, issue on the GitHub repo of ours, and we will definitely help you out there. Oh, that's great. Okay. So thank you so much, Yogesh, for the detailed presentation and you know what is for explaining what is ESP hosted. So it is really helpful. Thank you so much. It was all my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Sonika and Yogesh, for this amazing presentation. I really like the way you did it. Uh, so I now I like to invite you to join us. Um, so welcome to the Q and A. Are you what now? Hey. So hello, Yogesh. Can you can you hear us? Hello. We are here. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. So um, can we start the Q&A? Hello. Uh, so. I'm not able to hear. Can you hear us or still missing the sound? Hello? Uh, hello? Yeah, we, we can hear you. So, um, there is some problem, I guess. I'm not able to hear anything. Okay, let's let's try that on on chat. Okay, uh, so I will just try to answer uh, the questions. So, how does it work with uh, non-Linux MCUs? So, uh, as we seen in the uh, slides, uh, the FG solution, basically the first generation solution for the ESP hosted, uh, will 
work for the non linux mcus so we have given example with the stm32 and uh, you can actually use for your uh, non linux mcus uh, with the custom control path so for the mcu specific you should really go for first generation and when you want to go for linux based systems you should really go for next generation solution for the esp hosted okay thank you for the next one so the does next ESP question hosted? from matia uh, does esp hosted support also ethernet for example interfacing microcontroller that has no support to ethernet to have an esp32 so uh, so i see this is a, a similar question so uh, yes so esp hosted actually uh, makes you uh, gives you the wifi or uh, ethernet as a virtual interface so you really don't need uh, when you want, don't have ethernet you can actually use the esp hosted because from your host you can directly connect through some legacy uh, uh, transport or which of the transports uh, we are supporting and from those transports actually your packets will uh, directly will be sent to the wifi so this way there will be uh, if your device doesn't have ethernet the esp hosted which will be the best uh, communication co processor for you so in case you are uh, you are using linux you should really go for ng solution next generation and for the uh microcontroller that you are uh, mentioning here you can go for the first generation solution okay thank you so the last question uh so what are the differences uh, using esp01 via rxtx and uh, at commands and uh, using the esp hosted so uh, i will just try to detail here so uh the esp hosted actually has uh, provides a standard network interface so uh, virtual interface we will uh, create at the uh, network interface will create in the linux subsystem now the tcp ip stack which you want to run it will be used directly from your host say linux host or mcu based host the, when we uh, come to the difference so there are two differences which i can see from esp80 and esp hosted so esp80 is a closed source yeah, where, whereas the esp hosted is a uh, completely open source and uh, another difference is uh, when you want to go for some higher throughput uh, 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 expected or desired you should go for uh, esp hosted solution uh, in both the solutions uh, you get the connectivity but when the uh, throughput requirements are higher you you can go off for the esp hosted okay thank you we we had a small issue here with the audio but it was fixed uh then now we are on the last block uh sorry on the last talk for the first block and we will have a 15 minute break with some uh, cool videos about community and as well uh, expressive uh, solutions. And then we will be back after those 15 minutes. Thank you.
Hi everyone, this is Yanis, your host at Espressive DevCon 22. After our first short break, we are back for the midday session of the second day of the conference. Coming up next is Manali Kaswa and Deepa Kumar Umesh from Espressive's office in Pune, India. They will explain that ESP Rainmaker is designed with extensibility in mind. We'll also demonstrate how users can explore the various ways in which the cloud backend of ESP Rainmaker can be extended to accommodate custom-made features. Then, our colleague from Espressive's office in Shanghai, Brian Ignacio, will take over. His presentation is entitled Espressive Web IDE with the ESP IDF extension for Visual, Co for Visual Studio Code. Brian will tell us that ESP IDF's VS Code extension offers users several features that increase productivity for developing applications. He will discuss notable features of this extension and will then focus on the cloud environment, as well as the way in which ESP IDF allows users to monitor their local device with output in the cloud. For the third presentation of our midday session, we'll be hosting a guest speaker, Casper Lund, the CEO and co-founder of Toit. His presentation is entitled Live Reloading of Microservices on Your ESP32. Casper will tell us that Toit is an open source language for the ESP32 series of chips. Toit enables building your firmware with modular services that can be installed and upgraded on your ESP32 in a couple of seconds over Wi-Fi without even rebooting the device. The services run isolated from each other and communicate through an efficient RPC mechanism, which allows separating complex drivers completely from your own code. Our final presentation of the midday session will be delivered by Marius Vikhammer and Sudip Mohanty from Espressive's headquarters in Shanghai. Their talk is about the ultra low power or ULP coprocessor which is a low power core that is able to run while the main CPU of an ESP chip is in deep sleep mode. This presentation will discuss the ULP capabilities in detail. But first, let's welcome Manali Kaswa and Deepa Kumar Umesh from India, who will talk about extending ESP Rainmaker with custom features. Hi everyone, I'm Manali from Espressive Systems and I work in the backend team of ESP Rainmaker. Today, we are going to talk about extending Rainmaker. But before going to what extending Rainmaker is and how, in what ways can you do it, let us see what ESP Rainmaker is. So ESP Rainmaker is Espressive Systems cloud offering wherein it offers an end-to-end -end solution for all your IoT products. Because of this, you can focus on your innovative core offerings and we focus on the common technical functionalities. So let us see what Rainmaker architecture is so that we know what is offered as part of ESP Rainmaker. So ESP Rainmaker comes with uh, device SDKs. It, it comes with voice assistants in the form of Alexa and Google Voice Assistant, an admin dashboard to manage the Rainmaker service, mobile apps for Android and iOS for your end users to connect with their devices, and uh, one cloud infrastructure, which is hosted on your private AWS account. All these components interact with each other to form the complete ecosystem. So smart IoT devices interact with AWS IoT MQTT broker to connect to cloud and voice assistants, admin dashboard and mobile apps, which are uh, nothing but all the clients interact via API to the cloud. The core application services consists of the core business logic of ESP Rainmaker. And then there are some optional components, which are event processing framework and OAuth2 connectors, which we will see further in the slides. Now, the blue box that you can see is actually the cloud, which is hosted in your AWS account. We'll see what it consists of in the next slide. So the cloud, which is hosted, 
consists of IoT core and SQS in the form of data ingestion. So all your IoT devices, as you can see from the left side, interact via MQTT uh, to the IoT core. And IoT core and SQS form a part to help the device messages go into the cloud. The processing part, which is Lambda, helps in uh, storing this. So whatever me device messages are there, it formats it and it stores it into data storage services like DynamoDB and DimeStream. And uh, if you go to the right part, there are voice assistants and mobile apps and also the dashboard. So all the clients interact via HTTPS uh, to the API gateway. So API gateway is also connected to a Lambda, which decides what to do when that API is invoked it may actually interact with the data storage services to fetch some data or uh, write some data. You can also see one Cognito service. So AWS's Cognito service is used to store uh, users and also session management. There is also a service named SES, which is used to send emails. So uh, these are the major services which are used. This is important because uh, only when you know what is currently offered as part of ESP Rainmaker, can you think of cre creative ways to extend ESP Rainmaker? Now, why do you require extending Rainmaker? So uh, if you see, Rainmaker is pretty complete, and most of the use cases that you have would be, uh, would be already there in Rainmaker. But there may be some specific things which are only applicable to your product. In that case, you can always realize them via extending Rainmaker. So uh, some of the examples which are listed here are uh, integration with external applications like ERP or CRMs. So you would have your own ERP or CRM systems wherein you need to ingest data or get data or do something there. Then there would be analytics based on the events, do some analytics for your business. Then there would be integrating with third party authentication systems. In case you have your own uh, user management system, you can integrate it with Rainmaker or some custom APIs wherein uh, you need something more uh, from Rainmaker and additional processing for MQTT messages, which is specific to your product and also storing audit logs for regulatory compliance, uh, which is uh, specific to you. So these are some of the examples for extending Rainmaker. There may be many more and we would love to hear what creativity you have uh, and what things do you try to extend Rainmaker. So these are the common ways that we think uh, you can extend Rainmaker with. One is the event processing framework. Second is the custom modules. And third is the OAuth2 connectors. So event processing framework is nothing but every time uh, there are events generated in Rainmaker uh, due to some users, APIs, or device messages, in that case, you want to do some action. Custom modules is having more modules on top of the Rainmaker stack. And OAuth2 connectors is to bring your own identity management users into Rainmaker. So we will see these three ways to extend Rainmaker. And as I said, there may be many other ways. Uh, so this is just the top ways. So event processing framework, basically Rainmaker events trigger custom actions. There are multiple events which are generated in Rainmaker, which will then trigger custom actions. These actions will be defined by you based on your requirement. So. Uh, to, to go to the actions part, we require events. So what are Rainmaker events? So Rainmaker events are generated in the Rainmaker cloud as a result of user actions or device messages, either when a user calls, a, calls an API or when a device sends some messages. So there are 16 events which are currently supported, but uh, we are keen on increasing this list. And we will keep adding more events. Most of the important events are like node online or offline. That is the device is disconnected or connected. Uh, then node association, which is when a user has got a new device. Node parameters changed, which is light getting switched on or off. Node automation triggered, tags added from uh, or removed, which is kind of a, a searchable criteria for your node. Some parameters are to associate with the node. And then there is node configuration changed. So these are some of the important events. There are many more, and uh, you can check it out at the GitHub link, which I will provide in the uh, further slides. So these uh, now that we know what events are, we will go to what actions can you think of to you know uh, that these events can trigger. So the events can uh, trigger any custom action, 
and the mediator between is an AWS Lambda. One event can result in multiple actions. In that case, there will be multiple uh, Lambdas which are subscribed to those events. And some of the example actions that we come up with would be sending emails to your end users, sending push notification to users, creating a webhook to integrate uh, with third party applications, analyze user patterns, or integrate other AWS services when an event is generated. So just to give an example, we can say the event is uh, light is getting connected or lighting, light is getting disconnected, the light device. So in that case, you can have an action. We at Rainmaker actually use this framework to send push notification to users, wherein we say that, okay, your light is now online or your light is now offline. So uh, this can be one example which we take. There can be many more. So the framework, uh, as we already know, consists of an AWS Lambda function, which listens to the event SMS topics. And it then triggers the actions which are defined in the code of that Lambda. And the core business logic which uh, defines what to do with that event goes into the Lambda code. The entire flow, uh, if we just uh, recall whatever we have seen till now, uh, it is basically, if you go to the events part, there are two entities involved, which is user and device, which send messages or uh, requests to API and MQTT, which then triggers la their respective Lambdas. There is some part called event filters, which is an advanced concept, and we'll get to it at the end of this section. So the events which are triggered go to that SNS topic. And this SNS topic is actually subs uh, subscribed to the uh, event processing Lambda. So whatever your event processing Lambda is, that will require permissions to access all the 16 event, uh, event topics that Rainmaker provides. And then it can do anything, uh, any custom actions, which can be, uh, as discussed, sending SMS emails, doing some analytics, push notifications, or webhooks. This is the entire event processing framework. So let us now uh, understand what Rainmaker provides for you to get started with uh, the event processing framework. So there is a sample project at this GitHub link, which is provided on the screen, wherein you can just clone that repo. It consists of a, a sample Lambda function, which is developed using Python. And this listens to the SNS topics, uh, which are Rainmaker events. It then processes the payload, and it just prints it in the CloudWatch logs. So this is just a kind of a sample function, which you can extend further to do custom actions. And an evolving list of all the supported events, which Rainmaker supports, is available on the GitHub page. And you can check them out uh, whenever you're developing them. So the tools and technologies that you would require to start customizing the event processing framework would be AWS CLI, AWS Lambda supported programming language, which would be like Python, Go, Java, or Node.js, and AWS SAM CLI. So uh, as Rainmaker uses serverless architecture, there is something named serverless application model in AWS, which is used for developing serverless applications as infrastructure as code. So these three uh, tools are mostly required for developing any serverless application. And you would uh, also obviously require them for developing the event processing framework. The detailed steps of all the development and how the deployment is to be done are available on the GitHub page. And you can then extend the code once you are familiar with the process in which to build and deploy the code. So let us now go to the demo part, wherein uh, we'll see the actual sample function in action and see how it prints the log whenever a node is connected. So let us go to the demo. As you can see in the screen, uh, there is one terminal window where I have cloned that public GitHub repo, and it consists of this webhooks template Python, which is the Lambda function, which prints the event that it gets. There is this template.yaml, which is a SAM template, which defines all the resources which are required. So uh, this, this is the repo, and I have already deployed the code. So this is the GitHub link, uh, which gives all the details regarding how to develop and deploy the code. We can go to uh, the GitHub page, and there are three commands which needs to be entered. One is SAM build, then there is SAM package, and then there is SAM deploy. So uh, once you are in this repo, you just have to SAM build, SAM package uh, with this command, and then SAM deploy. And then your code would be deployed to your AWS account. So if I check this here, this is the stack that got deployed. It consists of these resources. 
uh, which are nothing but the Rainmaker event SNS topics and the permissions. And it consists of this Lambda function. So, so now that we know what it is, let us try to test this event. I already have an ESP32 board which is connected to my local environment. And I will just connect it using the IDF command, idf.py monitor. OK, so till the time this is getting connected, let us go to the CloudWatch logs and see if we have any events. OK, so we have this event wherein if we check, this is Rainmaker event node connected. So this is this is the payload that Rainmaker sends to the Lambda function. Then there is an ID and event type, which is node connected, timestamp, some description. And then there is event data, which consists of all the parameters and uh, other things which you may require. So, so now we have seen the entire end-to-end -end flow, wherein the event that we triggered was getting the node online. And the action that we did was to print the CloudWatch logs. So now we are done with the demo. As I have mentioned before, there is one advanced topic, which is event filters, which you can use to optimize the events which are uh, posted to the SNS topics. If you feel that there are some events which you don't require, in that case, you can filter them. And it, the, this filtering can be done at three stages, which is system, user, and node. So uh, the event filters can, can be configured using the Rainmaker dashboard or using the Rainmaker APIs. The Swagger link is provided in the in the presentation. So this is the event filters flow, wherein the event source can, uh, is actually filtering at system, user, and node level to reach the SNS topic. And system level filter is kind of a master switch, wherein you can say that I don't want any node connected event in my Rainmaker system. Then there is a user level filter, wherein you can say that I don't want node connected events for this particular user. And node is also selecting if you want it or you want to disable it for that particular node. So in case your event processing framework doesn't require node connected, you can say that I want to disable them at system level. So this is the infrastructure that Rainmaker provides so that you can choose which events you want and which you don't. We'll now go to custom modules, which is the second type in which you can extend Rainmaker. So custom modules is custom development on top of Rainmaker. So it will consist of serverless architecture and some modules which will be there on top of the Rainmaker deployment that you have in your AWS account. This may be required to build additional custom logic, maybe additional APIs or additional uh, logic to process the MQTT messages. The custom modules that you develop will actually be on top of Rainmaker. So they need to follow similar architecture. And this will actually fit into the overall paradigm of Rainmaker, wherein it will have uh, serverless services used. So there is this sample custom module, which is provided at uh, the public GitHub of Espresso Systems, which actually demonstrates development of a sample API. And the project which is there, it consists of an API gateway resource. It consists of a Lambda function, a sample DynamoDB table, and SAM templates to deploy all these resources. So this will help you to get kind of a boilerplate code where, wherein you can add other features on top of it. And obviously, the development is not restricted to the resources which are provided in the GitHub repo. You can add other AWS services which you require. And just a note of caution that whatever code that you are going to write in this custom modules, it shouldn't impact the existing Rainmaker deployment. So say it shouldn't delete the tables which Rainmaker uses, or it shouldn't modify something. That is because in that case, the upgrade process of Rainmaker or the way in which Rainmaker works may get hampered, and then uh, it will create problems. Just to get an overview, uh, this is the structure that is there in that sample custom modules, wherein there are four methods to the API gateway. And then there is a Lambda function, which is triggered. So let us now go to the demo of custom modules, wherein we are going to see how we are going to deploy the custom modules. I already have the code cloned in my environment. So 
this is actually the github repo that is that was there in the presentation it consists of this module which is esp custom service which has got three stacks to it which is base api base and custom service and it consists of two lambdas which is api versions custom which tells the users on which api version they are and it consists of the custom lambda which currently as this is a sample code just prints in which method it is so i have already deployed this this is the command make all and and make deploy and name of uh, an s3 bucket which is public in your environment so let us go to the deployed code that we have so this is the esp custom base api uh, which defines an api resource and then there is this esp custom base which defines a table and then there is esp custom service which defines a lambda function and four methods so the api we can actually see it uh, in the aws console wherein uh, we have user slash custom and there are four methods which is put post get delete and also an options method for curl settings now to test if this is working let us just go to the curl command and if we just click it we can see that we get the output from the get function this was it for the demo of custom modules and you can do many interesting things here uh, according to your business requirement so let us now go to the presentation okay so far we have covered event processing framework and we have covered custom modules the third part which is oauth will be covered by my colleague deepak so handing over to him thank you manali uh, for handing over to me uh, so myself deep kumar uh, so i will be going over the oauth to connectors so i am working in the expressive team as a cloud backend engineer so let's just uh, jump on oauth to connectors uh, so what is oauth to connectors uh, and why we need it so this is the first page when uh, the what the end users would see uh, in a mobile app uh, that is developed using rainmaker so in this mobile app the users can sign in or sign up using the email or password or they can also use their google accounts to sign in what if you want your own identity management system to be integrated with rainmaker so that your users will have a seamless experience accessing esp rainmaker platform well that is a solution to it and that's oauth so before moving forward let's just understand how the authentication in rainmaker works so rain in rainmaker uh, we use something called as aws cognito service that is used for user management and authentication it's a serverless uh, service provided by aws cognito has already built in support for social logins like google sign in with apple login with amazon and facebook and we can further extend it with open id connect what is oauth2 and open id connect oauth2 is an industry standard framework for authorization before oauth2 existed uh, or whenever a user wants to share information that is belonging to one website to another the user needs to share his credentials with him but currently with oauth2 the user doesn't need to actually directly share the credentials with the uh, other website he can generally pass a token and using uh, this the access of data is granted now why open id connect is needed open id connect is built on top of oauth2 to actually handle the authentication layer as we move on to the next slide we will now see how the open id connect flow will look like so here we will start from the left hand side where it's written login with corporate id so here the login with corporate id can be your own authentication system so users will click on that they will be redirected to your login interface here the users will enter the user id and password once they enter the correct username and password they will be redirected uh, to a page where that will be requesting the consent of the user to share the particular information here in case of rainmaker this data would be the user information so this user information will contain the user id user name etc that are used to actually uniquely identify a user now once the user says that okay i allow uh, to share the data then the, this particular ui will redirect to rainmaker this that is a callback url which will take this data get the token from your system get the user information from your system depending upon the scope the user has provided and 
Cognito will see if the user exists or not, create a user and authenticate the user and provide the access tokens through which users can seamlessly access the Brainmaker platform. Now, uh, we have discussed the flow of the OpenID Connect. Now, there comes a question uh, where why we need OAuth connector at the first place, right? So why we need the OAuth connector? So OAuth connector acts as a wrapper around your OAuth uh, framework and your the Cognitos OAuth framework. This is mainly because uh, some of the user authentication systems like GitHub or any other systems have some caveats along with their OAuth system. For example, uh, in GitHub, you need to call two APIs to actually access the, all the data that are required to uniquely identify a user, which is currently not out of the box supported by AWS. To do that, we have uh, provided a custom module that actually does all these handling for you, and you can directly start using your OAuth connectors. And this module is already uh, available in the serverless access repository, which is like a Google Play Store or an App Store for applications and, and the access to this particular repository will be provided on request basis. So now, as we have done with all the uh, explanation of how the OAuth 2 and why we need the OAuth 2 connectors, let's jump on to the demo. So here we see the serverless application repository loaded. So let's just search for our OAuth 2 connector. So here we have the our Rainmaker OAuth 2 connector. So let's just click on that. Uh, so after clicking on that, a particular page will be loaded here. So this is the OAuth 2 connector. So in this demo, we will be seeing how to integrate GitHub. So we will be actually filling all the details that are required for the GitHub. So here we have the stack name, we have the authorized URL, we have the email URLs, we have the token URLs, and we have the user URLs. So this user URL is to access the user information. This token is to get the token. Emails is used to get the emails of the users to uniquely identify the user. And we have the authorized to actually initiate the OAuth flow. So once we have filled all the required details, we will click on deploy. So as I've already deployed the stack, I will be not clicking it now. So let's just move on and see the output. So this is what the output will look like after deploying the stack. So we have serverless repo, ESP, Rainmaker, OAuth 2 integration. And if we navigate to the output tab, we have all the information that are required for you to access seamlessly to integrate uh, the Cognito with your own uh, identity provider. So the next step to uh, create a OAuth 2 application in GitHub to actually facilitate the connection between the two. So here I've already created a, a OAuth 2 demo connector with this, and we have already the client ID with us, and we have the uh, client secret with us. And uh, if we scroll down, we would see that this is the homepage URL. I've kept it to expressive, and this is the callback URL. This is the URL to which the uh, GitHub will uh, send the code back to so that we can have access to the token and user info. So now, as we have already configured it, let's just jump to the Cognito. So here in Cognito, I have already added the client. So this is the expressive demo app. Uh, there is client ID, there is client secret, and we have posted all the URLs that are present in the CloudFormation output. That is the authorize, token, JWKS, and the issuer URL. And we have also provided some attribute mapping that are provided here to actually facilitate uh, the mapping between the attributes that are provided in GitHub to the attributes that needs to be stored in Cognito. This list can be extended further depending upon the customer's needs. So once this is done, let's just start uh, testing it. Right. So this is the hosted UI that we have. So this is the particular expressive demo app here you can have your own particular uh, identity system here so once the users start to click on this so they will be redirected to the github login page so as you see here we are trying to log in to github to actually give the access to expressive or rainmaker so let's just do the login okay so now we have done the login. So it's going now to ask for the authorization. So as I've already done the authorization and already provided the access, so now we have actually logged in to the Rainmaker. So how we can know that? So we have received a code here, which can be facilitated further to get the required 
uh, access tokens from the Cognito to actually seamlessly calls the APIs. So this is with the demo. Uh, so let's move on to the presentation again. So now, uh, so as we have seen with the demo on how it actually seamlessly integrates Cognito and GitHub, now this module is also available in GitHub uh, for further customizations. So the link provided here is uh, for the GitHub link. Further, uh, there are detailed steps to actually configure OpenID client in AWS Cognito as well. We have come to the end of the talk. We hope this, this talk was useful in letting you know how to extend Rainmaker to meet your business needs. All the resources are publicly available in GitHub. Please feel free to experiment with all the extensions. If you have any additional questions, we would be happy to help. Thank you and enjoy your day. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, the speakers for the Q&A. So welcome. Hello. Yeah, hi everyone. Hey, hi. So, thank you. So um, we have some some questions here, but uh, I like to first I like to answer or sorry to ask some some questions to you. Uh, so I have some some uh notes here so can i extend remaker in a region and then the a different region uh where i have deployed it uh, right so that is very much possible uh basically your rainmaker deployment is in a different region and you need to extend rainmaker in a region which is closer to you or for some business requirement so that is possible Okay, thank you. And can I add my own extensions to the Remaker, uh, the public Remaker? Is, it is that possible? Okay, so uh, the public Remaker is basically uh, Remaker that Espressif provides uh, for hobbyists and also for uh, you know pilot projects. So uh, that is currently not possible because uh, the access of the public Remaker lies within Espressif and uh, you can't extend uh, the cloud which is there of the backend uh, of public Rainmaker. So that wouldn't be possible. Okay, thank you. So let's see if we have any other question here. So um, we have one. So would Rainmaker be available in Docker or independent of AWS in the future? Uh, okay, so this is... Uh, we may look into this if there is uh, sufficient interest about this, but currently uh, I can't see uh, that there are plans. Which aren't there. Few, but we may do it in future. Okay, so can I ask one last question? Yeah. Uh, is there any like technology that I should know before, like before starting extending Rainmaker? Is there any like what you recommend if I? want to start extending, but I should know some, should I know something before? Uh, right, you should know because uh, you are going to uh, kind of fiddle with the AWS architecture and AWS services. So I recommend that uh, you should know the AWS uh, services which are used, which is the serverless services. And you would, you should also know some language which is supported by AWS Lambda, like say Python, Node.js, Java, and all, so that uh, it will be easier for you to understand what is happening uh, currently and what you can add. Okay, so I think we have uh, no more questions. So do you have anything that you'd like to share or some future plans for uh, for the project? Not, not only for extending, but if you have anything else to to share, so it's the time. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Hi everyone. So thanks for uh, seeing our uh, videos. So it's been great uh, interacting with uh, all your folks. So yeah, there are quite some plans uh, regarding Rainmaker. Uh, so you will hear them about uh, in the um, newsletters or in any other projects. So we are currently uh, pushing Matter integration with Rainmaker. So that was uh, that is something that uh, we are doing. So, yeah, that's it from my side. Okay, so uh, we have one more question. It would be the last one. Uh, 
Okay. So is is there uh, any possible uh, for integration Rainmaker with our exist, existing products and apps? Okay, uh, so this is like uh, you already have your products and uh, apps. Uh, I think uh, this would be possible. That's what I feel. But uh, if you you already have a cloud provider with uh, your users, then it would be difficult to migrate that cloud. But uh, I, I I can't think of anything uh, like. Uh, do you have to add anything? Yeah. Like so that? sure. Uh, so I think this is a quite uh, subjective question on what actually we are trying to integrate mm -hmm. here. Uh, so depending upon what the integration would be, uh, the possibility would change. For example, if there are certain APIs that need to be called here and there, so that can be done. So if a user needs to sign in, that can be done. So but depending upon what type of integration we want with Rainmaker, mm -hmm. uh, the possibility would change. That's how I would comment. I think you this. can just contact the support Team okay. Do it. Do it. okay, so thank you so much for the talk and for the, the answers. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now we have a talk about expressive web ID. So uh, I hope you are uh, enjoying the conference and also I hope you enjoy the next talk. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, this is the the expressive web IDE with the ESP IDF extension for Visual Studio Code for the Debcom uh, 22 for expressive. Uh, my name is Brian uh, Alberto Ignacio Reyes. Um, I work with the the IDE team uh, basically for the VS VS Code uh, extension and web IDE and other. IDE features. Um, today we will show you how uh, this web IDE tool is implemented and how it uses the IDF extension uh, for VS Code and how we can manage to do some code on, on the web. Uh, I'm going to make a brief introduction to the layout of VS Code and uh, Eclipse Thea, which is the base of our uh, web IDE. We're gonna cover the, the basic layout and some files that you might need in order to work with the, this IDE. And we're gonna take a, a quick look at the, the features that we provide in the extension and what is possible to do with the extension. First, uh, the basic layout is as, as follows. You have the activity bar here. And this activity bar shows a few uh, icons here. You can see the files, the explorers for the current project that is open. You can also search a specific keywords on your project. You can also have source control management here, uh, such as GitHub, Bitbucket, etc. Uh, this is the tab for debugging, uh, where you can see the debugging actions in your ID. This is for managing extensions in the VS Code uh, scenario, so you can install extensions. But in the Web IDE, the, the extensions are uh, integrated uh, in the Web IDE, so it's not uh, customizable. We could add any extensions uh, if they are open source in the Open BSX, but uh, they have to be integrated because it's uh, defined in a Docker file, so the container is doesn't install extent. Uh, extensions on the fly. Uh, there's also this part here where you can see the different uh, editors that are open. You can uh, you can group them as you see here. You can uh, tap in side by side, just one, etc. The This part here is the panel where you can see different uh, parts of the outputs of the extension. For example, here in problems, you can see some issues related to the source code. Let's say if you have an error in your source code and you try to build it, the problems will be shown here. The output channel is used to uh, 
basically output some information. Uh, for example, our extension has an output channel called ESP IDF. We will see this later, where we print the output from the different parts of the extension. As, uh, for example, some features like uh, the debug adapter or the SDK configuration editor, etc. The debug console is as such, where when you start a debug session, you will see the output from the debugger here, and then you can also interact with the debugger here as well. The terminal is basically uh, uh, your system terminal. If you're on Windows, the PowerShell, if you're on, on Linux uh, or Mac OS uh, Batch or whatever uh, a shell terminal you're using. The status bar shows the different actions, uh, icons that you can do. Uh, in our extension, we provide a few uh, actions as here as well for your uh, ease, so you can try a few things. Uh, yeah, this is basically what I mentioned here. It just uh, describes you in, in the presentation, the editor, the sidebar, the status bar, the activity bar, and the panels. You can, uh, we can share this uh, presentation with the hyperlinks so you can go through more information about these uh, uh, features, these parts. The, the next part is the concept of workspace in VS Code. So Visual Studio Code has this concept of a workspace folder, which is basically a, a folder in your computer with your project, for example. And there is the concept of workspace, which is a, a, a collection of uh, workspace folders, which are different projects. So you can uh, define a, di a different sets of projects. For example, if you have a project that is a server and a client, you can define uh, each project client and server in a separate uh, workspace folder. And then you can define a workspace that allows you to do a several actions in conjunction together. So you can build for one project and the other, or you can debug them separately or together, we will see this. How do you define a workspace? You use this file called uh, names, name that, uh, your name, that code workspace file. In this file, you define each of these workspace folders. For example, here you can see how it looks in the Explorer window. You see if you have a single project open, it will look like this, just a project and the subfolders. But if you have a workspace, it will have this uh, type workspace here and all your sub uh, workspace folders defined here. As you can see, it's a very basic uh, JSON file that you just can define each path. This path can be local or can be in a remote location since BS Code now supports uh, um, the code spaces, or you can have something in another server in a remote location, etc. So this can be defined here as well. Um, there are three main configuration files for VS Code. As you can see here, uh, in a single project, you will have a, that VS Code uh, directory. In this VS Code directory within your project or your workspace folder, is is contains a set of files that allows you to work with your project with VS Code for more ease. These are these three files. The launch JSON defines the debugging configuration for your workspace folder. So this is just things that you want to customize in the debugging session, the elf file you will want to use, uh, the timeout, etc. Uh, the tasks JSON, these are for defining automated automation tasks. For example, if you want to do some uh, parsing of some binaries or you want to execute something before that the, the debugging uh, session starts, this can be defined here. Uh, the settings of JSON is basically how you configure the Visual Studio Code and our extension behavior. So for example, you can define the pod rate for uh, the monitor, you can define the serial uh, port that you're going to use for a specific project or workspace folder, etc. The task JSON is always defined on each workspace folder. And there is a set of predefined variables you can use in the task JSON and the launch JSON. Uh, there is hyperlinks here, but basically this is a VS Code uh, documentation. You can see more in there, uh, Microsoft VS Code. Uh, website. 
Uh, this is an example of a task JSON. For example, this is just running a shell script here. You can see the different parts. There is the command, there is the Windows, uh, there's also OS X or Linux uh, equivalent for if you need to modify this. The presentation is for the problem stop parsing, so you can define how it's going to execute in the terminal and how to capture errors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The launch JSON has this kind of definition. Basically, there is a type which defines the kind of uh, debugger you're going to use. Uh, BS Code use the concept of a debug adapter and debug adapter protocol, which is a middleman between BS Code and the actual debugger you're going to use. For example, Node, uh, BS Code uses a, a Node debug adapter that will talk with Node. And it doesn't talk directly to Node, but it has a, a small set of code that will talk to the Node itself. Uh, the program is the, the entry part, etc. The arguments for your uh, debugger, this kind of so typical uh, data from a, for a debugging session. Uh, the settings that JSON is uh, where you define the settings of your extension, and they can be defined in three different places. They can be defined within your workspace folder, as we saw before. They can also be defined in the workspace. This is in, within the code workspace file, or it can be defined as well in the global user settings in the BS code. You will see that in BS code, uh, the command palette, you can have uh, a workspace settings, workspace folder settings, or the global your user settings. Uh, this is then an example of a code workspace with settings. So this will define these settings apply for both uh, the workspace folder BS Code and BS Code Docs. So it, let's say if this is client or this is server, it will be defined in these settings will be defined for both uh, projects. But if this project has a value of this setting, the value in this project will override this value here. So the value always comes from global, workspace, and workspace folder. Uh, you can see here, you can also define launch configuration in the code workspace for us here. And this is the example that I mentioned before. So if you want to uh, have a debugging session that uh, runs both client and server, you can define such a scenario as here with the compounds uh, configuration here. The compound will just use uh, we use a configuration here, launch server and launch client will be, which will be a single configuration for each of these um, uh, workspace folder. Uh, now we're gonna take a look at the few features that our extension provides. Uh, the extension basically provides some uh, automation task and some UI for uh, some wizards and some uh, tools that allow you to uh, work with ESPIDF projects with ease. For example, there's a simple command for build, flash, and monitor the ESPIDF projects. And there's also the size analysis switch, uh, of your project. There is a GUI SDK configuration editor. There is the new project wizard and the show example projects that allows you to create projects with ease from the ESPIDF examples. There is also a partition table editor and an MBS partition uh, UI editors. Uh, and also there's a few like uh, flash binary to partition commands. There's um, these are UIs that allow you to, to define a partition table, uh, comma separated values, file with this in the UI and some validation. You can try this. There's, we also have the heap tracing and the system view UI tracing. This allows you to, if your project is configured to, to do uh, a application level tracing and heap level tracing and system level tracing, you can, there's uh, features in the in the extension that allows you to run uh, these traces from the extension. It will generate the trace files, and from the trace files, we you can have some visualization. For example, some plots and some usage of your system, and then you have some advanced system. For example, 
uh, this one you can use something like uh, sys viewer or something you know, some uh, advanced uh, system uh, usage visualization the if you configure the extension properly the extension also allows you to run the open ocd server because uh, all the settings of esp idf tools are uh, configured with the uh, configure esp idf extension which will help you to configure and download all the esp tools in esp idf so if the tools is configured correctly you can run the open ocd server or you can just run the debugger and the you can just press F5 for debug and it will execute the ESP IDF debug adapter, which will also connect to the OpenOCD server. We also have expressive key MU integration for Docker and containers and WSL. So basically, we will see this in the uh, a bit further when we see the example. Uh, but basically, uh, if you are running in a system that has key MU in the path, you are able to execute uh, to debug. Uh, using the key MU fork we have. Uh, currently it's uh, ESP32 target, but we are working for uh, other targets for uh, you can do some emulation testing. Uh, we also have some code coverage for the text editor. If you are enable uh, GCOF, R, GCOF in your project, you are able to add uh, some features of the text editor if the GCOF uh, files are generated. You can highlight your text editor and see the the, the number of times that a line is executed. You also have some other features. You can search uh, some keywords in the ESP IDF documentation from the VS Code itself. You also are able to integrate with other frameworks such as ESP ADF, ESP MDF, ESP Matter, and you also have the Rainmaker login and node modification. So if you log into Rainmaker in the in the VS Code or the, our web ID, you can log in and then you can see your, your nodes associated with your ESP Rainmaker node, and then you can modify values of each node, et cetera. These uh, other frameworks, basically you are able to download these frameworks in your desired location, and this will set the some configuration settings in the extension, which uh, will be added when you're trying to build a specific ADF projects. These are also will be visible in the show examples and new project we serve Windows. So you can create projects from these examples. Uh, now, some of the specific features of the web id itself so the web id itself is based on the clips thea the clips thea is the open source project which allows you to create uh, ides for web or for desktop with ease based on electron app and you can do that from both the website or the local uh, scenario but they are based on their API is very similar to the VS Code and they support VS Code extensions as well. So you could uh, add some of these things uh, to your custom web ID, which is what we do here. So we add our ESP IDF extension, but we also add some uh, desktop companion. The desktop companion allows you to, in the case of the web IDE version, you can connect to the desktop companion that is running locally in your system. So let's say you open your web browser, you're running the web ID, but uh, you want to flash your serial device. So what you can do is you can connect to the desktop companion. The desktop companion will be running in your local machine and you set a specific serial port and it will talk to the, uh, the serial port and it will flash and start a monitor, which will add it in the web ID. And then this allows us to do the flash and monitor uh, in, in the ESP IDF Docker file, which is the one that uh, we use in the web ID. So you, the web ID, uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, published a uh, web ID Docker image already, but you can also uh, build from the Docker file in the web ID project that is here in this hyperlink. You see in the IDF web ID. Um, here we have uh, the project, it's open source, but you can, there's the Docker file, which basically will take the ESP IDF Docker file 
and extended and adding key mu, adding this web ID source code, and it will uh, provide you with a, a web ID that you can run on the browser. And the desktop companion here, we also have provided uh, a release uh, the, in the IWDC. And then there's the uh, there's release for Windows here, which you can specify here if you want to just use an executable for Windows, or you can just run uh, the Python script, which is available in the source code here. And uh, for for example, Mac OS and, and a Linux device, you can just run the, the Python script. Okay, so it's time to switch to Visual Studio Code, but in our case, will be more directly to Thea and to see this in action. Okay, so here I have a, a running uh, device in the Thea. Basically, Thea is, is basically the, what you expect in the in the browser, but it's the same as VS Code here. Like the UI, as you can see, is exactly the same. Uh, I wanted to show you a few, a few features here. If you see here, I press F1 and I type ESP IDF. I can see all the commands that are provided by this extension. So you have a few things that you can do. For example, you can launch the key email debug session. You can launch the show examples as this window here. You can build your project. You can start a ticket config monitor, et cetera. We have a, a lot of uh, commands that we provide. You can take a look at the VS Code extension for more information about these things. Um, this is, for example, the ESP IDF examples. I just run the command and I will see this window. I can see all these examples. Then I created a project using this button here. This will create a project here that will create this current project that we have open here. And then we can run, for example, using these uh, things here, uh, these uh, quick action buttons, for example, the bill. We can do the full clean. We can do the the menu config, the SDK configuration editor. This will allow you to select the current project. If you have a multiple projects, uh, if you have a workspace, you can switch between one workspace folder and another with this command. You can also select the target here. It will show you the different targets. This will allow you to select the different ports. Uh, build, uh, select the flash method. We support UART, JTAG, and DFU flashing methods, uh, but these are for the the VS Code extension itself, not the web version. And then here we you we, you can do the actual flashing. This is more for this is for to start the monitor. This will run build flash monitor. This will uh, run. Uh, open a ESP IDF terminal which with the values loaded and this is for executing custom tasks for if you have defined the IDF that custom task uh, configuration setting you can define tasks there and when you do this it will execute here so let's say you open up the blink example project here as you can see the, there is uh, some text highlight configuration here if I highlight this function, for example, I can see some description. These are provided by the CLang extension that is uh, here. You can see that the CLang extension, extension for OpenBSX for Thea is also available on VS Code extension as well. They will use the already the compiles command JSON from your build, and it will help you to recognize this uh, like this. Uh, uh, go to definition and go to declaration functions. Then uh, you execute the build. When you execute the build, it will uh, show you in a terminal such as like this. And after the build is done, it will it will show you the the this task, the ESPIDF size, which will show you the results. You can see here the the result of a of my Blink example here. Um, then if I want to do uh, if I want to start a key MU session, for example, I after you finish building, it will do this one, launch key MU debug session. What will it will do? It will start the debug adapter. Uh, first, this before the debug adapter is run, the, this task merge flash binary will be executed because key MU 
and uh, he's launched here. You will see this uh, set scenario here. Uh, this GMU will start, but it needs one binary file. So this task merge flash binary is done automatically when you launch the GMU session. This will uh, run this task that will combine all the flash, uh, all these binary files into a single, um, into a single uh, binary. After all this task is executed, you can see that the debug session has started. And then you can, you're using a KMU here to test your current uh, project. And you can see the values here. You can see, you can see the different values. You don't have any locals because it's, it's still not locals here. Uh, you can see some, uh, some register values as provided here. Um, there are some other things that uh, you can do here for typical uh, debug experience here. I'll go to the declaration, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and then this will finish the, the debug session. Uh, we will finish for now. Other features you can see here, this already uh, finished. Um, this is the SDK config editor. For example, here, this is started by this button here, or you can just run the press F1 and the command SDK config editor here. This will open these windows, which allows you to go to a specific configure your device. You can also search for a specific uh, uh, values, etc. And that's it. Then you save the, the modifications and it will update. You will need to rebuild again, but that's, that's one of the things. This is um, one of the the ESP IDF Explorer things. Um, this will uh, provide you with some other features, uh, depends if you want to use. Um, and there are other these configuration things here. For example, uh, we have a web, web serial, which uh, we are currently working on. It's an open pull request on the web ID. But basically, you can connect the device with the ESP IDF. Uh, to here, you connect, you pair the web serial for, for your crown, you pair it to this device here, to the, the same way that you do in UART. And then here you play, for example, flash with web serial. It will start flashing. You can see the, the results of flashing here. Then this flashing using web serial don't need the desktop companion anymore. And that's it. That's pretty much it from the for this uh, presentation. Um, so we that's basically most of the features. There's many many other features that uh, uh, we have yet to show, but due to time restrictions, we cannot show them all. You can take a look at the VS Code extension uh, GitHub repository for uh, many tutorials that we show the different features we have. Uh, this is uh, thanks for talking the future. What is next? We're con constantly trying to improve the extension. We're trying to automate more and less complexity, less configuration. We are working on improving more of the system view tracing. We want to add more KME features and improve the emulation development. We are currently, as you saw, the web serial for web ID it's, it's working, it's already there, but there's a few improvements we need to do. Uh, also, we want to improve the set of workflow and cover more set of cases. And also, we are very happy to receive any recommendations and feedback you guys uh, feel that is needed in the extension and what we want. So anything you want in the extension that we could make better or something you want to automate, we are happy to get any feedback. Um, yeah, basically that's, that's it from here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Please uh, check the GitHub repository for the VS Code extension, especially our documentation, see how can we can improve and any feedback and suggestions you may have. Uh, this will be the part in the presentation for the Q&A. Um, but this will happen after. Uh, thank you so much for your attention.
Okay, it's time for one more Q&A with Brian. Thank you for your talk. Now I will uh, welcome you, Brian, to the Q&A. How are you? Good, good. How's it going? Can you hear me well? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. So we have some questions here. So um, the first one is quite interesting because like I, if I have like multiple ESP IDF version installed in my computer, like 4.4 or, or even like 4.0, is there, a, is there a simple way to set up a project in VS Code to use one or the other? Uh, yeah, so, well, we have a, a set of wizard called, it's a command called configure ESP IDF extension. It's a UI wizard that allows you to set up the extension in several ways. Um, you can just use, for example, uh, uh, one of the options. Uh, if you follow our uh, tutorials in the GitHub repository, you will see that uh, there is a several versions. There's express, express, advanced, and using existing setup. So if you choose express, uh, you will see an option that allows you to select uh, ESP IDF version or find ESP IDF in your system. So you can just choose the one of the IDF versions in your system, uh, your um, expressive uh, IDF tools path, uh, and then you can use those, uh, you can change that with just a few clicks. Uh, you choose these two locations and then the set wizard will configure the extension for you. And then you can change, uh, like you can just uh, use the extension after that with the, the new version that you have used. As, uh, as you can see in the talk, settings uh, have uh, different uh, uh, precedents. So you also should think if you want to use a specific version for a specific project, you can do so by setting settings in a, a specific project. For example, if you have a project, uh, let's say you have a, 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 let's say project A, and you want to use uh, 4.4 on project A, and then you have project B, you want to use a uh, five, then you can just define on each uh, project, there is a, a BS code folder and there's a settings JSON that you can define there. Or you, you will see this if you create exam, uh, the IDF project from one of our examples. Um, this will have a settings JSON and you can define uh, settings in each folder. So you can define uh, a version for each project. So uh, that's it. Uh, that's, you are able to use this. There is a multi-projects uh, configuration that allows you to set either one of those. And we are looking forward, if you have any, any suggestions uh, or something to make it even more uh, easier to do so, uh, please uh, just leave a feature request or a issue in our GitHub repository. We are always looking forward to improve the extension. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question here from Tony. Is there any plan for a better support or a template for Moot project plus shared component components structure? Uh, so Tony, this really depends on the architecture of your uh, uh, your project, right? Because uh, you can have uh, multiple projects being reused. Um, one thing, if you follow the talk, you see that you can define different projects and then you can do several tasks. For example, you can have in VS Code, you have a, a workspace which can contain different folders. So let's say each workspace folder represents a project. As you, you saw, is there is a client and there is a server, for example. Uh, these are two projects, for example, and you can switch between one and four by selecting the current active uh, project in VS Code. Um, you can build Flash uh, and debug for a chosen project. Uh, but if you want to share components, I think this is a slightly more uh, manual configuration issue because you can define projects in your CMake list uh, files. And then you say, okay, I can just uh, uh, import uh, back components from this location and that other location. So I think it's pretty much up to you, like sharing components. Uh, if you follow the expressive documentation, you can see that uh, there are several ways you can 
uh, several places where you can define your your specific components and each component also like project component or you can have a common uh, component uh, folder uh, but that is more related to the IDF or ADF or any framework you're using, the documentation you are using. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Um, so, how can I get started with IDF Web IDE? Uh, very simple. There is a, a repository, a GitHub repository of the Web IDE. Uh, I think uh, it's shared on the chat, but I will send also as well. Um, basically, this repository has the, the source code, but there's also have uh, published the Docker image. And the Docker image is also published in Docker Hub in ESP B Ignacio. Uh, you can just use the Docker image and toy around with, with it if you want. You can build it from the source code. Uh, there is instructions in the GitHub repository. And uh, basically you have whatever you have from your BS code extension is already available. Not everything, but most of the stuff is already available in the web ID. You can refer to the BS code extension documentation for tutorials and the web IDs, the only main differences are the way you will flash. You will use either web serial or the desktop companion, which are defined in the GitHub repository. Okay, so again, Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you for the answers and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, everyone. Uh, keep, keep, keep going with Depcom. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so next talk uh, will be a talk from an external uh, company called Twit. So they will talk about uh, live reloading of microservices on your ESP. 32. So I hope you enjoy. Hi, and welcome to this session on live reloading of microservices on your ESP32. I'm Casper, the co-founder and CEO of Toit, a startup company in Denmark focusing on building the next generation software platform for IoT. My background is, in, within, is within the fields of software engineering. In 2006, I joined Google to help them build the Google Chrome browser. Uh, and I focused on the JavaScript engine inside, making that approximately 100 times faster than the competition at that point in time. Having worked uh, for a number of years on the, on the web in context of Chrome, um, I started a language project called Dart that is now the basis for um, a mobile application framework, Flutter, which is taking over a, a good chunk of the mobile app space uh, globally as we speak. Dart is a language that I helped design and implement, and it's something that's powering a, a lot of uh, next generation mobile applications. Having worked for a long time at a big American corporation, I wanted to stand on my own feet, so in 2018, I started a small company called Toit um, with the goal of, of making a vastly improved experience uh, for developing functionality for, for devices. The whole founding team for Toit actually comes from Google, and I feel very blessed to work with some of the best people in the industry, and together we have decades of experience implementing some of the most used software platforms in the world. Our focus has always been software platforms, and in particular programming language implementations and virtual machines. Um, so that's sort of the, 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 um, the governing principle of the work we've done. A virtual machine in this context is typically like a runtime environment for executing programming languages efficiently. And that's been the focus of our, uh, of our work uh, for a couple of decades. You probably know VMs already. They power servers and desktops and mobile systems and, you, and, uh, and platforms like the Java platform or JavaScript in the browser or Dart in a, in a Flutter context are all powered by programming languages, Java, JavaScript, and Dart. Um, and the, they're implemented uh, by, by, uh, by means of a virtual machine that runs on, a, on, the, on, the, on the hardware. In 2018, we thought, why don't we try to use the same techniques, this virtual machine concept on network-connected microcontrollers like the ESP32, 
we we saw that the ESP32 and uh, chips in that family were powerful enough to actually be very meaningful small little computers in their own right. So they needed, at least in our perspective, a richer and better software platform on them to help people be more productive and uh, and to to raise the abstraction level on these devices, making it easier to build better stuff quicker. So we put the Toyd VM on an ESP32 and we, we made it so that uh, you can run independent applications protected from the virtual machine and the underlying hardware and gave them a sort of a feel where they feel much more like small little containers and isolates in their own right, things that run side by side and are independent, instead of having this sort of classical monolithic approach to these things. And if you if you look at that thing and think about the architecture that that sort of implies, it looks something like this. Right? On a traditional stack, you compile and you link uh, all the system functionality together, maybe on top of a framework like the ESP IDF, and you call all of that the firmware. This is what you'll update, this is what you'll ship to your uh, your customers, and this is what, uh, what you, you will um, um, be concerned with. So the thing is that when all system functionality is, is compiled and linked together that way, dealing with it and introducing uh, new functionality in these things become slightly more problematic than you'd like because a change in any part of the system is essentially a change in all of the system. Now contrast that to the, uh, the architecture that we're proposing with, with Toyd on the right. We still base ourselves on the ESP IDF, but we add our virtual machine layer right on top of that. And that constitutes our firmware, you could say. On top of this firmware, we then have individual applications, pure software that run uh, in isolation from each other in their own little containers. The right-hand side looks much more like a what a modern operating system would look like, um, whereas the left-hand side is more sort of the traditional real-time operating system um, um, uh, structure. We feel that, that for lots of software developers, having better uh, modularity and better tooling um, is, is a big, big win. So we focus on that, that right side of this. I think for me, at least, the, the key point is really that the VMs, they, in addition to giving you isolation between these components in our sake, case, they also give you what I call serviceability. The ability to actually install and configure and deal with the software on your device at runtime, wh whether that uh, device is in production or in your in your lab. So this ability to actually service the device, change what it does, maintain it, look into it, uh, and, and understand it well, I think is, is really, really key. And most um, real-time OS-based um, systems sort of stop at perhaps at observability where you can see what's happening, but you have very, very few means for for actually manipulating and changing the software that runs on it in production. So the focus for this presentation will actually be how you can start using Toy on your ESP32. And I wanna just go in there and just tell you how that would work to give you a sense for what it is that we've built and why, why you should care. So I wanna show you how you can get started using Toy and higher level abstractions on ESP32 and it's surprisingly easy to do. It does not require anything fancy from you. So I'll try to go through how, how, it, how the structure of it works and show you in practice how you could get started. First up, Toyd is an open source and free project. Um, it comes with a, a language implementation on GitHub and a package manager that allows you to, to um, reuse functionality built by others in a very seamless manner. The, 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 these are the two sort of core components of, of what it takes to run toy programs. But we found that actually building a developer-friendly tooling on top of this is essential for making this very, very accessible. We call this Jaguar. It's an open source developer tooling based on toy, and this is the easiest way to get started with, with toy code on your devices. So the way you would start this and I'm gonna show you this in a moment, is actually just downloading and installing Jaguar. It's very well um, uh, bundled up, so it's easy to get going with that. You can use Homebrew on macOS, Winget on Windows, and on a few uh, Linux ver uh, versions, we've also sort of packaged up um, a, an easy to install version of this. 
If you are not running one of those platforms, of course you have the ability to just go download the prepackaged builds uh, from archives in the uh, from the GitHub uh, repository. But it's not super interesting just to see these words on the slide. I think it's much more fun to uh, to dive in there and, and and see how it works. Like so, let's try it out. I'll be installing Jaguar on my MacBook from the terminal. So first up, Jag is not installed, so I'll pull it down using Homebrew. I point Homebrew to the toy line slash toy tab, and it installs it from there. Having installed it, the Jag command is now available for me, and it's installed version 1.6.6. Now I'm ready to actually put the Jag firmware onto my ESP32. I've connected the ESP32 using the serial link to my MacBook, and I'm going to use the jack flash command to actually put the bits there. Jack flash needs a few supporting tools like the ESP tool for it to function. So I'll download those using jack setup. When jack setup is complete, I have a fully functioning jack installation and I can flash the firmware onto the device. The flashing uses the ESP tool that you might be familiar with. And it is actually the last time in this presentation where I'll be flashing and putting functionality on the device using the serial link. The rest of the presentation will be using Wi-Fi to put new code and new functionality onto the device. So we don't have to wait for the serial link and we don't have to, um, to use the ESP tool going forward. Now we're done putting the firmware onto the device. So we can do a jack monitor and get the serial output from the device just to see that it seems to be functioning and connecting correctly to the network. Every Jaguar device gets a name by default. In this case, we've decided to call it Upbeep Mail, and we'll be using that name in, uh, in the next part of the presentation to, uh, to identify the device and make sure we're talking to the right one. To actually do coding on the device, I find it practical to use VS Code as it is an integrated environment uh, where working with source code and getting completions is, is a it's a helpful uh, uh, thing to have available. So I'll start a Visual Studio Code and I'll have a main the toit file. Now to work with toit code, I advise you to install the uh, toit extension and you can find that in the toit, uh, in the uh, Visual Studio Code marketplace and you can go install it from there. Now having installed that, uh, we actually have a, a fully fledged environment for writing code with code completions and everything. So we'll do a hello world example like that, and we'll be ready to actually run this code on the device. Now to actually run the code on the device, it's, it is really practical to be able to see the serial output from it. So we can start uh, Jaguar's serial monitoring and get that on the right port right here within Visual Studio Code. You see this uh, down here uh, at the bottom of it. You see we're still talking to upbeat mail and we're ready to actually run code on it. Let me split the terminal here so the left part will be the output and the right part will be where I engage, I engage with the device. So now let's try to run main.toit on the device. Jack run main.toit is all it takes to actually get to choose upbeat mail and send the code, the hello world example, to the device. You see the output here in the serial. And what's happening underneath here is actually that we compile the code, send it, install it in Flash, run it, and then stop the program again. So quite simple to use. We can print more things than just hello world. So we could we'd say, let's print the time. Time that now returns to the current time. So we might be able to just get a sense for that. Apparently my ESP32 believes the time is 1970, but this allows me to actually illustrate how you can pull down an, a, a supporting package like the NTP code for using the network uh, time protocol to update the time on the device. So we'll do jack uh, pkg init to make this repository, uh, this uh, directory that I'm working in, a place where you can install packages. And then we'll go install the NTP package right here. We've installed it and now it's actually available for use. I can import the NTP code like this and I can start using it. Now the NTP synchronized method, we can go to the definition of that to see what it does. It returns a result an NTP result, which is an adjustment and then some accuracy. So I'll be using that to actually update the time and um, and, and get a better sense of uh, what time it really is than in 1970. Let's go back again. So let's try to actually do the synchronization here. 
and then print out the adjustment that NTP believes we should be making. Like this. We'll run it again. Jack run main.toy, like here. And you'll see that the output reflects that we should be doing a rather large adjustment to the time, like many, many minutes. So let's try to do that. We'll import the ESP32 support code, and that allows us to actually adjust the real-time clock with the adjustment, like this. Run it again. No restarts of the device, no nothing. We just run it and see that now we've changed the, um, the time, and we're now in 2022, which is much, much better. So we can clean this up now and have a, a nice working example that adjusts the time based on this. We'll be using a more structured logging me mechanism than just printing. So let's do like a logger is like an ordinary logger with a better name, with name, we'll call it NTP. And we'll be logging some information like log info. And we'll be doing like, um, we'll be telling ourselves that we've, we've synchronized and that the adjustment was the sync adjustment. And the time now is the current time. We can run this just to get a sense for how it works. Uh, and we'll see that the output is now NTP info, synchronized, the adjustment was made, a couple of milliseconds, and we have a new updated time. Now with that, let me return to the presentation and tell you all about what you just saw. So what you just saw here was like the Jago experience that shows you how to run Toit code on your device. Now Toit is a language and an implementation of that language that's open source. We've built it to enable high level programming for microcontrollers such as the ESP32, but it is a custom programming language. So I think it's worth spending just a few minutes on explaining how it, how it looks like uh, and, and just walking through a little bit more of the, of the context for it. So simple programs should be simple to express and we've done our best job at making this a uh, very lightweight feel. Um, so the hello world is something you've already seen. Uh, looks, uh, looks like this. Of course, you can have functions and you can introduce uh, uh, abstractions over, uh, over um, expressions and statements like that. And then here I have a few examples of a function that returns the square of an X and a function that returns the, the double a given X by adding them together. I just want to showcase that functions are easy to write, easy to type with static typing if you want to. And uh, in, in, in general, it doesn't feel um, uh, like a very scary thing to enter. Uh, the arrow is, a, um, is a, a way to indicate the return type of a function. And we like that the return types are given uh, sort of at the, at the end of the signature of this method, much like many of the modern languages out there. Clearly, you also need access to things, and we, um, we're going to look more into this uh, later, things that are like lower level. So, so Toyd comes with pin level access to uh, I2C and, I2 and GPIO uh, abstractions uh, and makes it straightforward to, to work with these things. Um, here you see some of the named arguments come into play. Uh, SDA and SCL are not just two positional arguments, but they're actually named and it's understandable what they're doing. Uh, Toyd is certainly not unique in the, in the sense that it's the only language that has these things, but we feel like it's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, and fresh take on, on what a modern language looks like in, in 2022. So having sort of just seen the language, seen it a little bit in action, I want to just go back to some, some more um, real code and, and show you how we can combine some of the, the simple stuff we did with uh, Hello World and NTP code. and um, and show you how this concept of live reloading fundamentally changes how you want to work with your code. So live reloading is pretty simple. It just means that we will use the fact that Toyota is fast and we will rerun your program on your ESP32 whenever it changes on the disk. So that means that if you're sitting in your IDE, VS Code, and you're changing a file and you save it, we'll compile it, upload it to the device, rerun it from the start, and that really works because we're always, it's always possible for us to stop a process in a clean way and restart the program again um, later. So all the resources are reclaimed the right way. So, 
So having a stack that allows you to stop things when you want to and restart them and having it fast enough that we can, we can actually get away with just watching and, and rerunning whenever things change means that you have a super powerful way of learning quickly and building cool things. I'm going to show you how you can hook up a BME 280 sensor without knowing too much about the BME 280 sensor um, in a live way where we just go to the code and um, we'll try adapting the examples we have to make them actually use a BME 280 sensor that's already connected to my ESP32. Before we dive into the live coding, uh, let me just install the main.toit file here that we created as an ntp.toit by just copying it so that we have it uh, for, for uh, future use. Now with this, I'm actually uh, ready to just start running this code and having the file watching uh, take care of, um, of all the compilations uh, behind my back. So I'll use Jaguar, watch for changes and rerun. And I'll, I'll say, tell it to uh, do this on upbeat mail. And you'll see here that it's actually starting up, scanning and running some code on it. Now, if we go back, uh, we can tell that it actually ran this just again, got a little bit of a, a new NTP information, but, but now behind the scenes, we actually have an instance uh, of, the, uh, of Jaguar running, watching our every move, watching what we're doing with this file. So if we start changing it, simplifying it and saying, let's, let's just do some printing, go back to hello world again. And we save this, you'll see that it prints hello world. And if we want to try something else out in this context, we can just do it. Hello ESP32 fans. I save it and it immediately just runs it on the device. So this is great for trying things out. Now I actually connected a new sensor uh, to the ESP32 here. Uh, and we, we might be able to just use some of the I square C and GPIO support to figure out which sensor it is. So let's stop importing all the logging and NTP stuff and just import the I square C library and the GPIO library. With those in hand, we can actually construct uh, an I square C bus based on uh, some GPIO pins, 21, and a CL is gonna be 22. That is how I wired it up. And we can try to print uh, the result of scanning the bus for devices. Now I've just saved it and we can see there, it still says, hello, ESP32 fans. And it prints a single device, 119, which is a BME 280, if I'm not mistaken. So let's try to actually pull down the BME package. And we'll do this by calling Jack PKG install BME 280 down here. And this will give me some helpful um, extra driver support for the BME 280. So if I do like this, import it, we could say print is it BME 280 and then just print bus that scan if that set actually contains the BME 280 um, address. And we just save this and it will tell us right here, is it a BME 280? It actually is false. It's probably because I need to use the alternate address. I'll save it here and we'll get, is it a BME 280? True. That's great. Now we can actually use the I square C address alt here um, to construct um, an I square C device. So we'll do I square C device of this address and we'll get something we can use. It's actually going to be called on the bus uh, like this uh, so that everything is set up the correct way. So with that, we can say create device just to check that we actually have this device created. It says create a device. That's good. Let's do a driver then based on the device. So we'll do BME 280 driver device and we'll say print driver created something about the temperature driver dot read temperature. I'll save this and we'll see that it's at 21.7 degrees here in, uh, in my house. But just using the uh, watch functionality, we've been able to just like quickly code up uh, something that uses a BME 280 driver, constructs the right things, tries a few things out and figures out how to get the temperature out. I think that is a neat way of working with code on a device. Like live reloading of the code while you edit it so you get a sense for what it's doing. We can clean it up a little bit and say, actually the temperature will pull it out here. Let's 
sell the CS right. So we'll do like this, driver read temperature, and we'll just write that it's actually Celsius. And we'll do Celsius here instead. So with this small modifications, refactorings, we've, we've made the program better and we've made something that actually reads the device uh, temperature from the from the sensor and um, and gives me that that full view of uh, of how the code is going to work on the device when I run it. Okay, that was hooking up a BME 280 sensor using live reloading and file system watching. Now, I don't think we should stop there. I think we should go even further. And like once you have a way of running code on the device, it's a very natural thought like how can I run more code, more independently com compiled and developed um, um, parts of the system. And this is where microservices sort of come in. That the ability to build your firmware out of modular services that can be installed and upgraded independently is incredibly powerful. And this is another thing that's um, very clear in other parts of the industry, that the, uh, a great way of decomposing uh, applications and making them more robust by giving them cleaner interfaces by, uh, between smaller things is, if not overdone, a very powerful mechanism for writing better uh, and higher quality code. So I've shown you sort of the, 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 the architecture for this already. Uh, we have the ESP IDF at the, at the core and we have a virtual machine just on top of it. And then we have these this ability to have multiple applications or services running on top of this. So the way we've actually mapped this to something that Jaguar supports directly is by taking these different apps and installing them with Jaguar in a live way on the device um, as separate uh, small containers. So to install the NTP code we already saw, we could just say Jag container install ntp.toit and give it the name time. It's a time synchronization uh, container then. Um, and that gives us a way to just say, I already built this. Let me just take that code, stuff it in a container and have it run. And with Jack, it's as easy as that. Whenever you then reboot your device, it will rerun this code. So it's now so installed, not just a transient thing. We can do the same with uh, the BME 280 code that we have. So that whenever we boot, you get a new, new reading. Um, and clearly, you can also have a, a separate application that does your, your main thing um, and have them just installed side by side. And once you've done that, you can ask the device to like list whatever is on the device and just um, go, go, uh, go, go through that. So, um, so I think I, I want to show you how this works in practice. So uh, I'm going to jump into VS Code again and just give you a sense for how, how this actually works um, when you try to build functionality out of multiple things. Now let's start with listing the containers already installed on the device. You see them down here, Jack container list. There's only one, it's Jaguar. But we could go install the NTP code that we built as a container. Jack container install, we would call it time and base it on the NTP.toy file. Now we're installing this on upbeat mail and you see that it says info container time installed and started. Good. We can list the containers and we'll see these two. Let me just adjust the, the split here a little bit. Okay, so we now installed the NTP code as a se separate container on the device. That container will actually restart whenever the device restarts. So it will always be present and functioning. Let me try to re reboot the device by resetting it and you see it starting the time con container just before it connects to the network and it starts running everything. It actually does the synchronization and we actually have a, a working time here. So you see that we can compose the functionality of the device from independently compiled and built services that run in their own isolated container. Pretty neat. Now, if we were to do something like that with the BME 280 code um, and the, the main application that prints the, uh, the temperature out, what we could do is we could copy uh, the main file to bme280.toy, just so we have a copy of it going around, before we start changing the, the main application here to be more independent of the BME280 driver and just uh, capable of using any kind of temperature sensor. 
So let me just try to start dropping some of this support for the BME280. And instead of using that, I'm gonna pull in a small uh, package of, uh, of sensor uh, APIs, and we're gonna use uh, the temperature one in there. It's gonna be sensors.temperatureservice. And we're gonna construct a client for accessing that service from the outside. And with that in hand, we're gonna change all of this code to just say, give me the temperature service, and let me read from that. Now, when I save this, this code actually still is being watched by Jaguar. So we'll run this code on the device and it'll actually give me a nice little error here. I cannot find that service. There is no temperature service on the device. Now, good thing I preserved the bme280.toit file. We'll go into that and we'll change it from being just a, um, a piece of code that prints the uh, temperature, uh, but instead be something that will actually expose this sensor uh, service uh, to, the, to the other application. It's pretty straightforward. We still need i squared c GPIO on the BME280 driver, but we also need to import the sensors library here. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna uh, pull in the, uh, the helpers for defining new sen uh, uh, sensor services. We're gonna extend that and create a BME280 service that extends the, uh, the definitions and the temperature service here. So we're gonna use the driver, uh, the BME280 driver to, to build this. We're not starting completely over. Um, and we're gonna create a constructor for this thing takes the driver and tells the, the superclass that we are the two BME280 uh, service and that our major version is let's say zero and our minor version is zero or one, let's call it one. Now with the BME280 service, we're actually missing a uh, single implementation of the read functionality, but that's easy to do. Read float is just calling the same thing on the driver, read temperature. So with that, we now have a BME280 service that we just need to install and have running. Uh, and then hopefully the application that we were uh, building just before will use this uh, without knowing that it's actually talking to a BME280. So instead of printing in here, I'm gonna do the service, BME280 service from the driver, and I'm gonna install it. So now I've written this thing. All I need to do is to actually put this BME280 the toy code in a container on the device, and hopefully that will make it available for the main app. Let's go down here again and say, Jack, install this time. I'm gonna the thermo, and we're gonna install the BME280, the toy file. So we see over here that we've installed the thermo app and started it. So let's go back to the main thing and just try to do a trivial change to it and see if that reruns it. What you see now is actually this program starts and it prints the Celsius 2196 without knowing that it's talking to a BME 280, without knowing that it's actually calling into a service defined in a different container. It still gives you the right answer and it gives you this complete freedom to couple and decouple uh, your functionality in the right way. Okay, good. So you saw this in, in practice. The way the BME280 service and the application in main.toit actually use each other is by means of remote procedure calls. So they actually communicate by sending requests and sending replies between these two independent applications, two independent containers on the device. And that, that, um, that approach is probably recognizable from higher level and, and, and larger systems, this ability to actually have independent isolated components that still communicate over well-defined APIs, sending and replying um, uh, to each other um, through a, a messaging protocol. It's, it's done in a way that's, that's fast, but it's also done in a way that's super practical. The combination of these things, live reloading of code on your device, installation of containers that are separate, but still connected, and the, uh, the ability to write high level abstractions in your code makes for a, for a really awesome experience. I wish you all would try Jaguar today and build better things faster. We think it just might be the best open source high level language and tooling for USB32 uh, that's available today. 
Um, but don't take my word for it. Go try it out and build something awesome. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Casper, for this amazing uh, talk. Uh, for the last talk of this block, now we will talk about low power applications, the ULP coprocessor. Hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Marius Wigamer. I'm Sudeep Mohanty. And we're from the IDF core team. And today we're here to talk about low power applications on the ESP, the ultra low power coprocessor, or the ULP as we often refer to it. And we're from the software platforms department, more precisely the IDF core team. And as part of our responsibilities, we also have the ULP. Yeah, there's a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about. First, we'll give an introduction to what low power management means on the ESP32 chips. And then we'll talk a little bit about why ULP, what is the ULP, the different types of ULP we have in ESP IDF, and then how do you program it, a little bit about the different software support we have provided for it, and then we'll also give some examples about what kind of power consumption you can get while running with the ULP. And then to end it off, we'll do our roadmap, show some resources in case you want to learn some more. And then at the end, have a Q&A if there's any questions. OK, uh, low power management on the ESP32 chips. What does it mean? Well, basically, uh, the chip is divided into different power domains. And we can either clock gate, lower voltage, or turn off parts of it to save power. This allows us to reduce the power consumption while also running the chip with partial capabilities. So as you can see here in this uh, diagram, there's four main power modes uh, provided in the ESP IDF. You have the active mode, where everything on the chip is enabled. And then you have the modem mode, where we shut down the RF part of the ship. You can see the wireless Mac, the RF part. All of those are shut down during uh, modem mode to save power. And then we have light slip, which is pretty configurable, but uh, it's mainly about shutting down the CPU. Uh, and then we have deep sleep, which is where you can have the lowest power consumption possible. And here, basically, everything is shut off, except for possibly the RTC power domain. And if you have worked with uh, ESP IDF, you'll see this term RTC come up everywhere. And like originally, it just stands for real-time clock. But in expressive world, it basically means the low power domain. So here we have a RTC memory, which is just low power memory, memory that's not powered down when you go to sleep. And here, marked in red, you can see what we're going to talk about today, the ULP coprocessor, which is a part of the RTC power domain. OK, so why the ULP? Let's consider an application, a pretty standard low power one. You have a sensor or something that you want to pull every once in a while. And then if your measurement is above a certain level or something happened, you want to do something with that measurement. So here in the flowchart, you can see like a typical application where you begin your ESP program, you initialize all your sensors, you measure, in this case, the temperature. If you're above the threshold, then you log this value over Wi-Fi. And then to run this off battery, you, of course, have to sleep. You can't just keep the CPU up and running because then you would empty the battery in a matter of, yeah, pretty quickly. So what you can do then is you go to deep sleep. 
you set a timer until you it tells you to wake up in one minute. And then after one minute, you wake up the CPU again, take a new measurement, check the threshold. If not uh, over the threshold, you go back to sleep again. And you just keep looping around here until your measurement is above the threshold and you take an action. But if you really want to save power here, then some parts of this are pretty expensive. Like waking up the main CPU, rebooting everything takes a while and takes a lot of power. And if you're running off a battery, this is not ideal. And then comes the ULP into the picture. Is there any way we can do this better? So what is the ULP? It's a ultra low power coprocessor, which means it's a low powered core that complements the main cores. And it can remain powered on while the main CPU sleeps. And it's from here you get the main power uh, sandwich. And it's capable of handling simple tasks such as reading GPIOs and monitoring certain sensors. And then if the ULP sees that the measurement is above a certain threshold, it can wake up the main CPU. And the main CPU can then do whatever it needs to do. Uh, currently in our chips, the ULP is available on the ESP32, the S2, and the S3. So basically our extensor chips. So here, now we have modified this uh, flowchart to work with the ULP instead. So on the main core, you still do your initial uh, initialization, you set up everything, and then you go to sleep. But instead of uh, periodically waking up the main CPU and measuring, you let the ULP wake up periodically and take the measurement. That way, it's only the ULP that wakes up. And it wakes up much quicker, and it requires much less power. And then only when you actually need the main CPU to do something, do you wake it up. And by doing this, you can extend your battery life uh, significantly. Yeah. And now I'll give it over to my colleague, Sudip. Continuing with uh, what Marius just uh, introduced us to, uh, we'll take a, a little bit of deeper dive into the features that uh, ULP provides. Uh, the way the ULP is designed uh, is that it will periodically wake up and perform a task. Now, this is controlled by the uh, ULP timer. Uh, this timer can be configured by the main, uh, main CPU um, uh, during initialization. Uh, also, the ULP core has access to this timer and can alter the time, timing values. Um, so it's the ULP timer which will periodically wake up the ULP. Uh, the ULP will perform um, the, the actions that it's supposed to. In case it needs to wake up the main CPU, it will wake it, wake it up. And, and then it, it can go back to halt or it can go back to sleep. And this process repeats. Uh, to make the ULP more competent, uh, it has access to uh, several GPIOs uh, and, some sev and some peripherals which are uh, useful in designing uh, an application. Uh, these, uh, these peripherals are like the ADC, uh, the I2C peripheral, and it also has access to the internal temperature sensor. Um, then uh, the ULP has access to some memory, which is in the RTC power domain. Uh, this is known as the RTC slow SRAM. And this memory space is common between the ULP and the main CPU. So the ULP and the main CPU can also exchange data if needed. Uh, of course, the ULP has access to all the registers that come in the RTC power domain, so it can control all uh, required peripherals and GPIOs accordingly. Well, at this point, we can take a, a check and, and calibrate as to what the ULP is not. Um, uh, it's safe to say that it is a low powered core. It's not a general purpose core, which can, uh, for example, run uh, more complex programs or, or even an RTOS. Um, it is limited in memory. Uh, it has, uh, for now, access to uh, uh, eight kilobytes of RAM um, to, to have its code and data. Uh, there is no JTAG debug support on the ULP core. Uh, so the debug uh, ability is uh, a bit limited uh, for the ULP core. Uh, and also, uh, there is no hardware floating point uh, operations which are supported on the ULP core. So, uh, so essentially, the ULP core will be 
uh, useful for uh, some some trivial code, uh, uh, which can help your application save power. Uh, moving on, there are a couple of types of ULP process that we have on uh, ESP chips. Uh, the first one is called ULP FSM or finite state machine. Uh, the second one is called ULP Risk Five. We we'll go into the details of um, a, a bit uh, about uh, each of the types of uh, ULP cores that we support. Uh, so the first type of ULP core is the ULP FSM or the finite state machine. Uh, this is a simple low powered core that was developed by Espressif. It has its own instruction set and uh, it has uh, its own way of programming and it can perform uh, all tasks that ULP can. Um, and this is the first kind of core that we have. Um, this was first introduced uh, in uh, the ESP32, and it is also available on the ESP32 S2 and the 32 S3. Uh, the other kind of ULP core that we have is actually a full-fledged RISC-V core. Now, this was introduced uh, from the ESP32 S2 and is also available on the ESP32 S3. Uh, it's a RISC-V core uh, supporting the RV32 IMC instruction set and it's uh, uh, much more user-friendly. Uh, we will uh, look into the differences between uh, these two in terms of programmability in a bit. Uh, some things to note here is that uh, we cannot use both the ULP FSM and the ULP RISC-V cores simultaneously. And uh, we'll take a look at what kind of, uh, how we program these individual cores. First up, uh, how do we program the UOP FSM core? Uh, there are actually two ways in which we can program the UOP FSM. Since it has its own instruction set, uh, this is compiled using uh, bin utils, um, and it kind of looks like assembly code. Uh, if you look at the image on the right, uh, you will notice that the code resembles um, uh, normal assembly code, and this is the first way that we can program the UOP FSM. Uh, another way to program the UOP FSM core is by using C macros. Uh, so this is a, uh, a special kind of uh, programming uh, guide uh, per se, where we can embed some uh, assembly-like macros into C code and then load these uh, in, as a binary into, into the UOP. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, a bit more uh, easier to read um, uh, as compared to assembly code if you're not familiar with it. Uh, but this is uh, another way that uh, ULP FSM can be programmed. Moving on to the ULP RISC V, um, this uh, ULP RISC V is um, coded or is programmed in uh, plain C language. Uh, we are all familiar with this. Um, this is compiled using the uh, RISC-V toolchain that comes with uh, Espresso's uh, ESP IDF. And uh, this, uh, this is probably would be more familiar to people who are uh, used to programming in C and uh, working with IDF for other applications. So the obvious, uh, let's say the differences uh, between the uh, FSM core and the RISC-V core uh, is their programmability. Uh, let's say there's no additional uh, step that is involved in programming uh, UOP. The way we have built UOP uh, uh, applications is that it's just a one-shot process. Uh, if you're familiar with how, how we build applications on ESP IDF, this will feel no different. Uh, there are a few uh, steps that are needed to ensure that the UOP binary is compiled uh, first. Um, and then uh, this UOP binary is converted into a, uh, an, a binary array, which gets embedded into the main application binary. And this uh, main application binary, which runs uh, on the main core, loads the UOP binary during runtime. And from a user's perspective, it will be just a one, uh, one shot single command idf.py build flash, and you should be able to build your UOP code and your main code together. Um, let's go uh, uh, a bit into the highlights of the software uh, stack that is supported for UOP. So there is a UOP driver that uh, comes along with ESP IDF. 
Uh, this driver basically provides access for the main CPU to control the ULP uh, core and also provides access for the ULP core to uh, access different peripherals uh, that the ULP has access to. Uh, for example, um, the GPIOs, ADC, um, I2C, and temperature sensor. Some of these drivers are not yet built and they are in the plans. Uh, also, uh, there are certain utilities that are shared between the main, uh, main core and the ULP core, uh, such as uh, a, a locking mechanism for synchronization. Um, and um, there are other utilities which help the ULP core perform its activities, and all of these are part of the uh, ULP driver that comes with uh, ESP IDF. The best way to learn about uh, ULP uh, are the several examples that we provide with ESP IDF. Um, these touch uh, some of the basic aspects of what ULP is capable of. For example, um, how to pull a GPIO, how to talk to a sensor on um, ADC, for example, uh, how to use uh, print statements if you need to, um, and so on and so forth. So these examples are uh, present in ESP IDF and uh, will be one of the best places to start learning about ULP. Okay, so at this point, I will hand over the baton to my colleague Marius uh, to take us through uh, the power consumption that we see with ULP. Okay, now we have seen how we can use the ULP, but we also want to see what actually kind of power consumption we can get with it, right? Because that's the whole point here, to save power. So we have taken some rough power consumption numbers. And it, you have to remember that these are heavily influenced by software parameters. Like our uh, different sleep modes are very configurable and we're always tuning everything to try to optimize for power and savage there. So what you see here might not be the numbers you see tomorrow. We're always trying to make them better. Okay, so first to start off, I figured we would give a view of a normal boot process. And then we have something to like uh, compare with when we start looking at the ULP. So if you see here at the beginning, where you see the number one, that's the ROM bootloader booting up. And then it goes up to uh, number two there at uh, around 40 milliampere. That's where the secondary bootloader starts. And there you can see it sticks around around 40 milliampere at number three where your uh, main CPU uh, for, for the app starts up and then it yeah, just keeps going until number four where your actual app main and the user program starts. And as you can see here, the whole time the power like hovers around 40 milliampere. So how does this compare with the ULP? Well, this is an example where we're running the ULP with the timer. As you can see, there's two spikes here and that's the ULP waking up. Here, I think it's around 70, 750 millisecond between each wake up. And as you can see, uh, when the ULP is not running, we are idly at, at around uh, nine microamps. And then if we zoom into one of these uh, peaks where the ULP is running, we can see that we're running at around 400 uh, microamps. So what the ULP here is doing here, it's waking up and then it's uh, wiggling some GPIOs and it says, oh, it's time to go back to sleep again. And we go back down to nine microamps. So compared to the 40 milliamps when the main CPU was running, this is of course a massive difference. So if you're able to utilize this instead of the main CPU, there's a huge advantage there. Uh, here is another example where we're running a ULP uh, taking ADC measurements. Here we can see that the idle, uh, idle current is actually much higher than the previous slide. And this is because currently when you're running with the ADC, there is some extra settings required that uh, increases the minimum current. And this is also something we're working on improving. Okay, and then how does the future look for ULP? Uh, in IDF uh, 5.0, which is right now, the ULP FSM is fully supported on uh, ESP32, S2, and S3. 
and the ULP Risk Five is partially supported on both uh, S2 and S3. So the basic functionality is there, and all the examples you saw is there, but not every driver is supported yet. Well, this supported is the ADC driver and a few different utility drivers. And for the near future, aka the upcoming half a year, our goal is to keep on expanding this support. We want to aim for a full support for the ULP Risk Five on both S2, S3, all features, which includes uh, interrupt handlers, I squared C driver, and the temperature sensor driver. And uh, what do we have upcoming after that? Well, the most exciting thing is the C6 that's getting released in the future. And the C6 uh, has a low power focus. And one of, or some of the improvements there is a new ULP core. It will be a Risk Five IMAC core with a 20 megahertz clock, a two-stage pipeline, which means uh, this core will be faster than both the S2 and S3 ULP Risk Five. It will have JTAG debug support, so now we can actually see what's going on in on your ULP core. Uh, it will be able to access all of SRAM. Uh, of course, you won't be able to use the SRAM while sleeping, but it can give you some uh, extra stuff to work with when the main core is uh, awake. Uh, it will also come with a low power UART, which is like a new RTC peripheral we're adding. Uh, and then it will also have access to all uh, APB peripherals. Uh, and just to emphasize, this is based on our current engineering sample for a C6. And this, of course, might all change before the final release of the C6. So if you found anything in this talk interesting or you want to play around with the ULP, uh, here are some resources. We have our documentation, a few links there to sleep modes, the ULP FSM, the ULP Risk V. And as Sudeep mentioned earlier, our examples. You can just compile them, run them, and get a feel for the ULP. And it's definitely the best way to go about learning about any of the IDF features we have. And if you want to contribute, I think the ULP is actually a nice feature. It's very isolated, and our software support on this is still not that mature. So there's a lot of things you can do there to help us. You can help with reporting issues. If you want to contribute code, we welcome that as well by doing a pull request. And if you have any feature requests, either for new hardware or software, we're also happy to take that. And all of this is, of course, on GitHub under the ESP IDF project. Yeah, that was the end of our talk about the ULP. And uh, now we can take some questions if there is any. Thank you for the amazing talk about ULP. Now I'd like to invite uh, Sadip to join us. Hello, Sadip. How are you? Hi, Pedro. All good. So, okay. So we have uh, three questions here. Um, so the first one: How much time does it take for the main processor to wake up? Uh, okay, so uh, approximately 250 uh, seconds is what uh, the main processor will take to wake up. Uh, um, uh, to bring ULP into focus, like uh, if if we start using the ULP, the ULP wakes up much faster uh, while the main processor is, is in uh, deep sleep mode. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, what is a typical power usage when operating only on ULP? Uh, so uh, the typical power usage would be, um, let's say, about 40 uh, to 50 micro amperes uh, when we are using the ULP. So it's, you, can, you can see that it's uh, quite low uh, just uh, while working with the ULP. OK, thank you. So I think we have more two questions. So um, how can we use the ULP processor as an active background process? Uh, for our running main processor. 
shared data without going into the low stage or leaving the main process to sleep. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, this this is possible. Um, so uh, the UOP doesn't really uh, uh, force you to, um, or the using using the UOP doesn't really force you to uh, go into sleep per se. You can still uh, initialize the UOP core and have some process running on it. Uh, the UOP is capable of sending interrupts to the main processor, so technically you can have some signaling. There's also shared memory, which is the RTC um, SRAM, uh, RTC slow SRAM. So you can have a data exchange between the main processor and the UOP core um, uh, uh, without going into sleep. Um, we've also added like um, uh, synchronization uh, between the main processor and, and the uh, UOP processor. So if you have like shared data, uh, you have locking mechanisms available between the two processes um, that can help you synchronize. So yes, technically you don't need to go to sleep. Uh, you can keep your main processor running while you can use the UOP as an additional core to do some, some extra, uh, uh, extra stuff. Okay, awesome, thank you. So um, one more question here. So does IDF 4.x already have support and example to ULP? Yeah, of course. So IDF 4.3, 404 already have uh, ULP support. Uh, there are already examples available. So yeah, um, I would welcome people to um, explore these examples, try out the ULP. Thanks. So I think we have time for one more question. So we have here an additional. It is possible to use I square C with ULP. Uh, yes, so it is possible uh, to use the I square C with the ULP. There is an additional peripheral in the RTC power domain, which is uh, for for RTC. It's an RTC controller. Uh, we've already added a, a driver support uh, for this RTC peripheral, and there is also an example where. Uh, the uh, ULP reads a temperature sensor over the ITs, uh, I, I2C. So yes, uh, expertise is, is possible to use to with the ULP. Okay, thank you so much. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you as as well for Marius for the for the talk. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Okay, so now we have we'll have a break, a 15 minute break with some ads, and we'll be back uh, then after the break. Thank you. I hope you are enjoying. And please subscribe to our channel on YouTube and as well like share our link to on your social networks. Thank you. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop.
My name is Bill, and this is the DroneBot Workshop, a place where we work on microcontrollers, electronics, and all sorts of hobbyist-related projects. And here in the DroneBot Workshop, one of our favorite microcontrollers is the ESP32. Now, the ESP32 is so versatile that I've used it for a lot of different projects and tutorials. Tutorials on the basic operation of the ESP32 and the ESP32 CAM module. Projects such as an ESP32 CAM development area. I've used the ESP32 with servo motors and with DC motors. We've used Wi-Fi Manager to enhance our ESP32 installation. And we've used ESP Now to create a peer-to-peer -peer network using ESP32 devices. We've even made music with the ESP32 and the I2S protocol. This is a very versatile microcontroller. Now, when it comes to choosing a microcontroller for a project, the ESP32 is often the first choice, and it's not hard to see why. In addition to the obvious inclusion of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, this is a very powerful 32-bit microcontroller with a wealth of GPIO ports. It's got interfaces like I2S, I2C, UARTs, and SPI. It's got analog inputs and outputs. It even has touch switches. The ESP32 is probably the most versatile microcontroller that's out there these days. In fact, I'm working on another ESP32 project right now, a robot car and controller that use the ESP Now protocol to communicate with one another. Thanks to the extensive documentation and resources that Expressive provides, a complicated project like this becomes pretty simple. So if ESP32 related projects and tutorials are something that interests you, then I really urge you to join me here in the DroneBot Workshop. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and also visit the DroneBotWorkshop.com website. You'll find an article on the website that accompanies every single video I've got. And the articles have all the code samples and all the additional information you need to get your project working. In addition to the website and the YouTube channel, I've also got the DroneBot workshop forums and you can discuss ESP32 projects on the forum with a number of like-minded individuals. So until we meet the next time, please take good care of yourself, please stay safe out there, and I hope to see you again very soon here in the DroneBot workshop. Goodbye for now. Matter is an industry unifying connectivity standard that has been jointly launched by industry giants including Amazon, Apple, Google and many other CSA members. This protocol is designed to make devices from multiple brands work together seamlessly. 
As an active CSA member, not only is the Spricer among the first contributors to the standard, but it is also committed to promoting the development of Matter. Hence, many new features of Matter are supported by Spricer SOCs. In this video, we introduce the main features of Matter and Espresso's one-stop service for the protocol. Matter is based on internet protocol and enables communication across smart home devices regardless of their manufacturer. The first specification release of Matter protocol will run on Wi-Fi and thread network layers while using Bluetooth Low Energy for commissioning. Thread is built on 802.15.4 technology, so Thread devices cannot communicate with Wi-Fi or Ethernet devices directly. Adding a Thread border router to a Matter topology allows Thread devices to interconnect with devices in other networks. Matter enables local automated communication between devices from any manufacturer and without intermediaries. Once the devices are set up, the control is enacted over the local area network without resorting to mobile apps or cloud services. Matter defines bridging capabilities that allow non-Matter devices based on such protocols as Zigbee, Z-Wave and Bluetooth LA Mesh to work with devices within the Matter ecosystem. Matter's multi-admin function allows Matter devices to participate in multiple ecosystems simultaneously, thus enabling cross-platform communication. Matter shares the information of all Matter manufacturers and their devices through a distributed registry called DCL, which is based on blockchain technology. Each ecosystem can ask DCL for the information it needs in the process of matter interconnectivity, OTA, etc. Matter device manufacturers do not need to develop and maintain their own cloud services or mobile apps. This way, matter devices can join any matter enabled ecosystem and seamlessly interconnect with other devices within that ecosystem. Espresso is actively contributing to the Matter platform in various areas, including protocol formulation, core stack implementation and certification test events. Hence, we have launched a one-stop Matter solution. We provide customers with devices that cover all Matter offerings. Our Wi-Fi enabled SOCs and modules such as ESP32, ESP32C and ESP32S series can be used for building Matter compatible Wi-Fi devices. ESP32H SOCs and modules integrated 802.15.4 can be used for building matter compatible thread devices. By combining ESP32H and an expressive Wi Fi SOC, a thread border router can be built for connecting thread networks with Wi Fi networks. Matter Zigbee bridge devices can also be built to connect matter and non matter networks. Finally, a Matter BLE mesh bridge can be built in a single ESP SOC with both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth LE interfaces. In addition to the official Matter SDK, we have released the fully customized ESP Matter SDK, which can further simplify and accelerate the development process of Matter products. On top of this, we will introduce special modules and product level firmware to standard Matter devices. Licensed customers can adjust hardware and software solutions to standard matter devices with a simple configuration, which greatly reduces R&D investment and accelerates time to market. Espressive's AIoT cloud platform, ESP Rainmaker, can provide cloud services to matter devices and enable the cloud-based management of matter devices and massive data resources. By combining the above-mentioned Matter hardware and software solutions with ESP Rainmaker, we are able to provide a one-stop Matter solution that not only supports connectivity among Amazon, Google, Apple and Espresso devices, but also provides a fully-fledged cloud deployment for our customers' own private account. Espresso's Matter solution also offers private cloud applications, 
ready-made phone apps supporting all common smart home scenarios and voice assistant integrations. Relying on the privatization feature of ESP Rainmaker, manufacturers can even build their own brand of an IoT ecosystem and provide more value-added services to end customers. Next, we will demonstrate the local control process of the Matter device. First, commissioning the ESP32 S3 box will make it function as a thread border router that connects a Wi-Fi and a thread network. Then, commissioning an ESP32 H2 based thread bulb and an ESP32 based Wi-Fi switch will make them join the Matter network. Once this process is completed, we can use the Wi-Fi switch to control the thread bulb locally. We can also use ESP32 S3 box to control the bulb with voice commands. Combining Matter with ESP Rainmaker provides further support for connecting devices to the cloud and controlling them remotely. The ESP Rainmaker dashboard can also provide device batch management, OTA upgrades, device diagnostics and business analytics. If you're interested in Espresso's one-stop matter solution or if you wish to pursue a business collaboration with us, please contact our customer support team by clicking on the link in the video description below. Thanks for watching. Hello world, this is Yanis, your host at Espressive DEFCON 22. After our second short break, we are back for the afternoon session of the second day of our conference. Coming up next is Espressive's Zim Kalinowski, who will tell us how we can leverage the ESP-IDF test framework in third-party projects. Then, Radim Karnish from our office here in Brno We'll talk about Espressif's Swiss Army Knife ESPTool.py, which is a Python based, open source, platform independent utility that communicates with the ROM bootloader in Espressif chips. Used either on its own or within a framework, it constitutes the last link in the software chain when developing for or working with the ESP8266 or ESP32 series of SOCs. Having been built as a Swiss Army Knife, it incorporates a multitude of tools. This talk aims to show how simple yet powerful ESPTool.py is and how to use it to tame your ESP. 
The third talk of the afternoon session will be delivered by Espressifs Uri Mihalek and Sergio Gaskev, who will demonstrate a paradigm shift to cloud-based embedded development. The fourth talk of the afternoon session will be given by Espressifs Jakob Hasse from our Shanghai headquarters. His talk will be about using C++ on ESP microchips. As we know, C++ is readily available on ESP chips with very few restrictions. Jakob's talk will provide an overview of the advantages of using C++ and what users should consider when programming in C++ on ESP chips. But first, let's listen to Zim Kalinowski, who will tell us how we can leverage the ESP IDF test framework in third-party projects. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Zim Kalinowski. Uh, I work for Espressive as a manager of the IDF uh, core team. And today I'd like to present the uh, uh, ESP IDF test framework uh, from, well, external projects uh, perspective. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more on how uh, external contributors, how you can use our internal uh, frameworks uh, for uh, your uh, projects development or for your contributions. Uh, so I will really divide the talk into two parts. Uh, the first part uh, is going to be overview of uh, what, what tools we are actually using um uh what frameworks uh, how how this all looks uh, in the in the background and then in the second part i'm just going to show some uh, some real examples how you can leverage that uh, in your own project for instance if you are developing idf uh, component so uh well and in the middle uh i'm going to talk a little bit more about uh prerequisites uh to do so so let's uh let's start uh, uh i just wanted to start with this uh with this screenshot uh this is a screenshot from uh from github and if you've ever created a pull request to uh, esp idf repo this is what you uh, what you are going to see and well there is uh, there is not much really um you can see there are some checks like pre commit rules uh, run on the on the pull requests and mostly these are well basic checks for instance uh, code validation etc um then uh, you can see this step, which well basically says that the sync was approved, and and now we are going to run the checks in the internal code base, and the license check. So yes, this is uh, this is all you all you see uh, externally, and well there is there is much more going on. Uh, so I'm always saying that from uh, from external uh, contributor perspective, ESP IDF repo is like a black box. Uh, you are submitting PR, and at some point in the future, it gets uh, magically merged. Uh, well, your commit is it gets magically merged, and uh, and well, but there is not much uh, in terms of uh, in terms of tests. And this is how it looks uh, from uh, from inside. That that is what you, what you can see below the below the surface. Uh, this is the screenshot of our uh, of our internal uh, internal CI, our internal pipelines. Uh, we use uh, internally we use uh, we use GitLab. 
uh, and GitLab pipelines to run our tests. And there is actually quite a lot. Uh, in the first in the first column, uh, we run all kinds of uh, pre-checks. Uh, some of them are uh, related to like very expressive, specific, related to our processes, uh, related to particular parts of the system. Some of them are more generic, like uh, for instance, uh, all kinds of uh, well, let's say the C line tidy check, or uh, we have fast template up uh, test, which is basically building the Okay, so we have a small issue here. I will try to add the presentation again. So just one second and we'll be back with the presentation. Uh, we use uh, internally. We use uh, we use GitLab uh, and GitLab pipelines to run our tests, and there is actually quite a lot. Uh, in the first in the first column, uh, we run all kinds of uh, pre-checks. Uh, some of them are uh, related to like very expressive, specific, related to our processes. Uh, related to particular parts of the system. Some of them are more generic, like, uh, for instance, uh, all kinds of, uh, well, let's say the C line tidy check, or uh, we have fast template up uh, test, which is basically building the, 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 the simplest possible uh, testing up application, or pilot test uh, checking Python syntax. So these are all the all the basic checks, and and uh, actually some of them are uh, available and visible on uh, on GitHub, but not not all of them. Uh, in the second uh, in the second column, uh, you can see uh, all the builds uh, we are making. Actually, there is much more. Uh, to that because uh, I think every step uh, every step uh, equals like five builds in total we have several hundred different uh, different builds uh, for different uh, option configurations different hardware configurations etc then uh, we have uh, we are building the documentation and finally we have something called target test uh, these are all tests 
that we are uh, we are running on the target. Last step is something uh, what we call host tests. These are tests that are uh, not running on the target. Uh, they are just running on the same on the same machine uh, as a test framework. I will give some more details later. And finally, after after going through all those steps, uh, uh, we actually go to the deploy and push to GitHub step. That that is when the the entire code is validated. Uh, the the whole pipeline, uh, entire pipeline can take uh, can take several several hours uh it's pretty time consuming and, and maybe it's it's one of the reasons that we currently uh don't make it available uh available on on on, on github um, here i'd like to uh talk a little bit more about uh different test types uh so our naming conventions for for test types well sometimes may be a little uh a little bit different than uh, in common naming conventions uh but that's why uh, that's why i'd like to i'd like to explain it uh, explain it here so first uh, first of all uh i already mentioned uh, pre-checks uh, so i'm not going to add uh, much more in here these are all the all the basic validations. Uh, I mentioned uh, build step, uh, several hundred distinctive builds, uh, documentation build, and a little bit more about uh, about unit tests. Uh, so, uh, what we call unit tests uh, internally uh, are not exactly uh, are not exactly the unit tests these are just small applications uh, which uh, which run on uh, usually on the hardware uh, they are designed to test par particular uh, component uh, but uh, uh, but uh, we don't use uh, any 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 mocking here uh, or we don't use uh, uh, well these are these are not the actual unit tests the next uh, next type of the tests uh, is something we call example tests uh, so in fact they are very similar uh, to unit tests uh, however uh, these tests are basically uh, covering all the uh, ESPIDF examples all the examples we have uh, in ESPIDF uh, repo uh, so basically, all the examples code is built and uh, and tested on the hardware. And finally, we have uh, so-called uh, integration tests. Uh, uh, we call them integration tests because they are uh, they cover a little bit larger areas. Uh, they are designed designed to 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 test for instance uh, wi-fi or bluetooth integrations sometimes they uh, they include uh, well multiple uh, multiple esp32 boards so uh, they are they are much much more complex than example tests uh, or unit tests uh, however all of those uh, i mean uh, unit tests example tests and integration tests are usually run on the hardware uh, then we have uh, uh, we have final uh, final category of tests we call them host tests and uh, these are uh, well this is actually quite wide category because it includes uh, it includes uh, all kinds of tests the tests which could be uh, called unit tests. Uh, well, we are using CMOC uh, for unit testing, and and uh, they can run actually on. Well, these are actually real unit tests because uh, because they can run on 
uh, on, on, on Linux. Uh, we don't require hardware. Uh, we just test particular, particular parts of the module. But also, uh, as I said, the host, host test category is pretty wide. So, uh, so this test will also include, uh, uh, for instance, uh, tool chain tests, uh, build tests. Uh, so, yes, this is this is pretty wide category, and uh, it's uh, it's very important to to keep in mind. Uh, well, this this naming conventions. Uh, without that, the rest of the presentation could be uh, perhaps uh, confusing. Uh, okay, now now I'm going to uh, I'm going to go briefly through all the uh, all the frameworks uh, we are using internally. Uh, so uh, here I should actually mention uh, one of the framework uh, we developed uh, is called uh, uh, is called Tiny Test uh, Framework. Uh, it's, it was an internal tool, and basically we are still using it uh, for running uh, most of the tests uh, in our system. Uh, however, uh, we are migrating uh, to PyTest. Uh, we developed uh, several PyTest uh, extensions uh, to, to make it easier uh, to test on hardware. Uh, to work with ESP IDF. <coughs> so here I just wanted to mention, uh, I provide the link to PyTest documentation. Uh, you can find uh, PyTest, uh, uh, PyTest basic packages, packages here. And uh, well, on the right, just as an illustration, uh, this, is, uh, this is how a typical uh, typical test uh, uh, will look like. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's pretty simple. Here you see PyTest and also our PyTest embedded uh, extensions. And okay, so here we have PyTest uh, PyTest embedded set of extensions. Uh, you can you can search uh, PyPy to find uh, to find all of them. Just uh, just look for PyTest embedded. Uh, of course, the most important top level one is PyTest embedded uh, IDF. It contains all the all the generic features, generic stuff used by uh, ESP IDF uh, for testing. And then in this particular presentation, I will mostly pay attention to uh, PyTest embedded uh, QMU and also very important uh, PyTest embedded serial uh, ESP. Uh, ESP. Uh, so this extension is actually to make it easy to to connect uh, uh, to connect to ESP devices. Uh, well, flash ESP devices and work with ESP devices connected via serial port. Uh, to your your test runner, and uh, well, in addition to that, of course, you can find uh, you can find uh, uh, extensions uh, for Arduino, extensions to in, to improve um, JTAG uh, JTAG experience, uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's all in here. You can. Uh, also, find more information about PyTest embedded uh, on our documentation page, uh, packages search, and the source code. Uh, source code is uh, is here. The next uh, next tool I'd like to mention is uh, Unity uh, Unity Test Framework. I'm not going to too many details uh, here. I just want to, I just want to say that uh, it's well integrated with uh, CMOC uh, because actually CMOC and uh, Unity Test Framework uh, they come from the from the same place. Uh, also, uh, it's 
quite well integrated with uh, with PyTest, and uh, this is uh, this is actually part of uh, of our work as well. And we, yeah, what else? I mean, uh, mostly uh, Unity the test framework is is just used to design uh, to design your uh, unit tests. On on the right, uh, you can see a typical uh, wrapper uh, you can find in in ESP IDF. Mm, yeah, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to point out the, the particular method, uh, expect unity test output. So in this example, uh, you can see how PyTest uh, is actually, or PyTest embedded is providing uh, support for unity test framework. Uh, so you can have uh, uh, in ESP IDF, you can have Unity uh, tests, Unity based tests wrapped uh, in a simple way into a PyTest. Uh, Py the next, uh, next thing uh, I'd like to mention is uh, something we are, uh, we are working on, uh, and that is Triartos uh, Linux simulator. This is uh, this is under under development, but by the time of uh, uh, when this this presentation is is publicly uh, released, uh, it should be already available for uh, for external contributors. Uh, so basically, uh, it's based on FreeRTOS Linux Simulator. Uh, you can find uh, here under under this link. So the important uh, important to mention here is that uh, the upstream version uh, of uh, Linux simulator, FreeRTOS Linux simulator, supports only unique single core uh, FreeRTOS. Uh, so AWS, uh, the current upstream version of FreeRTOS is, uh, is single core. And uh, there is a, an effort uh, for developing a multi-core uh, version of FreeRTOS in FreeRTOS uh, SMP, SMP branch. But the, the simulator is not yet, uh, not yet uh, ready uh, for that. So what are our, what are our goals? Uh, for Linux target. So, uh, well, I will start from the end. Uh, we don't have a plan to support uh, dual cores. Uh, we think that uh, the single core support is, uh, is sufficient uh, to run uh, most, of the, uh, most of the scenarios that we, we would like to test just on, on Linux host. Uh, and we want to uh, migrate uh, some tests uh, which we are currently uh, running on hardware uh, to uh, just Linux, Linux, uh, Linux based host tests. Um, and that applies to example tests and, uh, and current unit tests. Uh, I will have a little bit more about uh, Linux uh, Linux simulator in our roadmap at the end of that uh, presentation. Okay, the next uh, next tool uh, we are we are using internally is uh, CMOC. Uh, so CMOX is uh, in general is uh, a stop uh, gener generator. Uh, for unit testing uh, in, in C. I mentioned already it works smoothly with uh, Unity test framework. And basically what it does, uh, uh, it can parse your, uh, your C headers and create, uh, create mock interfaces for your, for your testing. Uh, we, currently, uh, we currently use uh, CMOC uh, to, 
generate uh, stops for uh, for our host tests. Uh, we don't have any tests that work on on target. In theory, it should be possible uh, to run uh, CMOC generated uh, tests uh, on target, but uh, but we don't have a plan uh, to do so right now. The next uh, next important tool I'd like to tool or uh, I'm not sure if I should call it a tool I should mention is ESP uh, IDF uh, container and this is extremely important uh, for uh, for testing we are using it internally and I'm not really sure whether everybody uh, in the audience uh, found that uh, actually our Docker image for uh, for ESP IDF exists, uh, but uh, it's something I'm going to use uh, in, in the examples uh, we'll have at the end of this presentation, and it's it's extremely convenient to uh, to use for uh, building against uh, against particular ESP IDF uh, version. Uh, so you can find uh, you can find our image on Docker Hub under Espressive slash IDF. Uh, we maintain several versions. So the most uh, the most recent is of course latest stack, and uh, and it's generated for every single commit uh, that's merged uh, into master branch. Uh, then we have uh, uh, we have an image. For every single uh, release uh, release branch, and then finally we have uh, we have tag that's the one at the bottom VXXX for every single release of uh, of IDF uh, uh, ESP IDF. So whenever uh, whenever you need to build your uh, your application, build or test your application against particular version of ESP IDF, you can always find uh, appropriate uh, Docker image. Uh, so here I have to mention that the, the purpose of the Docker image, the main purpose is to provide means to, to, to generate builds. So the image actually includes uh, ESP IDF uh, source code itself. It includes uh, appropriate uh, tool chains and it includes any any other tools necessary necessary to uh, to perform a build, but it doesn't doesn't include uh, any additional tools related to testing. Uh, for instance, uh, there is no uh, we don't have uh, uh, you don't have we don't have. Uh, a PyTest embedded, or we don't have QMU installed as inside uh, inside the container. So this is this has to be done as an as an extra. Okay, and I already mentioned QEMU. Basically, QMU is open source uh, emulator and uh, virtualizer. Uh, it's uh, it works with uh, with many. Uh, many hardware architectures. It provides uh, emulation of very large number of peripherals. And uh, what's most important, uh, it has uh, support for Extensa and uh, it has support for uh, RISC, uh, RISC V. The, I would like to mention we have a links for QME projects here and also this is the repo, the original repo. Uh, here, I'd like to uh, I'd like to mention a little bit more about uh, our own fork of uh, of QMU. So, in order to emulate uh, ESP32 chips, we had to add a few uh, modifications to the original software. They are they are not uh, upstreamed uh, yet. Uh, so we run our own fork uh, on GitHub, expressive uh, slash QEMU.
and we are going to use uh, we are using this fork for uh, for internal uh, development. We are going to use it in in demos in this presentation. Uh, we also have our own wiki and uh, uh, information about uh, uh, releases. Uh, so on the left, you can see the um, what we are currently supported. Uh, so uh, we have uh, right now we have support for uh, basic ESP32. We don't have support for uh, any other hardware. We don't have support enabled for RISC five yet. Uh, in terms of peripherals, uh, we of course support all the basic peripherals like SPI, I2C. We have UART support. Uh, we have uh, SDMMC host controller support. We also support uh, well, that's actually partial support for hardware crypto. We have support for Ethernet. And uh, finally, we already have support for uh, for if use. This is our current support. You can uh, you can find more. Every single uh, every single release is of course documented, and you can find the the details. You can uh, you can post your issues to to our to our GitHub if you have any particular uh, requirements. Then I'd like to share how you can build QMU from the source code from our fork. And uh, I'm doing it uh, in, in the way of a Docker file. Uh, I think uh, you can see that it's based on IDF latest uh, image. Then uh, we are installing a few additional, additional de dependencies. This, these are actually needed by QMU itself, but also I think some of those libraries are, are needed by uh, by the test framework itself. So uh, what I do first, this uh, Docker file, I actually install the PyTest and CI. This is not directly needed by QMU, but it's going to be needed when we actually run the tests. Uh, so you can see, I just use IDF tools script and uh, install Python environment with PyTest and CI uh, features. Then in the last, uh, well, three steps really, or two steps, uh, I'm setting, updating the path uh, in advance, cloning uh, recursively uh, is pressive fork of QMU and finally creating uh, creating directory QMU extensa configuring the build and running the build with uh, with target with extensa targets here finally uh, in the final step I just go to the uh, newly uh, created QMU extensa folder and run make install and that will uh, that will build uh, all the necessary QMU binaries so you can you can either uh, use the container or you can uh, you can you can follow these steps uh, on your on your local machine as well docker file is available in the in the in the sample repo i will mention it later Okay, so let's continue. And here we are actually uh, we actually reached prerequisites that may be necessary to to set up your uh, your pipeline on on GitHub. So uh, firstly, uh, if you want to if you want to run uh, tests on on actual hardware. You may need to set up so-called uh, GitHub self-hosted uh, runner. Uh, so, uh, Espressive provides uh, provides an, an example. Uh, well, we actually we actually have entire uh, test template inside the test template. We have we have a document that 
explains how to how to perform the whole procedure of uh, of creating self-hosted runner. Uh, so in this case, uh, in this case, the runner uh, runner is based on Raspberry Pi four model B. Um, you need some uh, ESP32 development boards. Uh, in this case, we use DevKit C and uh, C3 uh, DevKit M, and of course uh, SSD card with Raspberry Pi OS. Um, well, of course, uh, this this uh, prerequisites are are used in in our example, but uh, you can follow the same instructions. You can you can actually uh, install set up self hosted runner on any Linux machine or maybe even Windows machine. So uh, so I think. Uh, the instructions uh, well can be modified to uh, to use almost any any hardware. Then mm. the document uh, will give you uh, steps to uh, to actually add the self-hosted runner to your GitHub repo, or it can be done on organization level, and uh, setting up the runner setting up an agent on the runner itself okay so that's uh, uh, one of the prerequisites uh, we can continue uh, with uh, sample projects i've created so um, the first uh, first sample project uh, that's cxx component so that's actual uh, c++ uh, C++ component uh, we've migrated out from uh, from main uh, ESP IDF repo to to a separate repository, so it can be installed as a uh, well optional component. Uh, CXX component uh, has uh, its own uh, GitHub action to run uh, appropriate host tests and also has github action to run uh, to run target tests so this is the repo uh, if you want to check how to use uh, how to set up and use uh, github actions with self hosted runner and run tests on actual uh, on actual esp32 hardware this is the place uh, this is the place to go and uh, the second uh, second example is something um, I'm working on right now. Um, this is basically web assembly web assembly runtime, also uh, also wrapped in in a, a component. And uh, because of the specific of the of the project is uh, the project is mostly hardware independent. It's a good candidate. Uh, for testing in QMU, that's why that's why I've selected this this project. Um, here you can find a sample GitHub action uh, for running tests in in QMU, and uh, I'm going I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about this setup in a while. Also, in that repo, uh, you can find the Docker file. Uh, which I described uh, a few slides uh, a few slides before. Um, finally, uh, what's important to mention is uh, is uh, our uh, GitHub uh, ESP test template. Uh, you can find it uh, under Expressive Organization on GitHub. Uh, the link is uh, link is available here. It uh, basically provides the basic uh, basic layout for for the repo where you have uh, uh, where where you use a GitHub hosted runner uh, to build uh, your uh, your application your component. Then you use a self hosted runner uh, to run the test on ESP uh, thirty two chips. And finally, 
it uses uh, GitHub Hosted Runner uh, to publish uh, to publish the results. So uh, the CXX component project uh, is actually based on uh, on this this template. Here is a little bit more about the the layout uh, of the project uh, of the template project and what we have uh, what we have inside. Uh, so in GitHub workflows, you can find uh, GitHub actions definitions. Uh, I will show you uh, I will show you GitHub uh, GitHub actions in the context of uh, CXX component project and uh, uh, Wammer component uh, project as well. We have main folder which contains uh, the actual component source code, and finally we have. Uh, Test uh, test application project that uh, the, that includes all the uh, tests with the source code, uh, etc. So now uh, I'd like to uh, walk through uh, the repositories uh, I have. I, I will just show uh, briefly how how the how the project is uh, is constructed and all the uh, all the workflows so let's start with esp idf uh, cxx uh, project uh, well as you see it's very similar to template uh, to template project uh, there are some subtle differences um, in the layout however uh, however in essence it's uh, it's the same uh, so in this particular project, uh, we can find uh, uh, three uh, workflows. Uh, there is the we have a test workflow, test host YAML. Uh, so let me check this one. Uh, this one first, as I already mentioned, all the host tests they don't uh, they don't require uh the hardware uh so uh so the workflow is going to be very 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 simple uh in this case uh we just run test uh on uh basic uh es expressive idf release 5.0 container so that's one of the containers i mentioned and uh we do that in, in, in two steps. Uh, the first step is check out uh, master branch. Second step uh, is build and test. So what's important uh, to mention here is actually we are running export.sh and uh, this is to set up the ESP IDF environment that has to be done every time after starting the container. And then we are we are use uh, matrix uh, of application names. Well, these are the applications uh, we are building for uh, uh, for every application we perform build step. And uh, then after after the binary. Is ready. We just run it on the on the local host. That's why we call it host test. Let's uh, let's just uh, check the uh, target test. So target test uh, job is a little bit uh, a little bit different. In this case, uh, we start uh, with checkout, just just uh, like in the case of the host tests, and then we run. Uh, IDF PY build. Uh, so, what's the difference with uh, with the host uh, host uh, build and test is that here we are actually building for the target, and the test is done in a separate step. So, instead of running test immediately, uh, we upload artifacts uh, in this step. This is still done on GitHub hosted uh, runner. Next step is done uh, on uh, self-hosted uh, runner. So 
in this case, you can see we specified uh, two targets, ESP32 and ESP32C3. And we specified uh, two test applications uh, name. And here you see that uh, it runs on self-hosted Linux and Docker. Please pay attention to the, to the steps. We are installing a few Python packages uh, manually on the top of base container. Uh, so that's uh, PyTest embedded, uh, PyTest embedded serial ESP, and PyTest embedded uh, IDF. Uh, so we need PyTest embedded uh, serial ESP as we'll be connecting to, to the actual target. I, I will show you how it works in the output. Finally, you can see how the test is, uh, is run on the target. So we use PyTest and we specify target. And of course, uh, this is obligatory uh, parameter. Uh, we need to use embedded services, that is ESP and IDF. In the last step, we upload the artifacts. And uh, yeah, that's, you see the GitHub action definition is much more much more complex this time you can you can refer to this file if you want to run uh, the test on the on the target okay let's uh, let's see how it uh, how it works in in case of real uh, real pool request uh, so here we have uh, well somebody created a pool request here you can see the uh, build jobs uh, on this particular uh, pull request. And let me check, for instance, uh, EESP. Uh, okay, let's check uh, this one pull request, ESP uh, event test application. Uh, well, I think build is not particularly interesting. It's the same for. Uh, for every uh, for every application for every host or target test, so let me go directly uh, to run test action. Okay, so what's interesting here? As you see, we started the test on self-hosted runner here uh, with target ESP ESP thirty two. Uh, in the log, you can see what the uh, what uh, PyTest uh, embedded is actually doing. It tries to connect to several uh, several serial ports. Uh, you see, it's connecting and then fails until it's actually successful. USB zero. So PyTest embedded is, is actually tries to. Uh, tries to connect to all the ports and, uh, and find appropriate board which is needed for testing. Then it's flushing the board uh, with our binary. And then finally, in green, you can see how the, uh, that's the log from, from the board. You can see initialization. Okay, and here this is this is actually interesting because the output uh, output here is from Unity test framework, and this is uh, this is handled uh, correctly by PyTest. And finally, uh, you can see that two tests has passed. Again, uh, this is all Unity test uh, output from the hardware and the rest is handled by PyTest. One test, uh, one test has passed. So that's how the, uh, how the hardware, uh, hardware tests, target tests uh, look like when running uh, on the custom uh, uh, self, uh, self hosted runner. The next uh, I'm going to show you is uh, Wammer component repo. I skipped, uh, I skipped host, host test as these are 
these are pretty pretty simple. You basically build and uh, and run the the application on the same on the same machine. Here uh, I'm going to show you a sample repo with uh, with QMU. So you you see here we have. Uh, GitHub workflows as well. In Docker file for there, you can find the exact Docker file I was uh, I was showing you before in the presentation. Let's go back a little bit. Then uh, you have subrepo uh, wasp micro runtime. This is actually what this project is uh, is wrapping under source file. There is a test. Uh, there is a test application. Well, I call it. I still call it hello world example. So uh, we have a test in here that we are going to run. And you see, it's uh, it's actually uh, marked as uh, ESP to target is ESP32. The test is a host tests. And we also have QEMU marker. The rest is almost the same except of, uh, of the device uh, under test, which is QMU DUT. So this comes from Python, PyTest embedded QMU. And uh, well, the test will pass if we get hello world in the log. Under main, uh, we have, uh, we just have a C application of basically uh, that application starts the warmer runtime and also prints hello world and finally i'm going to uh, i'm going to show you the workflow definition for uh for qmu test uh okay it's available here under run tests uh, uh, as you see uh, it's pretty simple in comparison to hardware test i'm actually doing everything uh, in in a single uh, single step, really. I mean, single container that is run on uh, GitHub runner. I don't need self-hosted runner here. Uh, so uh, you see, I use uh, the image zimcal slash qmu2. So that's the image produced by the Docker file uh, which I presented. Of course, I do recursive uh, checkout in here. And then finally, uh, in a run step, I have only three lines uh, of code. So export, that's, that's the same as in case of CXX example. And then I use uh, our internal script uh, to build applications. So basically, that script will find all the application in this component directory that can be built uh, for a target ESP32, also uh, with QMU uh, marker. So this, this step builds uh, my test, uh, test hello world application. And finally, I run the test itself. Then uh, it, it's very it's very similar to to the command we saw in uh, CXX example case. Also, target is uh, ESP32, but I pass UEMU label and embedded services I use is IDF and QEMU. Well, I have additional parameter which is built by directory. That's about the specific of the of the PyTest embedded and run outside the ESP IDF main repo. That's all. Very very simple. Let's check how the how the output uh, looks like. Uh, I think in pull request I just prepared well something failed, but that's actually uh, that's actually uh, well pre common check. I just uh, I just set up on this repo. Let me check our uh, QMU test and what happened here. So uh, we are really interested in that uh, that part running container. Here IDFUI is ready.
And finally here you see the test session starts. It finds uh, one test, test hello world host. Here's some setup. And then finally, the device is booting in QMU. So everything looks exactly as on real hardware in this case. We have some output from WASP uh, WebAssembly runtime. And then finally, we have, uh, we have our hello world uh, text. The framework finds the hello world and it decides the test uh, has passed. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all about uh, uh, QMU demo. So uh, we finished our demo. And now I'd like to tell a few words about our roadmap uh, for the future. And I divided the roadmap into two parts. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, Linux, our Linux target is in, in progress and uh, it should be already available when this presentation goes, uh, goes public. Uh, then we are going to, we are going to work uh, do some more work on QMU as well. If somebody is asking, we are obviously going to add support for RISC, uh, RISC V and uh, to support other ESP hardware than just basic ESP32. And one of the things uh, we are starting to work on is uh, the test coverage for uh, for FreeRTOS uh, FreeRTOS SMP. So we want this uh, test coverage to be as much as possible migrated to, to QMU and we want to make it public. And the second part of our roadmap, uh, this is something I called uh, our roadmap for GitHub, uh, for GitHub community. As we started the presentation, I already mentioned that what, when you go to GitHub, when you create a pull request, all you can see uh, is the tip of an iceberg. So just some basic tests and, and uh, you basically don't know what's happening with your uh, pull request behind the scenes until it's merged after some time or not merged. Uh, so we want to make it more transparent. Uh, this process, uh, this process should be definitely improved, and uh, and uh, it will benefit uh, the community. Uh, you can also expect more uh, more GitHub uh, GitHub actions run, more checks, host tests, uh, tests in using QMU, perhaps uh, also Linux target and. Uh, in some cases, we may enable even hardware tests uh, on GitHub. Uh, well, as you saw in CXX component, uh, uh, we are already running some, some tests on, on real hardware. Then one more thing to mention from our testing perspective, we would like to watch the part of ESP IDF, ESP IDF core, and what it's not. You could expect migration of some non-essential components to their own repos uh, with their own uh, with their own tests and even their their own community. So uh, so I think after after CXX components, uh, there there will be some more. Uh, non-essential, uh, non-essential components migrated outside main IDUF uh, repo, for instance. Uh, I don't know. That could be USB or, uh, yeah, you name it. Yes. So I think uh, this this all will help uh, to improve the community. Also, uh, we hope. This work will uh, improve the efficiency of uh, of pull request and merge request uh, processing, 
And uh, yes, that's uh, that's the end of my uh, today's presentation. And uh, now we'll be looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Excellent presentation, Sim. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to invite you to join us for the Q&A. Hi, Sim. Hi, Sim. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. How about you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. So uh, we have, it's not actually a question. We have like a feedback for you. So uh, very extensive detail and in that presentation. Thank you, Sim. Looking forward to the upstreams. So you have any comments for? For ESP thirty two D, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so actually, regarding upstreaming our changes uh, to the upstream QMU repo, right now we didn't have any plans uh, to do so. It may be a little bit difficult, I think. Uh, probably, well, we are not sure whether we can persuade the, the owners that uh, well, our changes are really that important. To, to be part of that uh, that repo. So for now, we are planning actually to, uh, to to run our own fork. But if if it's if it's important for you know like uh, people using ESP IDF, then then we can we can we can consider that and we can definitely invest some time into that. Uh, well, into 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 this. Okay, it's good to know. Okay, so next question is, so it's not actually a question, sorry, but it's in a new feature, I want to deploy CI and CD to my uh, developments using Jenkins and, and Docker image. So we are getting like people interested in, in using like uh, CI and CD. Uh, yeah, so so I think I think I uh, I mean uh, we already had like a brief discussion about uh, about our Docker file in the in the chat, and of course uh, I, I would be very interested in talking to everybody who wants to actually use because uh, we we've mostly so far most of the things I was talking about during these presentations were uh, well kind of like internal things we are using for testing. But uh, but of course it's all public and and the goal of my presentation was to to actually show what what we have and uh, if there is anybody who who wants to use that who who wants to use our Docker images who wants to use even our whole test framework I think uh, I think we'll be very happy to 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 work together very happy to cooperate and uh, and just make sure that. Uh, that uh, our framework is improved so can be used for for many other projects using ESP ESP32 chips. So yes, yeah, I will be happy to to talk with everybody who um, who is interested yeah, in learning nice. more. Thank you. So we have here one update from Jacob. So we have merged Linux target into IDF a few weeks ago. That's a good news. Yeah, that's uh, that's 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 what I'd like to mention as well. During, I mean, when I was recording the presentation, it was still like a, a merge request in progress, and so I said, okay, probably it will be merged by now, and, and it is merged. So right now, the Linux target Linux simulator is is available in ESP IDF. And when and we have some plans, uh, what what to do, what to do next after 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 these basic uh, uh, features were merged. Uh, so right now, I think in the like next quarter, we we actually want to use uh, Linux targets for for some very real scenario. Like for instance, uh, we want to uh, we want to use uh, well simulate the whole process of Rainmaker connectivity on ESP device on Linux target. And I think I think that will be that will be very useful for developers who are building their solutions uh, who, 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 who just want to uh, who, who want to connect the device to the cloud and they have like uh, very little 
logic related to the hardware, but most logic is related to the cloud connectivity, then this kind of scenarios can be can be very easily tested on 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 Linux simulator. And I think I think that will be a great uh, addition to ESP ESP IDF. So yes, please uh, please look at what what uh, what's going to be available during the next few months. Thank you. So, and I'd like to finish with a question that it's quite important. So, how important is the use of the test framework for embedded projects? I, I know a lot of companies that they don't use at all. So, I'd like to hear from you what what's how important is. Well, from from my perspective, I, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure if I know like any companies who don't use the. Uh, who don't test on the on the actual devices on the actual hardware, but from from my um, from my experience, it's 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 always like very difficult, very fragmented. Uh, you you always have like uh, perhaps parts of the test performed on actual hardware, parts of the test. Uh, some tests are are you know done manually even. Well, it's 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 very difficult to, to to actually properly set up this kind of environment, and I think uh, in Espresso we have quite a quite a lot of experience, and it would be it would be really a waste if we just use it for, um, you know, like our internal purposes. Uh, I think uh, I think if uh, I mentioned already, if somebody wants to use our our framework then uh, we are happy to share and uh, and i think uh, i think it will benefit uh, it will benefit uh, any any project and also also esp idf project itself so yes yeah, summarizing is like i think it's like super important to 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 be able to uh to have this kind of test framework and if if it can be set up easily and i hope uh, it can be done with our framework then yeah, that's just just perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you so much for your talk, for the for the answers, and yeah, that's thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, so uh, now we have a talk about ESP two, uh, the Swiss knife, a uh, Swiss arm knife, uh, with Hadi. Hi everyone, my name is Ragim. Thank you for coming to my presentation. Today I'm going to talk about ESP2.py, Espressive's Swiss Army Knife. So to start, what is ESP2.py? It's an utility to communicate with the ROM bootloader in Espressive chips. It's Python-based, it's completely open source, and it's platform independent. Uh, in other words, it's a feature-rich set of tools for programming and configuring ESP MCUs. That's why I often call it a Swiss Army knife. You can see the tool is hosted on GitHub. You can open our repository at github.com slash espressive slash ESP2. I will be giving my talk from two angles. First, I'm employed by Espressive. I work for IDF tools team, and we develop open source tools for working with ESP chips. And because of that, we get a lots and lots of great, great feedback from the community. Uh, in our GitHub repository, we get issues and pull requests every, every week. So uh, we get lots and lots of feedback, which is valuable, and we can improve the tools based on it. But second, and I think more important, is that I'm also a user of ESP2. And uh, I've been a user for a long time, long before I joined Espressive. Here we can see an ESP device being used in one of my projects, which is a uh, let's sign. Okay, overview. What are we going to talk about? 
First, I'm going to explain how to use ESP to log by. Second, how does it work and how to debug issues because these two are quite related. And last but not least, I will introduce some other tools which come bundled with esptool.py. Let's get into it. So how is esptool.py used? Uh, you can use it standalone as a command line tool, but it's also used under the hood of a framework or GUI, uh, such as Arduino or ESP IDF. So if you've ever used Arduino framework and click the upload button and you've seen a text like this, this is uh, output from esptool.py. So because of it, this, even if you're not using it directly as a command line tool, I think it's beneficial to know how it works and how to debug some issues because you might be using it even if you don't know it. How to get started with the ESP tool? Uh, ESP2.py is hosted as a package on the PyPI in index. So if you have Python 3.7, or newer later installed. Uh, you can just call pip install ESP tool. Then you just need to connect an expressive chip and then you can run your commands like ESP tool.py, the command or Python slash M ESP tool and your desired command. Uh, you don't have to remember all of this, just visit our documentation and the installation guide is uh, there for your convenience. So what can ESP tool do? First, it allows you to get information about the ESP chip you have. So before we continue, let's do a quick demo of what we know so far. Here I'm in my terminal and I can actually install ESP tool just by calling install ESP tool. Downloads latest ESP tool and we are good to go. Second, I have this new Shiny dev kit, which uses the ESP32C3 in it. And I've already connected to my computer with a USB cable. So that's good. And last, I just need to call ESP2.py and the command I want to use. In my case, flash ID, which just tells me what kind of a flash memory do I have connected on my dev kit. OK, we can see ESP2 is running. It's giving me some output and it gave me information about the flash chip. It's that easy. The second command to get some information out of the chip is read Mac. Okay, next, ESP tool allows me, and I think this is the most important part of ESP tool.py, it allows me to manipulate flash memory contents. Uh, it allows me to write data, read data, or erase the flash memory data. So let's show an example of that. My dev kit at the moment is empty. It's raised, it's running, nothing. And if I open my terminal, I can see I have some binaries which have been compiled by uh, ESP IDF. And I want to uh, write these binaries or upload these binaries to the ESP chip. So what do I do? I just call ESP2, write flash, write flash and then supply desired offsets and desired binaries. So what I just put in right now is that I want to flash bootloader.bin at zero, blink.bin at the second offset and partition table at the third offset. And if I run the command, when it finishes, now it's writing the data and when it finishes, we should see the ESP dev kit start to blink because it's just a blink example. And we do, the LED is blinking. So the ride has been successful. Beautiful. So that was writing data to the flash memory, but also I can read the data back, which is quite useful for making backups for, uh, of your applications when you are when you want to uh, upload a new program and you want to backup the old one, you just call read flash, uh, starting from at a zero size, uh, you just input the size of your flash chip, for instance, two megabytes or four megabytes, and the output file where you want to store your uh, backup. And then you can use the erase flash to wipe the whole memory chip or just erase a certain region in the memory. 
Last but not least, ESP tool allows me to prepare binary executable images for flashing. This set of uh, commands do not actually require a serial connection. That means I don't have to have a dev kit or ESP chip connected. Uh, let's see an example. In my folder, uh, I have some bin files and I also have an elf file, which can be flashed into the uh, ESP chip memory. But I can use ESP2, elf2 image, and I just point it to the blink file. And what's also important, I need to supply the C argument and tell it what chip do I want to uh, create the image for. In my case, it's ESP32C3. And if I run the command, we can see ESP2 runs and create an ESP32C3 image binary, which I can then flash into my chip. OK, that's how you use ESP tool. This was a set of basic commands. There's more, but we're not going to get into that right now. I'm going to, in the next part of the presentation, explain how ESP tool works and how to debug some issues, which come a lot when uh, we get uh, GitHub issues or uh, feedback from our customers or uh, our friends. Uh, we get a lot of feedback about uh, problems, problems with connecting and uh, using ESP tool with real hardware. So I think it's quite beneficial to understand how ESP tool works and what it actually does under the hood. And this helps me to debug a lot of these issues. So in front of us, we can see a typical ESP tool.py output. Uh, I just showed you how to use it in terminal. We've seen this output, but let's dissect it a little bit. So when ESP2 runs, uh, first it searches for a serial port. If it finds a suitable serial port, it tries to uh, establish serial connection. So it start, starts connecting to the chip. And how does that work? Uh, it starts resetting the chip into a download mode and then sending synchroniz uh, synchronization packets and if the synchronization is successful, it can then continue and talk to the ESP. If we can talk to the ESP, we can actually detect what kind of ESP are we using. That's why chip type auto detection is executed. And if ESP2 is successful and detects what kind of chip are we using, it can then do more. In the output, we see we get some information about the chip. This is a log using ESP32H2, which is an upcoming chip. And uh, we get some information about it. Then ESP tool uploads something called the flasher stop and runs, runs the stop. After the stop is running, uh, our desired command is uh, executed and we get the output. In this case, we were running the flash ID command. So we get the flash ID data. OK, so let's go over this step by step. So what do we need in order for ESP2.py to work? The most important thing is working serial connection. Uh, as I showed you, uh, most development boards can be just connected via, uh, with a USB cable. And that is because these boards are often equipped with a USB to UART bridge. This bridge translates USB signals into UART, UART which is then consumed uh, by ESP32. And this allows us for a seamless experience. Uh, in the diagram, we can see that the development board is actually holding both ESP32 and the USB 2 art bridge. But this doesn't always have to be the case. There can be cases where you don't have a dev kit or you're connecting to a real dev device, such as this one. Uh, here, I have a ESP module which doesn't have the USB 2 yard bridge. So for that, I have to use an external bridge like this one. This is the ESP proc, which is connected to the ESP chip. And the proc is then by a USB cable connected to the host computer. In the diagram, we can see that these two are actually separated into two units. 
Uh, we just have to make sure that the TX on the ESP chip is connected to the RX pin on the USB 2 art bridge and vice versa in order for the serial connection to work. If we have this, we can actually change some of the parameters of the serial connection. We can choose a different port or we can cho choose a different baud rate. Uh, when ESP2 is starting to talk to the ESP chip itself, it always uses this baud rate. But when you're uploading or downloading data with write flash or read flash commands, you can actually use uh, faster baud rates which results in faster uploads and downloads. Uh, it's quite useful, but uh, not all drivers might support this feature. So be cautious. Uh, if a faulty serial connection exists, you might often see uh, an error like this one, failed to connect to expressive device, no serial data received. Uh, what should we do in this case? Well, it's time for some debugging. And uh, what I often do is that you're actually able to connect to uh, the ESP chip with any serial terminal programs. If you don't know what that is, uh, uh, but for instance, use the Arduino framework. It's the serial win window you can open and this show you, shows you the data which the ESP chip is sending into the host computer. There are many serial terminal pro programs. I like to use uh, uh, PySeal, which is a Python module, and it comes with ESP tool. So if you install ESP tool, you can also use this one just by running the command python slash m serial dot tools dot miniterm and then giving it the port and desired baud rate. We can try that right now. And if we do that, and put the right port and press enter, you can actually see the data that is coming from the ESP chip. In this case, you can see the output is synchronized with the blinking LED. Okay, so uh, if you see some sort of data coming to your uh, screen. That means that the serial connection is working and ESP2 should be able to communicate with the chip. That's the first part of debugging. And it's important to determine whether you have a working serial connection. All right, the, under that you can see a bootlock example. We'll get to that in a minute. Second and equally important part of working ESP tool is that the chip has to be set into a download mode. So what is a download mode? Uh, when you reset your chip, uh, it just starts executing the application that is loaded into the flash memory. But there's also another mode which allows you to download a new application and the ESP chip enters this mode or bootloader, if you want to call it that way, uh, only if the boot mode strapping pin is pulled low or bridged to ground on uh, chip reset. The boot mode strapping pin is GPIO 0 on most chips or GPIO 9 on ESP32 C3 or C2. If uh, for some reason ESP2 fails, to reset the chip into a download mode, you get uh, this error message that the chip needs to be in download mode. Uh, this error message is only available on new chips. Uh, old chips like ESP8266 uh, don't have this feature. So if we see this uh, error message, what do we do? Well, we have to debug a little. Uh, on most development boards, resetting into the download mode happens automatically because ESP2 reply can assert the DTR and RTS control lines of the USB to UART converter, which is on the dev kit or if you're using an external one. Uh, these DTR and RTS control lines are connected to the strapping and reset pins of the ESP. So the DTR line is connected to GPIO 0 or GPIO 9 and RTS is connected to enable pin. An ESP tool can then uh, trigger these uh, lines to reset the chip. But some dev kits, or if you're talking to a 
uh, bare ESP do not have this circuitry. What can I do in this case? Uh, well, it's you can also uh, turn the ESP chip into a download mode manually. And that is done by pressing the buttons of the dev kit. You can see most dev kits have two buttons, first and second. And to switch into the download mode, you just need to hold the boot button, which pulls the GPIO zero low, and then click the reset button. Or if your dev kit doesn't have the uh, buttons, you can use a wire or piece of metal to bridge GPIO zero to ground and then reset the chip by connecting it to power. This basically does the same thing. If we switch back to our terminal, I can st still see data coming out. And if I press the reset button, we should see some bootlock and the application start over. So I'm going to press it now. And we see, we see that the ESP boots and just loads the application again. I'm going to show it a few more times. Okay, but if I hold the boot button, this one, I'm holding it and press the reset button right now, we can see that the ESP stopped blinking because the application doesn't run anymore and it actually reset into the download mode, which is signified by the boot lock and the waiting for download prompt. If you have these two things, working serial connection and and uh, you've been able to switch the ESP into download mode, ESP2 is good to go and ready to communicate with the chip. This behavior, this auto reset uh, behavior can uh, actually be disabled uh, just by supplying the before no reset argument to ESP2. This might be helpful in some cases or uh, in production environment. So when ESP tool is able to talk to the chip and it detects successful download mode, it attempts to detect what kind of chip that is. And you can actually change this behavior by supplying the chip argument and telling it what kind of chip you are connecting. So if you call ESP tool.py chip, ESP32C3, the auto detection will be skipped and not attempted. Auto detection has two methods how to determine what kind of chip is ESP tool talking to. Uh, the second detection method has been added quite recently and works with the new chips. It has some benefits, and but the old chips like ESP8266 don't support this detection method. So that's why sometimes you might see this message, unsupported detection protocol, switching and trying again. It's nothing to worry about if ESP tool uh, can actually detect the chip, it's all working just fine. All right, chip is detected. So what happens next? Uh, well, the flasher stub is uploaded. Uh, what is the flasher stub you're asking? Uh, so let's imagine the problem or it's a real problem. Uh, when the ESP chips are manufactured, the ROM bootloader is burned into the ESP chip and this means that the ROM bootloader cannot be updated ever again. New version of uh, ROM bootloader is issued only when a new chip revision is released. So this means you can't really update the ROM bootloader or apply patches to it. That's why we have a solution called the flasher stub. ESP2 actually implements a flasher stub to temporarily substitute or extend the ROM. This flasher stub is uploaded to the RAM of the ESP chip and execute it when connecting to the chip. And what happens next that all following operations are then handled by the flasher stub instead of the ROM code. This behavior actually allows us to do some things and gain some benefits. First of them, we can use more heavily optimized UART routines. Uh, this brings us improved performance of some operations like writing and reading flash. And also uh, because of the flasher stub, we can actually patch any box in the room bootloader. And this allows us to react to uh, the feedback from our community and customers and improve our products. If you have a use case where the stop loader is not needed or actually must be turned off, you can do that. Uh, to disable the stop loader, you just provide the no stop argument to ESP2 and call your command. And if you do that, 
All operations will then be handled by the ROM bootloader, which is burned into the ESP chip. When debugging ESP tool, you can actually trace the interactions uh, between the ESP chip and the host device, your computer. Uh, if you supply the trace argument to esp2.py, you will see a summary or uh, output of all the bytes that are going through the wire, for, through the USB cable to the ESP chip and back. This can be useful when debugging or when you're providing information for bug reports. Uh, so if you open a bug report uh, at GitHub, chances are you will use the trace function to give us some more in, uh, info about your problem. Okay, so that's how ESP2 works. And uh, that was a little uh, introduction to debugging the connection. Uh, I will now introduce other bundled tools because as I said, ESP2 is a Swiss Army knife, a complete tool set. So there are more, more tools. Uh, there's ESPEFuse.py and ESPSecure.py. Uh, these tools are meant for production environments and they are not really intended for hobbyists and they can be destructive. Uh, I will talk about that in a minute, but just to summarize, uh, it's not really meant for a basic user, but it can be beneficial to know how to use these tools. For instance, ESPEFuse.py allows you to read or write or burn effuses in expressive chips. chips. So what are effuses? Uh, if uses are one-time programmable bits, which are actually in the ESP chip itself, and they can, they, they can be burned only once. They can go from zero to one, but not back. So that's why it's quite possible to permanently damage or brick your ESP device if you burn uh, if uses that you shouldn't have burned. So that's why we say to use the tool with great care and only if you know what you are doing. But there's one comment to uh, which actually is not uh, dis destructive, which might be quite beneficial for the normal user. It's ESPEFuse.py summary. And this allows you to get some useful information about the chips such, such as factory MAC address, silicon revision, uh, analog to digital calibration, uh, converter calibration data, and active security features. Let's see that in uh, action. So if we will call ESP effuse pi, tell it on which port our USB ESP chip is, and then call the summary command. You can see uh, the effuses in the chip and the summary of the of these. For instance, you can see the MAC address right here. If you want to also try other commands like burning effuses and such, and you don't want to destroy your ESP, you can use a virtual mode. Uh, virtual mode is enabled by supplying the word flag, and you also need to specify the chip. And uh, this will then create a virtual file, which acts like uh, the real effuses in a real hardware and you can perform some operations on this file and then you can just delete it uh, if you're done uh, trying your commands. It's a safe way to try ESPEFuse.py. The next tool is ESPSecure.py. It's a tool for manipulating secure boot and flash encryption data. Uh, more about this tool can be found in the ESP IDF documentation, uh, which can be found on this link docs.espressive.com projects, ESP IDF. And then if you go to API guides, you can read about secure boot and flash encryption. This was just uh, scratching the surface of what ESPTool.py can do for you. Uh, it can do much more. So you can just run ESPTool.py slash H like help or visit the online documentation to learn at docs.espressive.com slash project slash ESPTool. There's a lot to learn and it gives you great power when you know what to do. Uh, we are continuously developing ESP2.py and uh, we are gaining feedback from the community and trying to improve the tool every day. So for instance, we just recently launched new documentation 
improved stability and diagnostic messages to be more user friendly and added ability to flash chips over USB CDC. And there's much more what we've done in the past few months. But also we have plans for the future, such as we want to refactor ESP2 to be more usable as a Python module for uh, implementing as a part of other Python projects. We are also planning support for new chips and we want to implement your idea. So if you have any ideas, feel free to send a feature request or you can uh, you can contribute in other ways contributions are always always welcome you can report an issue or send a feature request or even better you can fix a bug add a feature or write documentation uh, if you do that it will be more than welcome because esp2 is a started as a community project and it still is open source community project so these contributions are very welcome to learn about contributing and development mode installation of ESP2, you can just go to ESP2 docs uh, and go to the contribute article. There you can find everything you need to start developing ESP2 or fixing bugs. Okay, that was it. I'm glad uh, this uh, talk actually helped you to understand how ESP2 works, what, can it do, uh, what it can do for you, and that I was able to give you some insight under the hood of ESP2. Thanks for listening and joining me today. Uh, have a nice day. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Beautiful talk, Adi. Precise like a Swiss army knife. So now I'd like to invite you and Roland to join for the Q&A. Hey guys, how are you? Hello, Pedro. Thank you for your kind words. We are doing great. Hi, Thank you. hi Pedro. Hi, all. So uh, we have here one first question. Um, regarding erase, if I erase whole, the whole memory, is there any risk for of breaking or is early bootloader read only? Okay, I will take this question and it has already been answered in the chat, but I will elaborate on that a little more. It's actually uh, very safe to erase the whole flash memory and uh, just to support this idea, uh, it's actually pretty hard to break or uh, image your ESP. As I said in the presentation, the only way you can do that is just by burning an e-fuse that you should have, shouldn't have burned. So erasing the flash memory contents is completely safe. You can erase it all, flash a new application, or if your app freezes and the chip looks like it's not doing nothing, you can actually always switch to the download mode and connect ESP tool and try to flash again. Okay, that's great. So we have now question about if we develop a device and we want to prevent other people can erase or people erasing the chip but we want it to be possible to update the firmware is this possible you want to take this question no okay so uh let's see uh when talking about ESP secured by, uh, I mentioned uh, ESP IDEA documentation, where you can read about those security features, which can be implemented to help securing your chip. But if uh, someone has access, physical access to the flash chip that is embedded on the ESP device itself, uh, it's like virtually impossible to prevent other people from erasing the chip. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, being able to actually desolder the chip and erase it or uh, read it with other tools than ESP tool. But if ESP tool is able to talk to the chip and the flash chip is connected to the ESP, it can then, of course, erase the chip and this can be prevented. There's the option to disable the download mode in ESP chips. This way you can prevent people from, uh, from using ESP2 with your ESP device, and this way you can secure your device. 
Okay, thank you. So we have a common question in community in the community uh, about like issues while you are trying to flash the device, like the issue that you see a lot of dots and then no connection is like it's made. So the, the issue regarding how to get into the download mode. So I like to ask you to talk a little bit about how to prevent or how to detect if the issue is in the hardware or in the software. Can you just give you some idea on how to detect this issue? All right, I'll take this question. I think we have uh, made a significant improvement uh, regarding this recently. First of all, we improved the uh, error messages. Uh, in the latest, uh, if you are using a recent version of ESP tool, you will get a much better error uh, response than uh, previously. And uh, one of the uh, recent improvements of us also was to have a, a nicer uh, documentation and uh, you can find a nice uh, troubleshooting guide and we uh, have uh, uh, already uh, added the uh, most common causes uh, there uh, to help uh, users uh, to to find uh, a reason for, for the failure and of course if we uh, detect or got some ideas either for the community or by ourselves that we are uh, continuously trying this to improve this uh, troubleshooting guide. Also, if I can add something, uh, yeah. during the presentation, I talked about steps and things that are necessary in order for ESP tool to be able to communicate with the flash, uh, with the ESP chip. So, and I also talked about things, how you can check these individual steps. Like, first, you need to check if you have a working serial connection. You can do that with a serial terminal program. Then you can see if you are actually in download mode just by pressing the buttons manually or just bridging the GPIO zero pin with ground. And then if you see that you are in download mode, you can actually uh, try flashing the chip. If that doesn't work, there might be problems with your drivers. I always encourage people to just hold the boot button and try flashing with ESP tool. It should work in the end. Okay, that's great. So thank you so much for the talk and also for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye bye. OK, so next talk, we will have Yurai and Sergio talking about just few dot files in REPL. So hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Hello, my name is Juraj Michalek and let me welcome you to our session where we are talking about benefits of development containers and cloud development. And we will be looking at things that can be improved by using these techniques in embedded world. So, and we'll be talking about just few files that can be added to your project and you can get really big benefit in development cycle and how the project is developed. So let's imagine three scenarios. First of all, let's imagine the new team member is joining a development team. The first thing that the developer needs to do is to set up the development environment. This can be quite challenging task because the developer needs to install all the tool chain and all the tooling required for the building. First of all, he needs to install Git then to install the Python and all other dependencies of ESP-IDF. Then the developer needs to make a proper clone on ESP-IDF and then probably he can start building if everything goes all right. In Espressive, we invested a lot of time to make this experience as smooth as possible. So the developer does not need to wait too much time. We have the Windows installer that is able to deploy uh, drivers, and whole tool chain, Git, and so on. For other operating system, we have integrated install script 
that can do all these things. Yet still, there might be some problems. For example, a new version of Linux distribution is not supporting some part of tooling, some linking is broken, or any other issues. So it takes time for developer to be productive. It can be one day or two days or even more. If it's junior developer, it can be a very challenging task. So that's the first scenario where this uh, cloud development and dev containers can definitely help. Soon we will see the example. Let's consider the second scenario. Uh, you have a production code that you uh, and your customer is running and suddenly the customer experience a bug and you need to talk to the customer to debug this issue and sometimes it's very hard when customer is located in different country that is far far away uh, you need to send a developer team there to diagnose the issue or pull a logs from the customer and the whole process is relatively problematic and time consuming and here is uh, a nice example that dev containers and container development in a cloud can save you a lot of trouble and you can share the same experience or same environment uh, with the customer. This is really handy. We will also see uh, like how we can use a walkway simulator to share, uh, share the working environment. And the last scenario that we need to consider is maintenance. Uh, for example, your developers created a code that is deployed to production. And then after two or three years, there is a bug, there is an issue and you need to fix it. How to do it? This can be rather challenging because you need to reset up uh, the build environment that was done two or three years ago when the project was in uh, development. And that might not be possible. That might take a lot of time to get to the state where the developers had tooling and the tool chain set up two years ago. Even, for example, where a developer leaves the company and IT wipes his computer, the whole environment is gone. And this is loss. So let's see how we can do the better approach, how we can use better approach uh, with development containers and cloud development. So let me share a screen with you. As you can see on the screen, I have here the project that is stored on GitHub. It looks like any other project for embedded development. And this one is written on programming language Rust. You can hear some talks uh, in our conference about the Rust. And in this case, this application is using Rust on top of ESP IDF. It's relatively complex from the point of view of setting up the development environment. And the project itself is relatively simple. So let's look what this project does. The project uh, is called ESP Clock. And basically here you can see our Rust board with C3 connected to a display. And as you can see from the screenshot, it's just a simple project that displays some time, some information on the screen. The question is how you can run the similar project in your environment. Let me show one interesting thing that is integrated directly to the readme of the project, and it's this nice button. Let me click the button for you. And as you can see, it automatically opens Gitpod. Gitpod is a service that creates a container or let's say whole development environment in the cloud and it will give us the opportunity to work remotely on our code. So let's wait a second. Now uh, the Gitpod is preparing for us the container image. As you can see, the environment is ready. Here we have the working server that is remotely attached to my web browser and I can see here a project. So let's run some scripts and let's try to run this project in Walkway Simulator. So this will take a while to build a project. It's the same if I'm building it locally, but now uh, the whole project is on remote server. So it's not using my local resources. I'm attaching 
attached to the server just using uh, this web browser. Okay, so build is ready and let's click at this link. And wait a moment. And we can see that the simulator is running. So as you can see, I was doing no installation local computer. I was building everything online and now the simulator with the project is running. So this is a great example how the containers can help us in remote development. And you might be asking, how is it done? And let me share with you just a few files that is related to the project and then you need to put into your project. First of all, if you'd like to integrate with Gitpod, which is one of many services uh, outside that can give you this remote development, you just need to put their Gitpod YAML file. In this YAML file, you can specify a few things, for example, which port you operate, and you specify a pointer to so-called Docker file. Docker file is a description or instructions for container daemon uh, to create an environment for you, so-called container. And this one uh, is repeatable, repeatable. So you can build new container on a base image. In this case, we are using Gitpod base image workspace base. You can put here uh, any Linux distribution that you like, for example, Ubuntu, and then describe here the instructions how to set up the environment. For example, you need to install Python 3, uh, libusb 1.0 or something like that. And then add the installation of the tool chain itself. You see, one simple file can make a big difference. And you may be saying, okay, that's nice, but are there any other alternatives? I, I don't want to use uh, gitpod.io. For example, let's say that the organization has account at GitHub. In that case, you are able to use code spaces, which gives you basically the same features like gitpod.io that I showed you before. But you may say, hmm, I don't want to have everything in the cloud. Uh, I need some local development. How can I do it? Again, this is relatively simple and you can use local uh, containers with Docker, Podman or Lima or any other container orchestrator. Just install it on your computer and you can uh, pull the images from internet. You will get the same environment, same definition on your computer. Really nice. So we have three ways how to do it. And you may say, okay, you are showing us Rust, but show us ESPIDF. In this case, we can check this project, CTEC TBD, uh, which is extensible open source Euros rec sound module written by guys from university in Kiel in Germany. And this is open source project and a really nice example of big project that can be built on top of ESPIDF and can run on ESP32. So the project, the physical version looks like this. And let me scroll down. And again, they have here the open in Gitpod button. So let me click the button. It will start a Gitpod for us. It will prepare the working environment. In this case, we will have ESP IDF installed, just the tool chain required for ESP32. Wonderful. We have here the working environment completely set up with ESP IDF. We can see also the project here. And now we can use our familiar command IDF Pi and build. And the builder is started, and we can see the build process in the same way like it's done on the local machine. Very well. We can see successful build. We got the binaries that can be flashed to the chip itself. And this is really nice. We are also able to do the flashing uh, from the web browser uh, on the real chip. So this was a great example how cloud 
tools can help us to maintain and create a built environment. It's repeatable. That's the biggest advantage of using these meta files. So I will ask my colleague Sergio Gasquez to tell you more about uh, directories like dev containers, which allows you the same integration for Visual Studio Code that you can run locally on your machine. And I would like to ask him to explain more and show you some other examples. So, Sergio, stage is yours. So thanks for the introduction, Uri. I'll be following the conversation about dev containers, but this time we'll focus on GitHub code spaces and Visual Studio Code. Those two approaches of dev containers use this .dev container folder for the configuration files. As we can see, we're using the same project, ESP Clock, and we'll have a look at those configuration files. So in this folder, we can find a Docker file and a dev container.json file. Let's have a deeper look onto this. Docker file looks just like a regular Docker file, a bunch of arguments based on Debian in this case, a bunch of dependencies being installed. No magic, just a regular Docker file as any other. And in devcontainer.json is where the magic happens. This file tells how to build the Docker file. In this case, we're telling where the Docker file is located and the arguments that we want to use. This is the build property. Let's say that we want to pull an image from Docker Hub or any other Docker registry, container registry, and pull it and use it. We can also comment this build property and use the image property, which will pull the image from the internet. This has the big advantage of the time of the building time. It's way faster, faster to pull it than to build it. But if you want to have the image locally and tweak it, the only way to go is having a local Docker file, which we build. Other than that, we also setting a bunch. We are also setting a bunch of settings for the IDE, and we are also setting some extension to be there. We also forward in some ports and specifying where we want to mount the workspace and the workspace folder. So this simple file allows us enables a lot of features that we're just gonna see now. So let's go back to the product. And let's say that we want to open it with GitHub code spaces. In order to have the code spaces feature enabled, you that need, you need to be part of a GitHub organization that has this feature enabled, or you were part of the beta of this feature. And then if you were part of the beta, this feature will remain enabled for your user. Anyway, you can go into this button code and create a new code spaces or just run a uh, previous one. In this case, I will run this one. This will set up your code spaces. What it will do is either pull the image or build it. In my case, it will be faster since I already had it built in the past. So it just runs up the dev container. And as we can see, we can now see the readme of the product. And here you can see all the files. This is a fully working environment where we can build a project, upload the code to a real target, or simulate with what we, as we just saw in with Jurai. Say that we want to use the very same project with dev containers, but this time in our local machine. How do we do that? Here we have my terminal where I just cloned the very same repo that we were using. Let's jump into the folder and let's open it with VS Code. We shall see the code will recognize that there are some dev container configuration files under this folder, and it will ask us if we want to reopen the, the product in a dev container. Let's do it. Again, the first time that you will do that, it will need to build the Docker file, the container. So it will take a few minutes. In my case, it's already done, it's catch. So it's way faster. Now, again, I'm on the, on the dev container fully working environment in just a few minutes, you have everything ready. The only requirements in order to use local dev containers with Visual Studio Code is that you need to have Visual Studio Code installed, an extension called remote, dev, remote containers, and also you will need a container orchestrator, Docker, Podman, or any other. And this is the approach for local dev containers. In here, you can do cargo build, 
it will just start building the product with everything ready. Okay, so this is the approach to use dev containers in a product that has already the support for dev containers. Let's say that you want to start a project from scratch. Let's go back to the Chrome. You want to start a project from scratch in this time, this time using Rust, and you want to have, you want to have dev container support. So the way to go is use one of our templates. For Rust in ESP chips, we currently have two templates. One of those is ESPIDF template, which has a standard library support, which because it's based on top of ESPIDF. And the other one is called ESP template. It's just it's pure pure Rust, bare metal Rust, no standard library support. Let's use ESPIDF template to generate a project using Cargo Generate, which is a tool that helps us generate projects on based on templates. And this ESPDF template is one of those templates. Let's just generate a project and see how we can use um, the containers. Let's just say Cargo Generate. And here we'll use the URL of the project in GitHub. This will ask us a few questions Project name, the container. And it will ask us if we want to have a standard library support. We do want ESPDF version. In this case, we'll go for 4.4. And MCU that we want to use. Let's use, for example, ESP32 C3. And last, the most important question if we want to have dev container support, let's say true. Now we'll jump into the folder again. Again, when we open it in Visual Studio Code, we'll have the pop-up saying if you want to open it in a dev container. If we miss the pop-up, we can also go here to Zarus and say reopening container, or also use the command palette to ask Visual Studio Code to reopen it in a container. Again, we now have the fully working environment. One limitation, one previous limitation about using dev containers was flashing devices. This is no longer a limitation since we can use the ESP web tool to flash a real target from our browser. The, we're, the way that we do that is the same way we simulate our projects on Wobby. What we're doing is we're building a project, generating our binary and the necessary files, and then sharing them via WebSocket to the browser so we can flash or simulate. And this is how we use Visual Studio Code in a project from scratch. Also, it's worth mentioning that Visual Studio Code works on the main, all the three main platforms. So you can have it on Windows, you have to have it on Linux, and also on Mac OS. Also, along with our templates, there's this .vs code folder, which has some extra features that enable us to have some these buttons on the UI, which will help us to build a product, to build on Flash, and to build and run the simulation in Wokby. Those three buttons are attached and linked to some tasks, which are telling how to build the product and how to do everything required. The launch.json file is telling Visual Studio Code who to attach to a debugging session run on Wokby. So you can use Wokby to debug your project using a JDB, using GDB. And the way to attach it is using this launch.json. So you can just go here, run the Wokby simulation, and start debugging from Visual Studio Code. This allows for a fully feature working environment that you can run, simulate, and build your product. Last but not least, let's say that you want to do dev containers, but this time, instead of routes, you want to go to the C world. So in ESPIDF, we have ESP IDF dev container project, which is basically a dev container version of the Express's ESPIDF template. So it's a main and simple uh, product on ESPIDF, but it has support for Gitpod, for Visual Studio Code dev containers, and also for GitHub code spaces. Let's just open a session on code spaces. Let's open this one. Again, it will set up the environment. This will take a few moments. In my case, it will be faster as I already have created the environment before. And here we have the fully working environment. We're previewing the readme. We have all the files, necessary files. And also 
is worth noting that in this case, we already install expressive ESPIDF extension of VS Code. So we have all the features of built in alongside the VLAN flash button and the work missing nation button. So that's everything from my side. Thanks for listening. Enjoy Dev Containers. And back to you, Jurai. Thank you, Sergio, for sharing with us all these great examples. As you can see, you can achieve a lot just by adding few files to your project. You can improve the newbie experience if somebody is onboarding to your project and give him a repeatable environment. You can use the same tooling to share with customer the environment and help the customer to debug the product. So that's really nice. And you can use even the same environment in the maintenance mode, where, for example, in two or three years, you need to set up the same environment. With container files and Docker files, it's easy. You can use either Gitpod, which is cloud service, code spaces from GitHub, or even local development, where you can leverage your own infrastructure using VS Code and the remote container extension. We are more than happy to share all this information with you. And we are looking forward to see your experience with containers. And we are looking forward uh, to hear about interesting scenarios that you were able to achieve with this cloud technologies that is definitely helping embedded world to get better and better software. Thank you very much. Wow, really nice talk. And now I'd like to invite Yurai and Sergio to join us for the Q&A session. Hello, guys. How are you? Hello. I'm doing fine. Hello. Hello. Hi, Pedro. I'm great. OK, so the first question we have is, can the walkway simulation and web flashing be used without using that containers? I can tackle that one. So yeah, we have two crates built on Rust. That one is for using Walkway simulation, which will just create. Once you have the binary, it will share it with Walkway through our socket, and you will run the full simulation on Walkway. And another crate also built on Rust, which is pretty much the same, but for web flashing. So once you have the binary, you can share it. We have a browser with to your browser, and and from there you can flash it with no problem. Okay. So not that containers are required. OK, really nice. So I have a question. Uh, it's more like related to performance and the benefits of using that container. Like, what can you just like talk about like the benefits of using that container? Yeah. Um, OK, so I will take this question. Uh, and uh, yeah, the containers uh, may help you a lot also in enterprise environment. Uh, for example, we see that many customers have uh, like security policies and antivirus in place, uh, which may uh, be um, incorrectly configured and it's slowing down the build. And uh, especially ESPID of build might take up to two hours on some uh, windows with some special antivirus softwares. Uh, and uh, in that case, it, it really makes sense to leverage uh, the development container and uh, to, to run the build uh, in the isolated environment in the container where the build uh, can be like really fast uh, because there it's running on Linux kernel and uh, the build uh, can take uh, about like one minute in case of uh, SPIDF. Uh, you can even uh, put this container or like very powerful servers uh, that often are uh, in enterprises installed already in-house. Uh, and in that case, um, the, the build can be even speed up using, um, I don't know, uh, 20 or more cores where the build is parallel uh, since we are using uh, Ninja CMake um, and uh, it can leverage all these uh, things. So it can be really faster uh, using the, the dev containers. Okay, really cool. We have next question here. And is there any possible of or possibility of downloading 
uh, those build being filed offline. So I can answer it. So yeah, from Gitbot, you can download any file, same from GitHub code spaces. And when using local dev containers with VS code, you'll have, you can like mount the volume. So you have every file synchronized within the Docker and in your host machine. So you can have the binaries available offline on all the three methods of dev containers. Okay. If I may, I will also add that uh, if you're running a walkway simulator, uh, there is an, this, this hidden uh, functionality behind the F1 button, and you can uh, type a download, and uh, it will provide you the binary that is in the simulator. So that's uh, another option how to get to the binary. Okay, good. So next question. Where we can create an IDF project in Visual Studio Code, expressive plugin? automatically create a dev container? Is necessary to do something else to have this functionality? So I can also answer this one. By default, the expressive plugin, that, like the extension of Visual Studio Code, does not add dev container support. We are working towards improving our dev container support. And in the future, we may have this functionality. But at the moment, the way to go if you want to start a project with ESPDF and have the container support is either you include those files on your own or we have a working template with ESPDF, ESPDF which we are working also to, to improve it, which already has, is a very simple ESPDF project with everything set up for the container su support. Okay, cool. Okay, so thank you for showing us this cool feature today and how to to use dev containers. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, so next talk, uh, we will have Jacob and he will talk about uh, C++ on ESP microchip. I hope you enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this talk about using C++ on ESP microchips. My name is Jakob Hasse. I'm from the Software Platforms Department. And the last few years, I focused um, um, on C++ usage inside ESP IDF, among other things. This talk will be structured into four parts. Uh, first, we will take a bit, uh, take a few, few benefits of using C++ over using C and um, see how, how users can use them, can benefit from them. We will also talk about the challenge when using C++. We will then take a quick view into the the current state of C++ inside ESP IDF and seeing the repositories and examples in involved. Finally, we will conclude with a roadmap. So what we are plan to use, uh, what we are plan to implement in the near and midterm future. So in C++, you can use object invariants and the strong typing system to create something called strong value types. Strong value types should actually feel and be able to be usable like normal types, as for example, int. So you can copy them, move them around, but they have some advantages. One is they have only a private data member, and the constructor of that object can make sure that the private data member is always valid. So the val value contained is always valid. Furthermore, you cannot convert them into another type. And that will get useful uh, as we will see in a minute. Let's first take a look at this class I2C master. It has a constructor and the first four arguments have a strong value type. 
So if you want to use that constructor, you have to use it like this. You have to pass the actual type. You can not, for example, pass an int 18, so just a raw int. You have to explicitly first uh, create the type as CLGPIO, and then you can use it. Otherwise, you'll get a compile error. Um, but this usage is not the main advantage. It's much more useful if something like this happened. We accidentally swap the STA GPIO and SCL GPIO. If you want to compile this, we will see a compiler error. It will say no matching function for call to what we are actually calling. And um, a note with a guess of the compiler what it thinks we want to call. And then it will directly tell us no known conversion for argument two. We have some template instantiations here, but it basically tells us, hey, there's a GP, uh, there's a SCL GPIO, and you're actually passing an SCA GPIO. Note that this is a compiler error, so you can correct that mistake immediately. If you would have used normal types as int or uints, for example, there would have been no error, so the compiler would have compiled fine and you would have noticed that mistake only way later in when you actually try to access the I2C bus. Another benefit of using C++ is automatic destruction and RAII. RAII stands for resource acquisition is initialization. That means that each time you acquire a resource, you do that in a constructor. Each time you release a resource, you do that in the destructor of the corresponding object. We can see in this short app main method how it's used. We have an I2C master object that we instantiate. So the constructor is called and resources are acquired. Then we write something to the I2C bus using sync write, master.sync write, and that's it. So before app main returns now, it will automatically call the I2C master classes destructor, hence releasing its resources. So that means we cannot accidentally forget to release the resource, which is a big plus. Another advantage is that the same thing will happen if you return early because you notice an error condition. So you will either return early using an error code, returning an error code, or you can throw an exception. In both cases, the I2C master object also goes out of scope and the destructor will be called automatically. So again, you cannot accidentally forget to release resources or to incorrectly handle the error inside the function. So we basically have automatic resource management. Another advantage of C++ is that you can use C++ exceptions. It's a bit controversial and we will see the, the different implications of C++ exceptions in a few minutes. But so first of all, let's look at the benefits. C++ exceptions cannot be ignored. So you cannot accidentally forget to check a return value of a function. Uh, if you ignore a, res an, a C++ exception, it will automatically terminate the program. The same thing is true for automatic propagation. You do not need to do that yourself. It's done automatically. You do not need any boilerplate code to propagate error values. Neither can you forget to propagate er error values. C++ exceptions are furthermore the only way to signal recoverable errors in constructors because constructors do not return any values. And you also separate the error handling in the code from the actual code from the normal logic, which means you have a cleaner and easier to read code. Finally, you can also use the C++ standard library. The C++ standard library is mostly operational in ESP IDF. Uh, some features are missing due to missing underlying implementations, but the most common stuff is working. For example, you can use the containers library. You can also use threading and the synchronization primitives that we commonly use. Let's take a look at the challenge now. I will first briefly talk about the general code and memory size of C++. 
Then I will talk about C++ exceptions in particular. And finally, also mention some incompatibilities between C and C++. In general, C++ is built around a principle called the zero overhead or zero cost principle. That means two things. First, when, if you do not use a feature, then you will not pay for it in terms of code or memory size. If you do use a feature, however, it's implemented in the most efficient way already. So you should not be able to program a more efficient uh, this to program the same feature in a more efficient way using C or assembly, for example. C++ exceptions stand out a bit because, well, first of all, if you do not use them, you do not pay for them. But if you do use them, however, you have significant performance overhead in some situations. We will get in, we will see the details later, um, but uh, you can argue if it's the most efficient way to handle errors. So if we analyze the exception overhead, we can look at the runtime. We can look at the code size or the flash memory usage on ESP chips. We can also look at the stack usage and the heap usage. And that's what we are going to do now. Uh, to analyze the overhead, we use a little test program that does an element-wise division. So we have two arrays, and um, one is uh, consisting of devices and the other one of, of uh, dividends. And it will element-wise uh, do the division. And as soon as the divisor is zero, it will report an error. We have two versions of that program. One reports that error using exceptions, one reports that error using error codes. We run all these versions, each with and without an, provoking an error at runtime. All statistics are collected on an ESP32 chips, and we use all three commonly used optimization settings in ESP IDF. You can use, you can choose the debug setting, you can choose the optimized setting, and you can use the setting to optimize for size. Uh, note, however, that this benchmark application is for demonstration purposes. Um, in a real world application, you will most likely not feel significant impact by both the positive and negative aspects of this, uh, of exception handling. If we look at the normal runtime, so if no error is reported, we can see that the version using exception is slightly faster than the version using error codes. And this is because no return values have to be checked. So return checking the return values in the error code version takes time, additional time, and that's why it's slower. If we do throw an exception or if we do uh, need to report an error, however, the, the difference is significant. Uh, we see that throwing an exception takes more than more than one millisecond overhead. This overhead is dominated by uh, throwing the exception, by the unwinding of the stack, by restoring the execution at the catch block. Uh, the error code runtime example, the error code example runtime is still dominated mostly by the calculation because the returning of the return code of the error code is just a few few instructions. If we look at the flash size, we see some increase. Part of that increase is because we need uh, libgcc for unwinding the stack. So parts of libgcc or additional parts of libgcc will be used. And we also need handling information for each function that may encounter an exception. This information includes, for example, which destructors of local objects to call, as we've discussed before. If we look at the stack usage, if an error is reported, then we can see that uh, that exception handling also uses a bit of stack. This is because throwing an exception means uh, calling a few functions, for example, to a function to allocate the exception and a function to initiate the handling process and that will call further functions and all of them will also 
create some some objects on the stack and that's where this stack usage is coming from if you do not throw any exceptions then you will not have this overhead we can also take a look at the heap overhead and again we see that there's some some additional usage if an exception is thrown if no exception is thrown then there won't be any overhead the overhead is mostly due to to the allocation of the exception object. Um, some of you may ask now, what happens if we throw an exception because we ran out of memory? In this case, the exception handling can use something called the emergency pool or emergency exception memory pool. Uh, you need to enable this in the menu config, but then you can use that and that will uh, allow to allocate an exception even if we ran out of memory. Uh, another thing to notice here is that at this point um, there are many kilobytes of heap allocated already. So the 150, around 150 additional bytes are relatively small to compare to the rest that is already allocated. So to conclude, um, if no exception is thrown, there, there should not be any runtime overhead. Use C++ exceptions only for recoverable error cases that are not in the main code path. In particular, you should not use exceptions to emulate, uh, to emulate control structures. Then you will have all the overhead because you're, you're constantly throwing exceptions. There are numbers out there that suggest that exceptions should be used for events that occur uh, at least or at most one in a 100, one every 100 times or one every thousand times. Finally, exception handling does cost time. So do not use it inside interrupt service routines or for real-time critical code paths. Another challenge, which is uh, minor, but uh, also plays a role is uh, that there are some incompatibilities between C and C++. If we have code that is called both from C and C++, we need to wrap the corresponding header files with extern C. Another problem is that in C and C++, the initialization of structures can be different. So if you take an example of IDF and try to compile it as C++, if it's not in C++, an actual C++ example, you will likely need to change the initialization of the structures there. Otherwise you will get compile errors. Let's take a look at what we currently have when we want to use exceptions inside ESP IDF on ESP chips. Uh, in general, all the standard C++ features work. The standard is C++ 20. So everything that the compiler provides us uh, should work. Also important is all IDF features. So all the components, everything you can call from the C code should also be call, callable from C++ code. If that's not the case, please let us know because then we should probably fix this. We have two examples inside ESP IDF where the components are actually written in C++. These are NVS and the wear leveling component. Inside ESP IDF, we do turn off C++ exceptions because we have a lot of users only using C. So they would not have a lot of benefit from using C++ exceptions, but they would bear all the cost. We also created a new repository called ESP IDF CXX, and this one should be easy to use and safe. So that were the, the main goals and main incentives. And in that repository, we do use exceptions because they have advantage. You can easily use constructors and the, the code should be a bit more readable because you're separating the error handling. If we look at the ESP IDF CXX repository, we can see there are five examples and they basically match the features we have in that repository so far. So the Blink example uses the GPIO classes. We also have uh, C++ classes for ESP event, for ESP timer, for I2C and SPI. Let's take a look at the GPIO example. I took the, the main function here, I removed all the comments, but you can find this very code in directly in that repository. Um, so it's not that long. So we first um, 
initiate instantiate a GPIO output class. Interesting here is that you can see by the name that some of the configuration is inside the inside the type already. So you cannot accidentally forget to set direction. And if you want to accidentally use the uh, GPIO input class, you would also get compile errors because it has different functions than set high, set low. And as we discussed before, the constructor takes a strong value type GPIO num. Uh, the rest happens in the while loop. We just do set high, set low, uh, followed by a sleep for one second. And that's pretty much it. The rest is error handling. I hope this example gives you some, some insight of how few code is required to, to set something up with a new C++ repository and how easy it is to use, hopefully. And of course, uh, if you have any contributions, uh, let us know. And really feel free to, to check this repository out and um, give us feedback. We, are, uh, we welcome all the feedback for that. Finally, the roadmap. We plan to publish this ESP IDF CXX repository as a component for the IDF component manager. We furthermore want to add more C++ classes until we have a minimal set of use cases that we cover. We plan to add some classes handling GPIO interrupts. We plan to add classes for ADC, PWM, Wi-Fi networking, and possibly for general interrupt allocation. If we find that one important use case is missing, please let us know, we will consider it and maybe also add uh, more C++ classes. But that's the current plan. So if you have any questions, please ask them now. Uh, we also have some references here for people who want to continue reading into some of the topics. Thanks for listening to this presentation. Great. So now I'd like to invite Jacob to join us for the Q&A. Hello, Jacob. How are you? Hello, Pedro. I'm, I'm good. Thanks. So, OK. So um, I'd like to start by question. Uh, why should I use C++ instead of C on my project? Um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good question. Um, so as the the talk explained there are certain certain advantages of c++ uh, but uh, what um, what developers uh, should definitely need to consider is um, uh, that they need to be able to use them right so um, if you have someone who's written uh, code and in, and in, in c for 20 years um, they will not be suddenly able to to write um, good c++ code um, We've also seen the, the boundaries, right? Um, uh, we don't want to wait for an exception to be handled in uh, uh, while you're at the same time also serving a, a motor control, uh, for example. Um, but I think um, um, relatively simple projects um, can benefit a lot from, from C++ uh, because C++ makes, um, oh, not, not only simple projects, but um, Projects where the maybe the the real time um, uh, real timeness is not uh, um, overly important can benefit a lot from C++ if people if you if you have developers who are uh, familiar with C++. Okay, great. Do you have any kind of like recommendation? Like if if I have my project on C, like all the projects it was written in C and then I need to, or I want to move it to, to C++, how should I start doing that? Do you have any recommendation for that? Um, yes, I would really uh, uh, recommend uh, um, moving gradually. Um, uh, C++ is uh, available um, in ESP IDF. Um, but I would not recommend um, throwing over the entire project and then uh, rewriting everything from scratch in C++. Um, I would begin um, 
well, certainly with a with a main component, write it in C, um, make sure that this works, and then you can gradually switch um, to 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 C plus plus. Okay, great. So we have one from the community. Is there any benefit of using the STD sync thread mutex etc. Et instead of free actors threads and mutex? Um, well, you have the the the, the more abstract interface. Um, you can, um, for example, run the same code on on Linux or other machines that um, that provide the uh, lib STD C plus um, plus. That's um, that's uh, the the main advantage, uh, I would say, and also that these um, oh, the standard C library is based also around this uh, RAII idiom that I, I talked before, which is um, good for for automatically man managing resources. So you can um, you have less chances of doing something wrong basically during the the um, uh, resource lifetime. Okay, I think we have time for more. One, one more question. Mm -hmm. How big is the overhead of using STD thread instead of free RTOS X, thread, X task grade? Sorry. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's basically only the, um, the, the, uh, the overhead of uh, uh, the lib STD C++ and P thread uh, because um, uh, our lib SED C++ uses P thread and um, P thread or the P thread implementation of the threading library inside IDF uh, uses um, the free Arthur's tasks. Okay. One more question. Memory allocations in C++ and can cause problems problems if engineers don't understand. Managing heap can be difficult on embedded systems with limited resources. Um, yeah, well, f first of all, um, it's, it's a good question um, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a common, uh, it's a common um, uh, pitfall, memory allocations. Um, first of all, uh, it can also be, cause trouble in, in C if, 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 you, if you don't understand how to use it. Um, I would say um, in C++, it tends to be if you're not doing the actual raw allocations yourself, but um, you, you, um, you tie the resources to classes as suggested in the, in the talk, um, then you, um, I would say you, you tend to be a bit, have a bit uh, more uh, safer code um, because you have automatic deallocations and um, all this um, maybe almost uh, automatic resource management. Um, yeah, so um, and um, there's um, some some overheads in, in heap if you use the uh, SCD uh, C++, the SCD C++. Um, but um, that's uh, something you need to find out in the application. How, you, how far you can go. But from a, a safety point, I don't see any additional issues in C++. Of course, you need to understand the how the libraries work and um, how basic C++ works, yes. Okay, thank you for answering the questions. Uh, thank you for the talk as well. And yeah, see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you as well. Bye. Okay, so and now the third block comes to the end and we have a 10 minute break and then we'll be back for the last block of the conference. Thank you.
Hello world, this is Yanis, your host at Espressive DevCon 22. We're back for the final session of our conference. I can't believe how quickly it feels to have reached this point. Well, time flies when you have fun, and we certainly enjoyed this conference to the fullest. But there's still one more session to attend, so the first one to grace your screens this evening is Martin Gagno from Brno, who will talk about generating and parsing FATFS images with ESPIDF from version 5.0 onwards. By including the Python-based FATFS toolset in ESPIDF, users can avoid manually encoding and decoding the binary partition. At the same time, the FATFS tool preserves its compatibility with FAT12 and FAT16, which allows its use beyond ESPIDF. Then, Alessandro Ranellucci from Arduino will give us all the latest news from Arduino, focusing on IDE 2.0 and command line tools. The third talk of this evening will be given by Espressive's Alan Carvalho from Brazil. He will talk about developing a natural interface game powered by Natex Artos. Given that natural interfaces are becoming very popular, this talk should attract the interest of many viewers. The final presentation of DevCon 22 will be delivered by two guest speakers from Microsoft, the Principal Program Manager, Wellington Dures, and Senior Software Engineer, Euriton Scarborough da Silva. They will present the Azure Device Update, a solution for OTA, and the Azure IoT middleware for free autos, both of which can now be used by ESP32. We'll do a demo and present part of the solution using ESPIDF, also providing viewers with links to samples and documentation. After this, we'll have a general Q&A session for any remaining questions by the audience. This will be handled by Espressive's Vice President of Software Platforms, Ivan Grohotkov. At the very end, Pedro Minatel, the conference organizer, will share his final thoughts and remarks with all of us. But first, let's listen to what Martin Gagno from Brno has to say about generating and parsing FATFS images with ESPIDF. Hi everyone, I am Martin and I have been a software engineer at Espressi for over two years. In this talk, I will briefly introduce file systems using Espressive chips, especially FAT file system, and our recently implemented Python tools for generating and parsing FAT images on the host. This presentation will cover the properties of FATFS in Espressive microchips, alternative file systems, advantages, disadvantages, a brief look into the wear leveling layer, generating and parsing images on the host, a quick demo, and last but not least, questions and answers session. The FAT file system is a simple protocol developed in 1977. It is in use till the present, especially in small devices like microcontrollers. The original types of FAT file systems are FAT12, FAT16, and FAT32. FAT12 and FAT16 differ mainly in the number of clusters, and FAT32 has a richer structure that can contain more metadata than FAT12 and FAT16. According to specification, Microsoft originally developed it for IBM personal computers that used little NDN architecture. Because of that, the protocol also uses little NDN. As I already mentioned, the number of clusters implicitly determines the type. Documentation, however, allows redefining the default type. The basic building block is the FAT, 
file allocation table. It consists of one or more sectors and every physical cluster matches a logical entry in the table. In other words, the file allocation table has a particular number of entries and the block in the table corresponds to the physical cluster. The FAT type determines the size of the block in the table such that FAT12 has 12 bits in one entry, FAT16 has 16 bits, and FAT32 has 32 bits. The file is allocated as a linked list of clusters with nodes stored in the file allocation table. The linked list node corresponds to the FAT table's entry. If the node is final, the entry is the highest possible number on the given number of bits. Therefore, all Fs in hexadecimal code or all ones in binary. All zeros determine free space. Otherwise, the number in the FAT entry refers to the address of the next cluster in the file chain. The clusters contain either the file content or references to the other files or directories and yield the tree structure. Another property of the FAT file system is the size of the names. You can choose between short and long file names by specifying the option in kconfig using idf.py menu config. Without selecting the long file names option, the protocol uses pattern 8.3 file names. Otherwise, you can use the universal coded character set UCS when long file names are allowed. The file system is not natively flash friendly and the official specification does not provide wear leveling. That is why Espressive implemented its wear leveling layer with adequate disk protection. The wear leveling algorithm is a non standard aspect of our FAT file system and is the main problem in generating and parsing the FATFS image. But let's now talk about other file systems. The frequently used file system for embedded development is, for example, SPI FFS or Little FS, an improved descendant of SPI FFS. There is not much support for the Little FS yet, and SPI FFS is officially deprecated and lacks a directory structure by design. You can use uh, you can still use our tools for generating SPI FFS partition either the Python free tool spiffsgen.py or the C++ tool mkspiffs. So what would be the reason to use FAT file system? We provide wear leveling, which is not native and ideal, but it's definitely supported. The system has extensive cross-platform compatibility and is still a standard on many devices. A essential feature is the ability to encrypt the partition, which is not supported, for example, on SPI FFS. A disadvantage is that FATFS is not flash friendly since its origin and may not provide the best flash behavior. It may lead, for example, to non deterministic or slow IO operation times. Because it is quite a specific topic, and the read-write mode requires it, I will briefly share some information and knowledge about the wear out and wear leveling. Flash wear leveling, uh, flash wear out means overusing a particular physical block of the memory instead of balancing the load between all blocks. Uh, on the other hand, wear leveling is an algorithm trying to prevent wearing out and prolonging the disk's life. The main goal is to balance the usage of the sectors and avoid excessive use of some and no usage of other blocks. If you performed, for example, million write operation on the same file, it would erase the same set of blocks a million times. And uh, that would speed up wearing the disk out. For example, if you have thousands of blocks, 
Ideally implemented wear leveling can extend the disk's lifespan a thousand times. The design of an algorithm assumes that the worst operation in terms of wear and tear is sector erase. It means changing binary one to binary zero. The partition is initially encapsulated uh, into a few more sectors storing the information about wear leveling. Initially, the first sector was the so-called dummy. When the sector is dummy, it means it rests and is not in use. At the end of the partition are placed sectors holding information about wear leveling configuration and its state. After every erase operation, we add a new 16 bytes record into the state sector and the dummy sector is swapped with the following sector or the first sector in case the dummy is the last. When the dummy sector reaches the maximal position, we erase the state sector records and increase the counter in the state sector. Notice that after the first round, the first sector is in the last position. When the first logical sector reaches the first position again, the counter is um, the counter placed in the state sector is then rewritten to zero. The main principle is to choose a different sector after every operation to rest and prevent overusing one specific memory block. Wear leveling is necessary for optimal run of the programs. However, it is the biggest issue in parsing and mounting images on the host. The position of the dummy sector has to be non-trivially determined based on the state sector. For initializing the wear leveling, we need to add all the crucial metadata. Uh, that's also the reason why we decided to provide a partition generator and partition parser. The community provided a couple of open source tools or Unix commands for packing the folder to the FATFS compatible binary image. However, the community implemented these tools in compilable languages without wear leveling support. Therefore, customers requested a Python tool similar to spiffsgen.py without requiring compilation like the C or C++ tools. The partition generator that is served as a part of ESP IDF is a Python free based tool providing the complete functionality required for encoding local folder on the host into the binary FAT file system image. The tool can be used as a command line Python tool or even more convenient using an integrated part of our build system as a CMake function that users must add to the project's CMake lists.txt file. The tool can generate images with already mentioned wear leveling, short or long file names, FAT12 and FAT16. Extending the functionality to FAT32 is an objective of the following work. After working with the FAT file system on the device, the user can download the partition binary image using part tool or ESP tool. The standard tools for mounting a file system on Unix systems as mount or disk util don't support wear leveling and evaluate the partition extracted from the device as an invalid partition. ES ESP IDF provides the reverse FAT file system generator tool to mitigate this issue. The script FATFSPars.py is a command line tool that takes as an argument the binary image and generates an equivalent folder on the host. The user needs to specify whether long names and where leveling are supported. In the future, we plan to, de we plan to detect these properties automatically. To sum it up, the users can now generate and parse FAT images on the host. Current restrictions are FAT12 and FAT16 with wear leveling and long file name support. 
The command line tool or CMake function is used to encode the local folder into the binary image. The flash partition, the, the, to, to flash the partition into the device, you can use ESP tool. Decoding is possible only by command line tool. Extracting from the device can also be done by ESP tool or also a part tool. The following plans include support for deriving the minimal partition size for a given folder, detection of aware leveling and long file names, an option to have multiple FAT tables, a chance to forcibly redefine the FAT type to non-default type, FAT32, and anything that our user find useful. Suppose you could think about any FAT related feature or anything you wish to have in the ESP IDF framework. In that case, we strongly encourage you to create a feature request in the issues section in our GitHub repo. We will be also very happy for any feedback, bug report or question on GitHub or the forum ESP32.com. Now, uh, let's do a short demo to propose a simple use case for FATFSGen.py. The example runs on the uh, ESP32 S2, but you can uh, choose any ESP IDF compatible product with sufficient memory. The demo will be a simple HTTP file server. The file server needs its uh, file system, and we decided to use FAT. It is possible to format a new valid partition directly on the chip or to flash the partition in advance and then mount it on the device. Uh, for that purpose, we use the CMake function in our project, which will involve generating the partition from the local folder and flashing it into the device. Users need to add a function below the component register. And now, as you can see, we already built flashed and now we are monitoring the device and program running into that device. Now, as we can see, the server is up and running uh, on the given IP using port 80. We can now try to store a JPEG file from the uh, local machine into the, into the device using the uh, web interface. And why don't we also try to upload a larger PDF file, uh, MQTT white paper. This uh, takes a little longer time to add to the device's uh, FAT file system, but now it is already in there. And uh, let's now perform a couple of delete operations. Let's delete hello.txt and also a content of SUB uh, folder, which is now empty and we can delete it all. Let's now terminate the server and uh, extract the partition out of the server. For extracting the partition, we are using the script extract, and we will take a look at this script now. Uh, for given script and for extracting the partition, we are using a partition table and generate the part tool uh, that is also part of ESP IDF framework. This uh, script is not added to the system path using our sourcing script, so we have to do it manually in Python using the absolute path. Uh, now we can conveniently import part tool target and partition name, which is a required functionality for uh, extracting the partition out of the device. Part tool target uh, take as an argument the port that connects the device with our machine, and partition name is uh, in my case storage. This can be verified in the partition table of the demo example, which is truly storage, and we can find there also some other essential information as the size of the partition and also the starting offset. The FATFS.img is, uh, is the file that will contain the binary, the binary partition after extracting it uh, from the device. 
Now the script uh, terminated successfully and we can verify if the desired file is already present in the computer and uh, it is. Now we would like to uh, create a folder that contains the, the uh, that contains the folder tree from the fatfs.img. For that purpose, we will use the fatfspars.py script. This script is also not in the system path, so we have to use the absolute path to access the script. And we also use the flags long name support and where leveling support because we use them also in our HTTP uh, file server. We'll apply the script to the binary image extracted from the device fatfs.img. The script ran successfully, and now we can take a look at the content of the generated folder called Espressive. The folder contains the information and the files that we expected, including uh, web page, index.html, also the icon required for Google Chrome, and the uh, image that was uh, referenced in uh, the web page. Two files that we've added to the file system are present here as well, excluding the file that we removed earlier. And uh, this is all from the demo. So thank you for your attention. And now I believe it is the time for questions and answers session. Okay, we are back for one more Q&A. And for this Q&A, I will like to invite Martin and Roland. How are you guys? Hi, Pedro. I'm great. Yeah. Nah. Hi again, okay. Pedro. I'm also great. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. So Can you hear uh, me? first question. Oh, great. Okay, so is fatfsgen.pi also compatible with Python 2? I'll take this question. Uh, no. Uh, FATFS uh, gen.py is no longer compatible with uh, Python 2, similarly as the whole ESP IDF, so you can only use it with Python 3. OK. One more. Yeah. If I may add yes. also that yes, that's uh, Martin mentioned that uh, uh, it is uh, by IDF not uh, supported uh, and uh, th therefore during the implementation we haven't even considered uh, to stay compatible with uh, Python 2 since we knew that uh, in the environment where it will be used uh, nobody uh, will be actually using it but I uh, don't, don't think there is any uh, would be any uh, significant uh... okay like effort to, to, to make it compatible if it would be uh, necessary. I see. And how about like, is, is fatfsgen.py integrated with idf.py or esp2.py? I can take this one as well. Uh, well, no, uh, fatfsgen.py is not integrated uh, with these two tools. So you can use it only uh, as itself alone. Uh, as a command line uh, script, or you can use a CMake function, which is uh, integrated with the command line script. OK, so I have one more question. This is about that, that means, sorry, that just uh, uh, explains a little bit more. It is integrated into the build system. So so actually, it's, it's part of idf.py build process. And uh, ES, for ESP tool, it's just uh, um, like uh, transparent thing. It just uh, will flash a fat partition, but it doesn't care about uh, uh, the generator itself. OK. So I will move to one more question. So this is regarding performance. So what the amount of performance penalty is caused by using fat effects generation and parsing? Okay. Well, I've seen this question on uh, YouTube, but I didn't really understood what does it mean, the penalty, uh, by the 
uh, Wojciech, who asked the question. Roland, do you understand it? Yeah, pr 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 probably uh, it is uh, since the generation is uh, takes place on the host side, so it's uh, more likely uh, won't uh, take uh, any uh, significant penalty on the uh, runtime. And uh, yeah, on the ESP where it uh, should be a critical, it just a partition goes there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically no penalty. But I think we, we have uh, not, not considered uh, the uh, actual uh, performance of the script uh, yet. We, we haven't uh, like had any issues uh, with that. So maybe it, in the future, if somebody would uh, generate a very large uh, file system images, then should uh, get back to it and optimize it. If it's Okay, and talking about future, do you have any anything to share, like any future planned roadmap that you can share with us? Well, definitely, uh, according to discussion with our, with our storage team, uh, we are planning to add uh, support for uh, FAT32, which is not a part of the, of the FAT uh, file system generator. And except for that, uh, maybe to make it more compatible with uh, the official documentation. What do you think, Roland? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, the community uh, could help us uh, with this a lot. Uh, so if uh, you like this feature and uh, you would uh, want uh, something more from it, uh, then uh, don't hesitate to uh, create a, a GitHub uh, feature request uh, for us. So we at least we get some feedback, you know that people are using this tool and uh, there's something uh, needs to be done, needs to be improved uh, in this direction. Good. Okay, so I'd like to thank you for the talk and to be here for the Q&A as well. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so the next talk is quite special. It's from an external company, Arduino. And Alessandro, will, he will talk about the news about the new IDE.2.2.0. And yeah, so let's hear what he has to say. Hello everyone, I am Alessandro from Arduino. I'm here to talk about some news about the open source tools from Arduino that are relevant for the ESP community. Uh, I will talk about four things. I will talk about the new IDE, the command line tools, the actions for continuous integration and the library ecosystem. Let's start with the IDE. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Arduino IDE. It's a, it's a very known piece of software. There are uh, it, it's been around for 15 years uh, and it's known as the de facto standard uh, for uh, Arduino boards and non-Arduino boards uh, as it supports more than 250 boards, including, of course, ESP8266 and ESP32. Just to give you some numbers, it was downloaded over 39 millions of times uh, just during last year. Uh, and it's uh, localized in 66 languages. And also we counted that it is mentioned in at least three thousand books so it's a very popular piece of software and i'm sure most of you many of you actually uh, use it uh, for uh, your development uh, uh, projects uh, of course uh, uh, the architecture of the id is modular so uh, for each family of boards there is a core which is a pluggable um uh, a pl pluggable a uh, component that uh, uh, defines uh, the uh, characteristics of each board. Uh, in case of ESP32, the core is maintained by the expressive team. It's uh, super well documented, super feature complete, very cleanly written. So that's what uh, you are using with the Arduino IDE to program the ESP32 boards. Some features of the IDE include the library manager, include a serial monitor where you can send and receive uh, strings uh, 
back and forth from the board, a serial plotter, and uh, some other features, um, including uh, code examples that come with the library and the ability to customize menus and options for each board. So we decided to, uh, to revamp this ID based on some feedback we got over the years from users. One is, is about the limited editing capabilities compared to modern editors. We are now used to a very modern editors so with many features, uh, with uh, a good user experience. So the old uh, ID written in Java started to be a bit limited for many users. And also we got uh, the, the request for a built-in debugger. So uh, also there were some technologic issues the, the fact that the IDE is written in Java started to be a bit of a problem considering that modern operating systems are not supporting Java, uh, are starting to dismiss their support for Java. Uh, also, the licensing from Oracle is not friendly with app stores, and the monolithic code base and the complexity of this Java code base was limiting, has been limiting the contributions from the community. So we also keep, kept in mind that there are some alternatives. So expert users, um, are using uh, other solutions like Platform.io, like the Microsoft uh, VS Code extension, or the Visual Micro plugin for Visual Studio, or completely different uh, IDs for embedded development. So we decided to start a redesign process with some principles in mind. First off, we wanted a modern editing engine with a better user experience. We want to maximize accessibility of the IDE. Uh, we wanted to create a framework and architecture that would allow for faster development of new features. And also we wanted to break the monolithic code base. So we split the, the, the ID in a front end and a back end. The, the back end is what does the compilation, the upload, all, the, all the, the core logic is now in a command line tool, which is called by this front end. And also we wanted uh, an ID that could potentially in the future support also Python, JavaScript, Tiny Go, other languages. And we wanted to facilitate community contributions. Also, we wanted a, an ID that could potentially be integrated with cloud solutions for a sketch backup, a sharing, and other things. So we, after a very long process, after 19 uh, beta releases, after lots of feedback from the community, this September, so a couple of weeks ago, we released the 2.0 stable version, which was already downloaded by 1.2 million people just in 15 days. As you see, the interface is very, very similar to the previous ID, but with some modern features. Let's see, let's see them. One is the auto-completion. So while you type, you get the list of methods uh, that you can call on a given object with their signature, with, uh, with their arguments. This is a modern thing that all editors have, and now also the Arduino, Arduino ID has. Uh, also, when you right-click on a function or a method call, you, can, you have the ability to jump to the place where it is defined. So if you are unsure about what a method does, and it's not clearly written in its documentation, you can right-click and go to the source file of the library where this, that method is defined, so you understand exactly what you are calling and what it will do. Then the IDE has a, a very requested feature, which is a dark mode to relax uh, your eyes. And then we revamped completely the serial plotter. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this feature. It's basically a simple way to, to plot visually data coming from the board. Let's see, let's see a video. So the new serial plotter was designed uh, in, in, with uh, uh, the ability with, of um, being of supporting uh, uh, high um, quantities of data. So it's, you see here, this is real time chart. This data is coming uh, written on the serial port, uh, one data point per line, and you can also plot multiple series. And from the interface, uh, users can. Uh, as you see, check all the numbers. Uh, they can enable and disable data series, and they can export the data. 
Another feature is the in-app update. So when there is a new fee, new version, you can just click on download and it will be automatically updated without you having to go to the website. Another important feature is the built-in debugger. The Arduino IDE finally gets the built-in ability to debug your sketches. They run on hardware, so they are not being emulated on your computer. They will run on the actual board and, but from the IDE, you are able to pause their execution and inspect their variables. So let's see how it works. You basically work normally in the IDE, then you click the debugger uh, button and this panel opens. Then you set the breakpoints close to the lines where you want to stop execution. And as you see, you can inspect the contents of the variables and you can even change the contents of the variables while this, the, the, the sketch is being executed. Uh, it's important to say also that uh, this feature for now is experimental and is only supported for the Cortex boards. However, the architecture of the ID is modular. So it's basically a matter of configuring some uh, information in order to link the ID to the components providing debugging for other platforms. We just need to document a bit better this framework. Um, so as of now, there is no built-in support for ESP32 debugging, but the ID is almost ready in terms of architecture. So if you are interested in bringing this feature um, to ESP32 quickly, uh, do not hesitate to join us because the ID is an open source project. So you are totally welcome to join us on GitHub, start the discussion, and we will for sure appreciate your contribution in accelerating the implementation of the debugging for ESP32 platform. Let's see the architecture of the ID. Uh, as you see, it's based on the open source framework Thea, which is based on the same architecture as Visual Studio Code. Uh, so it's every, everything is written in TypeScript and is based on the Electron framework. And it's downloadable, try it now, on arduino.cc slash an slash software. Now, I'd like to talk about uh, Another important tool that we released uh, in the past uh, couple of years, uh, it's the CLI, it's the common line tool. So as I told you, when we developed the new ID, we decided to move all the core logic to the backend, to a command line tool so that people can use the command line tool directly, uh, even if they don't want to use the ID. Uh, what can it do? It's a, it's a very flexible tool, which allows you to compile, your sketch to upload it to a board, install libraries, and monitor the serial console. How does it work? You can install it very easily. If you are on Mac, on Linux, you can just use Homebrew to get it, or you can just go to the website, to GitHub, and download the binaries and install them yourself. Uh, then, in order to configure it for ESP32 boards, you just write, type this line of code where you set the URL of the package index for ESP32 board packages, and then you just install the ESP32 core. That's it, and you're ready to go. So you plug a board in your USB port and you type board list. You get the list of all the boards uh, available locally on your workstation. As you see, there is the, the, the port, the serial port, uh, and there is also the board name if it gets recognized. On the right side, you see the fully qualified board name, FQBN. It's basically a string that identifies the board. Um, in this case, it's an Arduino board based on the, on the SAMD architecture, and the board identifier is Maker Wi-Fi 1010. Um, that FQBN is important because you use it when you issue the uh, compilation command. Let's see how it is. Basically, you are in the directory of your sketch. You want to compile it, and you type compile, giving the identifier of the board type. In this case, it's a Node MCU board, and it will be compiled, uh, as you see, directly without uh, any additional information you have to give, to, to give. As a second command, you can upload the, um, the compiled sketch to your board, so you just supply the serial port name, and it will be done for you. As you see, this is very convenient because you can script it, you can integrate it in your custom workflow. 
and then also you can use your own ID. Suppose you want to use Sublime Text or you want to use something else, uh, you can just use Arduino CLI from your shell and um, and and uh, and be free basically. So uh, another feature is the uh, serial monitor. So with this command, you can just uh, attach your terminal to the serial port to your board and have an interactive way of receiving and sending data from and to your board. Also, there is an advanced feature that uh, not many people know that we released uh, last year, and it's uh, uh, called Build Profiles. It's a way to freeze and store the exact versions of the board package and the libraries you are using. So when you compile, when you issue the compile command, you just add the dump profile argument, and on the terminal, after the compilation, you will get this uh, little uh, chunk of YAML, uh, which describes exactly the environment of this compilation. What do you do with this, uh, with this chunk of text? You can copy it inside a file called sketch.yaml, uh, which you can later reuse to recompile using, using exactly the same versions. So in this case, when you compile, you just uh, call the name of the profile inside this file, and it will automatically get the library versions you originally used, the board package version, and you are sure that your compilation is the same as the previous one. Uh, we call it reproducible build. As you see, the YAML file can contain multiple profiles. So you can store many combinations of settings and choose the one you want to use each time. Let's now talk about a uh, more advanced uh, set of tools that we released. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with GitHub and use it uh, to store uh, your projects. As you know, on, on GitHub, there is the ability to run automated tests after each commit. Suppose you, uh, you work on a feature, you commit it to your GitHub repository, you want it checked. We released uh, some GitHub actions uh, which allow you to run compilation of your sketch after each commit automatically on all the platforms you want to uh, support. Uh, this is an example of what you would see after each commit, after each pull request on your repository. It basically uh, tries to compile your uh, library or your sketch uh, on one or more platforms and report success or failure so that you uh, know that at least in terms of compilation, your code is correct. Of course, compilation does not guarantee that it will actually work correctly on hardware. But for sure, if it cannot compile, it, it will not work on hardware in any case. So this is a way to accelerate your development and make sure you don't introduce regressions. How does it work? You just configure a very simple YAML file uh, inside your repository. There are some examples in the repository. Uh, this is not the simplest one. This already contains a number of features. As you see, you uh, choose uh, uh, the, you select the sketches in case your repository contains multiple sketches. You list the libraries uh, and you say, and you specify the board identifier where you want the compilation to happen. That's it. You can also do the same for libraries. So if you are hosting your own library on GitHub, you, get, you can just configure all the boards you want to support and a matrix of tests will be performed after each commit. There is also one more uh, uh, GitHub action we released, which is uh, um, able to uh, compile reports. So after you run, the, after the, the automatic compilation is run, you will get also some information uh, related to the uh, changes uh, in resources used by the sketch. This is displayed, uh, if you want, also as a comment, uh, as an automatic comment in your pull request, showing uh, whether your change is introducing, for instance, an optimization uh, uh, in, uh, or, or increased consumption in terms of memory, for instance, or in terms of sketch size. So you can keep track of the impact of your changes. And this is very important because you see it as a matrix on all the platforms you want to 
uh, support. These actions are completely open source. You can find them on the Arduino GitHub. So get, get them now in order to increase the quality uh, of, your, of your code. Uh, last but not least, I would like to talk about uh, the library ecosystem. I'm sure most of you are familiar with libraries because they are the building blocks that accelerate uh, um, your development. Uh, as of now, this, these are the numbers. Uh, the Arduino library index contains uh, 5,200 libraries, uh, which is a huge number. Also considering that uh, just during this year, during the past nine months, we got 700 more libraries registered in the index. So the community is growing even faster than in the past. We um, counted that 76% uh, of those libraries declare explicit compatibility with ESP32. Uh, which is a huge number, which means that there is plenty of choice of libraries doing uh, whatever you want, from displays to network, uh, to radio, to communication protocols. Uh, everything is uh, uh, likely to be found uh, in the Arduino library index. Uh, one important thing that we did, uh, and that probably uh, is uh, behind this uh, growth of libraries, is that we dismissed our manual approval process in favor of an automated submission process. Uh, now you just have to go to a GitHub repository called uh, Arduino slash library registry, and you submit your library just by editing a file. So you submit a pull request uh, with the URL of your repository. That's everything you need to submit, uh, no additional information. Then a bot will automatically check your library will automatically check if it's correctly formatted, will give you warnings, will help you troubleshoot the mistakes. And if everything is fine, it will automatically, instantly approve your library, which will be added in the Arduino Library Manager and available for all users inside the ID and listed in the Arduino website. That's all from, uh, from Arduino. I look forward to discuss uh, we, with you. Um, I want to remind that uh, all this is open source. Uh, we want to support all the boards, um, all the platforms, all the technologies and the architectures. Uh, and ESP, the ESP community, is so important for us. So uh, you are more than welcome to join development because all this is a collaborative effort. So if you want to improve things, to introduce a new feature, to share an idea, just reach out to us on the GitHub repositories, uh, which are the best place to join the development. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And now we are back for one more Q&A. And for this one, I would like to invite Alessandro to join us. Hi, Alessandro. Hi, how are you? Hello, hello, fine. Nice to meet you. Hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you, too. So we have a couple of questions here. So um, I will start with one from uh, Voita. So what's the best way to contribute to the new Arduino IDE 2.0, especially uh, for the new debugging feature? Yeah, uh, there is a GitHub repository where the development happens. Um, the Arduino team works uh, publicly using that GitHub repository also as a way to track all the activities because, of course, we want to be fully transparent in what's going on. Uh, so uh, please join the development, uh, uh, find the issues in the, the GitHub repository where you, in which uh, you are interested and join the discussion, basically. Be, I suggest to first join the discussion before you jump into coding. Uh, but of course, then uh, the, the, the very appreciated step is to submit a pull request with code. When it comes to debugging, uh, we... Um, so the, everything is fully open source, so you can already study how it is implemented for the uh, Cortex boards, uh, which are now supported. Basically, you will see there is a modular architecture with some metadata files which define the GDB server to, to be called and, uh, and so on. And then it uses an external uh, library called Cortex Debug to communicate with the board. Of course, this will be need to re be replicated uh, 
also for ESP32. We would like in the next months actually to document uh, this uh, architecture properly, uh, to define a proper specification on how debugging can be implemented for other boards. So if you're interested, join the GitHub discussion, uh, talk to the team, uh, so we can sync on the specifications for this. Okay, so next question. Would, would the, the coprocessor be able to be programmable in Arduino also? If not, what version of C could I expect to use? So I, I'm not the most expert per, per person on this topic. I, as far as I know, it is possible. As far as I know, there are libraries uh, uh, which can be imported that allow you to do this. Uh, um, I, I can tell you for sure that uh, for other boards, uh, like uh, Arduino boards with uh, multiple cores, uh, this is possible by basically selecting uh, the other core as if it was a different board in the board selector. So in the boards, you will find two boards, uh, uh, which are basically the two cores of the board. I thought this implemented this way, but uh, if it's not, it's technically, technically possible also this way. Okay, great. So next question. It is possible to better organize the board selection by adding some menu within the IDE 2.0, like example, like ESP submenu S2, S3, C3. Very, very good point, especially for a crowded uh, course like the Spear 32 one. Um, yeah, I, I would I would suggest, uh, Rodrigo, if you could uh, join GitHub and post this idea in the issue tracker so that the team uh, can uh, have a look at it. Great. Next question. Will especially the... especially because I, I love this thing. And the new idea, so, sorry, sorry, I just want to add a part of the, um, there is not just the menu to select the board. There is an entire dialogue, which is much more user-friendly. So it allows also to create a more uh, sophisticated or, or more clear navigation among boards. So definitely, yes. I see. So will the new IDE 2.0 also use library caching like Platform.io? Uh, good point. So the IDE 2.0 uses the Arduino CLI as the backend for compilation. The Arduino CLI now implements uh, um, some caching to a certain extent, but more can be can be implemented. That's uh, in the appending task in the issue tracker. So if you want to help us, uh, please join uh, join development, and we can make this happen. Good. Next live Q&A. Uh, sorry, <laughs> how how to use external uh, plugin tools. Uh, in the new ID 2.0. Is there a JSON port or anything else? This is a very important topic. I saw also other questions asking for the stack decoder extension of the Arduino IDE. Uh, yes, the plan is definitely to document how to create extensions for the IDE. This IDE is based on Thea, which is basically based on, this, on the specifications of Visual Studio Code. So, the, the architecture of these extensions of Visual Studio Code is the same used by the Arduino ID. So it's a matter of writing HTML and some TypeScript. So it, it, it's even a much mm, easier process than uh, developing in Java like the old ID required. So yes, we are going to release very, very soon the, the instructions and the specification on how to create these extensions so that everyone can develop third-party uh, extensions like the one mentioned before. Okay, great. So the last question, uh, would there be an effort to allow or simplify simplify implementing external plugin slash tool in the new ID? ESP Arduino has some tools for the old, uh, that need to be ported, like the ESP exception, exception decoder. Yeah, this is uh, yeah. The, the, the previous answer applies to this question as well. As soon as we document how to write these extensions, it will be extremely easy to create extensions for any kind of, of job. Extensions will be able to read data coming from the boards, so you can use it to display live uh, live data uh, and other and other things. Okay, so I think we have an additional question here. So I use many different boards. Is there a way to associate a .ino uh, file uh, with a board? Sure, it is. Um, this is possible now thanks to a feature that I mentioned during the talk, but I understand 
I, I spoke very, very fast and mentioned so many things. This thing is called Build Profiles, and it's available only on, this, on the command line for now, but it will be soon exposed also in the ID. But if you want to experiment with this on the command line tool, then just Google for um, Arduino CLI Build Profiles, you will find the instructions. Basically, when you do a compilation, you add the dump profile argument and the board, the board uh, identifier will be dumped to a file that you can later that you can store in the sketch and you can later reuse when you recompile that sketch as it will automatically select the same board you used the first time i see okay so i'd like to thank you for the talk for being here with us today for the q a session so thank you so much alessandra thank th thank you very much thank you everyone thank you bye Okay, so we have the next the next talk. Sorry, uh, Alan from Brazil. He will talk about developing natural user interface game using Nutix. So let's see uh, how it's done on Nutix. Hi, my name is Alan. I am Embedded System Engineer at Expressive Brazil. Today, I will explain how I created a natural user interface game running on Nutix RTOS. So, let's start the presentation. First of all, what is natural user interface? Conceptually, it's an invisible interface. That means we don't have some widget or physical button that the user will press or will interact. It is more natural. That means that these interfaces are more natural for human beings. Uh, Example of this, we can say gesture, um, also the voice and uh, finger movement like uh, finger pinch to zoom, to zoom in and zoom out interface. So uh, currently we already use some kind of a natural interface in our normal life. Uh, the best example of natural user interface, or maybe the example most remembered, is the 20 years ago movie Minority Report, where Tom Cruise uh, used some kind of uh, infrared uh, LED, LED in his finger to control some kind of uh, big screen, transparent screen or holographic screen in, in any way. And um, he show all the potential of this, this kind of interface. Uh, as a side note, uh, there is a nice CNN uh, report, a CNN video about uh, many technologies that Minority Report uh, forecast more than uh, 20, 20 years ago. So uh, what, what kind of devices you can use to create natural user interface? Uh, some example, uh, the sim simplest example is the Nintendo Emote, where you can use it to uh, move, uh, like uh, move a screen, just move your hand with this uh, control, controller. Uh, also the lip motion controller, where you can move your fingers and your hand in the screen and control windows or any, any kind of interface. Uh, also, the 
Microsoft Kinetic, uh, it can detect the human body and it can, uh, can execute anything based on gestures on other features that user or developer uh, decide to, to create. Uh, as I told before, the voice uh, assistant device also can be uh, an example of um, natural user interface. So when you interact with Alexa, uh, actually you are using natural uh, user interface. Also, uh, the uh, touch screen, when you do zoom in or zoom out, you are also using um, natural in, uh, user interface. And also for embedded system uh, developers uh, or enthusiasts, uh, there is some low cost uh, gesture sensors like the APDS, uh, 9960 uh, device. Uh, this device, uh, I I am using this device in uh, in this project. Here are the device that I talk about: the remote and uh, leap, leap motion in all these devices. Uh, so, how the idea uh, started? Uh, initially, I played with an um, Android game more than 10 years ago called Shift Game. Uh, I installed the F-Droid repository to install open source applications, uh, open source apps, and I found this nice game. It's like a mixture of uh, Tetris with uh, Crush Candy, and also uh, 2048 game. So uh, in this game, you need to move uh, the blocks to up, to down, to right, to left, and put the blocks with the same color together, and then they will disappear. They will be removed from the, uh, from the board, from the screen. So why to use Nerex instead of using Arduino or even some uh, simple RTOS? Why to use Nerex uh, for this project? First of all, uh, Nerex is a POSIX and Linux-like RTOS. That means uh, if I use it, I can create uh, the program using Linux. I can develop the logic and the interface and so on using Linux, and then I will move uh, to Nerex. I just recompile it uh, to Nerex. So Nerex has a video frame buffer, uh, very similar to Linux. Also, it has input device interface, so I can use uh, keyboard, uh, joystick, uh, or any other input device interface, just like Linux. And also, because Nerex already had this uh, gesture sensor integrated on it. So it was easy to, uh, to validate and to test this application. Uh, my initial plans or initial thoughts was ah, just two hours is enough to create this, this game. Uh, it's a very simple game. What could be difficult to, uh, to, do, to do it? Uh, I didn't uh, look or I didn't analyze the original uh, game source code. Uh, so all the, the game was, was developed from scratch uh, because I thought it just a very easy game. What could, could go wrong? So I can do it very easily. <laughs> At least that was, that was uh, what I was, uh, that was what I was thinking at that time. And the initial idea was, as I told, was to develop it on Linux, to test it without uh, recompiling in, in the firmware and flash the firmware and so on. I just compiled, used GCC to compile the, uh, the C file and run it on Linux. So 
it was faster than interact to to do it all the time and the initial idea was to develop it in test mode and then move it to frame buffer or to graphical interface so idea was to focus on logic instead of focusing on interface or graphical interface but um, when they started developing it in the first day i uh, I faced many uh, issues that I didn't uh, imagine uh, before starting it. Uh, for example, uh, this the in the left in the left side we have an example of the initial uh, board, the initial board game. So all the the border of the edge of the of the matrix has some initial. Uh, initial piece or an initial block uh, this block uh, has a, a different color and to identify what is the color i used number to to define it very simple just we use one for red uh, two for yellow three for blue and so on uh, but when i start to move up for example if i press the the move up key, uh, it should move up, but it cannot remove uh, the sail. Uh, it cannot uh, it cannot remove the block that was inside the screen originally uh, in the matrix originally. So, uh, in this example, if I move up, I need to. Uh, I, I need to move the the floor, for example, the number two four two four, uh, for the for the for the second floor, and the the new floor will get um, a new values that will be behind it that is behind in another uh, invisible uh, layer, for example, and it cannot remove the sale of the of the matrix and the same apply to uh, to walls and also to the floor if i move down i cannot remove the floor so uh, it was one of the first the first challenge to to fix it's it's not that difficult to fix but uh, uh, i was surprised when i move it and and didn't realize uh, it to move the, the block out of the screen initially. Uh, also, the blocks move like some kind of directional gravity uh, applied on it. For example, if the user press the arrows up, the key up, uh, it need to move the blocks to, to, uh, to the sail, to the up of the screen but every time one uh, one block hits other or is near the other it cannot over uh, overwrite it in uh, so for example this number one need to move until it um, get in the sale in the in the number three but after that uh, the other number one that is uh two uh two pieces or two cells behind it need to move to to the next empty cell and it cannot be overwritten uh the the other challenge that i have that i didn't uh go to it, to it but it's just a number here to say oh i have many many challenges uh before get the the game done. Uh, one of particular was when I start to search for horizontal lines. Uh, my initial plan was if I found um, uh, a horizontal line of the same blocks, I just go there and remove it. How I remove it? I write zero on it. So zero is an empty cell. But uh, as you can see here, I face some issues when, when I do it, when I did it. 
because uh, when do we when they remove a line uh, in the in the second line that could have some uh, equivalent cell with the same uh, with, with the same color block. Uh, in this case, uh, if I remove the first line, the the same color cell in the second line will be uh, will be in the uh, in the game board. It will not be removed. So I need to figure out how to fix it. And I came up with simple idea. Uh, so instead of removing the value, write zero in it, zero in, zero in it, I just uh, turn it negative. For example, if I want to indicate that number two or block, the yellow block uh, needs to be removed, uh, I turn it uh, negative. So when I do the, the other test, I will use the absolute value of the cell to compare. So uh, when it try to find some uh, some equivalent cells, it will realize the, the negative uh, two is, uh, is a valid cell and it's a congruent cell and we will remove it. And the similar applies to vertical lines. So uh, I did the same to the vertical lines. When I found a vertical line, I invert the signal. Uh, just on detail here, when I search for a uh, horizontal line, I start from top and go down. When I search for uh, for vertical lines, I, I swap the matrix uh in uh, moving in the in, in the same uh, column but uh navigating for each row by time and when i finish it i move to the next column and so on this way i can find the vertical lines more easily and the finally i just need to find the triplets let's say triplets so the three, three uh, adjacent cells with the same uh, block color and squares. So it's very easy. I, if I if I am in in the first cell, I just verify if the next horizontal cell is the same color and also in the next row is the same color and also in the next row and the next column is also the same color. So. I validate almost everything, but we are not done yet. That was only one that was missed in the original validation. And I I spent some time uh, to to realize it because normally the during the test, uh, many other uh, numbers or other blocks are removed for, first. So uh, only I, like I, I saw something similar to this one that's very clear uh, the inverted triplet was still in the uh, in the game board so I need to remove it and uh, internal joke or not so internal but um, I decide to make it a little bit more uh, uh, more attractive before moving to the graph mode. So I decided to replace uh, numbers with the uh, square color blocks and the, the border of the matrix, I replaced it also to Unicode's uh, grid to make it more, uh, more easy to, to see and more uh, uh, more nice to play, more uh, enjoyable. So time to move to Nerex. As expected, uh, it was just a matter of uh, recompile, recompile the, the code. And uh, it's for my surprise, even the raw uh, keyboard worked uh, nicely. So, uh, the term I use that used on Linux to implement the 
get character to avoid uh, uh, avoid pressing on, on keyboard and press enter. So I just press the arrow up and down and it will work very, uh, very nice. So uh, the next step after getting the game working in test mode was to create the interface or integrate uh, interface with the graphical, uh, graphical uh, LCD. But my idea was not to use LCD, but instead I was planning to use this um, RGB APA uh, 102 uh, matrix is a uh, standard SPI RGB LEDs. So it's a little bit more uh, expensive than the WS8212, uh, if I'm not wrong with the, the code. But uh, it is better because I don't need to worry about the times and other uh, signal integrity. It's just standard SPI. It's very easy to use. Is uh, I don't need to uh, to worry about implementing a new uh, a new interface or a new uh, standard. Uh, just uh, for curiosity, this other uh, RGB, the low cost RGB. Uh, WS8212 is also supported on, on Nerex, but uh, I don't like to, to use this kind of timing uh, to, to control the, the device. I, I prefer to use standard interface like SPI. So the driver uh, was very straightforward to, uh, to implement, except uh, it was a zigzag. Normally when, uh, when we have an LCD screen or LCD LCD display. Normally, after the the end of the first line, it will start from the left to the right. But in this uh, uh, in this matrix, uh, it is in uh, in zigzag because uh, the last LED uh, is connected directly to the to the um, near LED in the in the next line, so uh, I just implemented this zigzag in the in the source code. Uh, I detect the the row. If it is an uh, even row, uh, I keep the normal uh, buffer direction. If in, if uh, if it's odd. Um, direction if other row sorry uh, i go in inverse direction so instead of uh, getting the the buffer then the, the column start from the column zero i start from the last column and move it to the first column and here's the lcd interface working uh, i will show now uh, a small video show it running as you can see here as you saw it it was very fast and now we can finally integrate everything i use the uh the ESP32 C3 uh, Rusty board uh, developed by our friend Pedro Minatel. Uh, I integrate it with the RGB uh, matrix and with the uh, gesture sensor. Now I will show the, the demo of it working. Okay, let me start the demonstration. I will run the shift application. And as you can see, it's a little bit difficult to see the LED colors because the LEDs are too bright. So I create this plastic frame with some paper in the top. Now it's easier to, to see the, the blocks. And now I will start to play uh, the game. So if I move up, I put together the red 
blocks and they are eliminated because we have three blocks together. Same here, moving to the left, I put the green together. Also, another cyan appeared uh, and was removed. If I move down, I put these whites together and same I can do uh, if I move uh, two times, I can eliminate more blocks. For example, this young blocks in the right. Move down, move down again. So, uh, as you saw, it's a very, very nice, very strategic game. And sometimes it's better not to remove the current uh, block and wait for the next to eliminate, to nest move, to eliminate more blocks. And also it's very addictive game. So uh, it's really nice to play. And I think it's a nice game to have in, in some hacker clubs, in maker, uh, maker, uh, maker clubs, maker, uh, maker uh, offices and so on. And that is it. So let you go back to presentation. As you saw in this demo, it is very interactive and very, very nice uh, game to play. And uh, I plan to create later some uh, more integrated version with the LEDs and uh, the ESP32C3 in the same board and everything integrated uh, in like in uh, product. So uh, these are the conclusion. Uh, my initial uh, thought that just two hours was enough was totally wrong. I spent about three weekends uh, fixing uh, these bugs and uh, getting everything working uh, correctly. And it also proved that Nerx is very Linux-like compatible. So uh, I didn't, uh, I did spend time later uh, porting it to, to Nerx. It was just compiling and using the right interface on Nerx. Uh, the original goal was uh, reached as, it, uh, as you saw, uh, I got everything working as I was initially willing to, uh, to do. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this, uh, this presentation, this game. And if you have some questions or uh, other comment, please let me know. Okay, another amazing talk. And uh, now I'd like to invite Alan from the lovely city of Florianópolis to join us. Boa tarde, Alan. How are you today? Boa tarde, Pedro. I'm fine. Uh, and hello, everybody. And olá a todos do Brasil também. Muita gente aqui. Uh, thank yeah, you. I, 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 okay, so we have a couple of questions here. So I will start with uh, Thiago. So does this game have audio? Like, of course, we didn't hear anything. So can you say yeah. if there is or any plans to add? Yes, a good question. Um, actually, when I start developing this game, our ESP32 ships on Nerex uh, didn't support, didn't have support to audio. And recently we add audio support. So now it's possible to, to do that. And yes, it's in my plan to, to, to do some uh, explosion, like when you do put the, the, the blocks together, for example. Nice. Okay, next, next question from Rodrigo. Is there an easy way to simulate this Nerex game in Linux? Let's say I, I don't have the, the sensor, the display, how to emulate it and how, how it works uh, or how it works on its development? Uh, good question as well. 
Uh, actually, as I told, uh, I implemented it initially on Linux. So uh, this game don't need to be emulated on, uh, on Linux. Uh, it is just compile it. And the same game that works on Nerex will work on, on Linux. So, uh, but yes, it work only in, uh, in the test mode. Uh, to use it like um, uh, like like in the LED matrix, uh, probably uh, you need some uh, USB SPI adapter on Linux to to control the uh, the, the matrix. But yes, the, the game will work work the same way. Okay. Next question from Rodrigo. Uh, have you tried using Wokui with Nerex? Did, did you find any limitation? Uh, I didn't try it yet, but uh, I know some some guys are using it. And also, I think you uh, comment about it yesterday. Um, I think the basic is working, uh, but they, they are facing some Wi-Fi integration issues that may probably, I hope, Yurik help the Nerex community to, to fix. Let's see. But I will try also to run Nerex on, on the emulator. On, let's see. Should okay, nice. so we have one more question from Rodrigo. Uh, what's the major challenge you face along the development of this game application? Um, I think I faced many challenges as I I explained. Most are are very easy to to fix, but I I think the uh, the most difficult part was when I when I converted the test text mode to to graphic mode. Uh, so it, it was a little bit more complex because in text mode it was just uh, uh just x and y position very very simple but in graphical mode we need to to skip some uh some borders and uh, way more a little bit more complex and i ex also as as i explained it this matrix is not a normal lcd in nerx we we can uh, emulate the lcd uh, to get these matrix uh, working like a normal LCD, but this, this part need, uh, was implemented and it was a little bit tricky as well, but not not so much much, much difficult than than the other parts. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question, and I'd like to ask you: Is how can I get started with Nerex? Uh, yes, good good question, Pedro. Uh, I think the, the way to get it started, for example, is using the Nerex channel that I created some years ago. Also, for people that don't speak in English, we have here in Brazil, the Nerex Brazil, also in YouTube. And I, I think Nerex, just like Linux, was way more difficult in the past. Currently, it's very easy because now we can go in the nerex.apache.org and get the, um, better documentation. We didn't have, we didn't have uh, had any documentation or any good documentation in the past. Now there are many people using and it is way more, more easier. And yes, I, I think the Nerex channel is a good, a good start point because there are many videos and many uh, many step by step to to get it work. Also here in Brazil, in in Barcados, we have uh, a lot of uh, tutorials from uh, I think one, one very old from me and also from Sara, from Gustavo. Uh, I think now Thiago and Pedro also the other the other Pedro Pedro Bertolucci here in Brazil. Yeah, so. I think our community is, is improving, and so it's way more easy to, to get support on it. And also we have the Discord channel. I, I can pass the link 
in the in the chat later. Please. Okay, great. Thank you so much for being here for the talk and hope to see you soon. Me too. Have Thank a nice day. Good presentations for everybody. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Bye. Sorry. Okay, so we have one more uh, talk for today. Um, this is from Microsoft, another external uh, company that it's here at the conference. And they will talk about over uh, their updates. So uh, they will show us how to use that on Azure. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Today, we'll be talking about over-the-air updates and how to get these devices updated using the Azure device update. Uh, from Microsoft, I'm Wellington DeRise. I'm a PM on the Azure IoT team. And I, I, I'm Everton Scaburo da Silva. I'm a software engineer on the Azure IoT CSDK team. Awesome. Today, we'll be talking to you about how to do over the updates using the Azure device update. And for that, I have a diagram that explains a bit more in details on how this process will happen. Here we're showing two things. First is a device, an IoT device. And also in the other side here, we have um, everything that's inside Microsoft Azure. And the Azure ADU service will be connected both with the blob storage and also with IoT Hub, from which uh, with this connection, it would allow it to manage all of the update files and the manifest files. And the connection with the Hub will, uh, will allow the service to trigger updates and to show process updates. Now, on the device side, what we have is a combination of the free RTOS middleware and the embedded CSDK both components provided by Microsoft. And then when this device is connected via MQTT using an MQTT client, it will get notified by the service, ADU service via IoT Hub, that say hey, you're running version 1.0 and then the service will say, hey, you need to update to version 1.1. Then we'll be, so using the, the libraries that we are adding to the free RTOS middleware, we'll be parsing that information, making sure that this update request is coming from a trust a trustworthy uh, source. In this case, it is, we'll be checking if this is coming from Azure. And then the user application will be able to open up an HTTP connection, connect to the blob storage, download all of the bits, check if these bits are fine, and then uh, installing that in one of the memory banks. In this case, we'll be showing you today how to do that using an ESP32. And the ESP32 in this case, it is very unique as it has a lot of space for us to use, but mostly what happens is um, we're gonna have our sample installed in one of the partitions, say OTA1, and then uh, using uh, using the over the update, we're going to be writing the new version of the firmware to the second partition, and then the OTA data will just be pointing to this newer version, which means that we are not deleting the previous, the previous version that we have here. So in this case, if something goes wrong, you can always revert back to the previous version. Another thing that is very important when doing this is to make sure that you're using uh, you have your credentials stored in a non-volatile storage, meaning that all of your credentials for uh, both Wi-Fi and IoT are stored here so that your, um, your firmware will be looking at these credentials here, meaning that every time we can 
uh, have updates as much as you, as we want on the banks OTA one and two, and these credentials living here won't be erased. All right. And with that, let's move over to Everton so we can take a look at the process and how the how the libraries that we have will help you do this update. All right, thank you, Wellington. Uh, yes, so as Wellington has mentioned, we have this new service uh, to help with over there updates called Azure Device Update. And we are exposing this, the APIs for C applications to use the service. So customers can provide can uh, execute updates on their devices remotely. And uh, I'm going to just give an overview of how it works, the, the, the whole design works. And also start with uh, one of the samples that we have available right now. So we have here on the screen the on Azure portal, we have my own uh, personal IoT hub. And here now there's this new option, which is updates. And with updates, you can uh, generate an image and associate that image with a deployment. And this deployment is then associated with a group of devices. So these devices are going to then receive uh, an update request and will process that update request and send back statuses back to the portal, to uh, the IoT Hub and the ADU service. So the service knows if the updates are completed or not. And that way you can uh, update your whole fleet. And here we have uh, an example of an update that I've already performed. And I'm going to just show here. This has uh, one deployment that has already succeeded, as you can see here. On latest update, there is one device. And uh, it's this device here called OTA SAS 6. Uh, it says that it's already on the latest update that I've created, that is the 1.1. It was originally on 1.0 and then 1.1. Uh, I want to show quickly what we have here uh, in terms of uh, how this request goes down to the device. Uh, on IoT Hub, there is a messaging feature called uh, Device Twin. And that is a way to keep properties synchronized between devices uh, and the cloud. So there's always a, a synchronized set of property bags that the device can use. And this is what is used for the updates. There is a, a request that goes down to the device that is sent here. And this uh, update uh, information is going to give details of how the device should proceed to download the image, apply the image, and how to uh, refer back to this deployment to the service so it knows that it has completed. And an example here is how the device informs how, uh, in which stage it is and how the deployment has, has, has gone. Uh, here we can see that state is zero, which means uh, the, 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 the device is now idle in terms of uh, update and the current version is already 1.1. So this is for a previous device uh, that I've already updated. And that shows uh, that shows uh, how the communication works. Tying this all together, it all comes back to uh, the view that you have here with the status that is provided uh, without you having to dig into the device wing. It's just uh, an extra information for uh, understanding how the process works. And I would like to show you uh, the sample that we have implemented for uh, Priartos to use the new ADU, the Azure Device Update API. Uh, here we say we have a sample that is implemented on the SP32, how Wellington has described. And I'm going to go straight into the page that has the documentation here. Let me go to Expressive. As soon as we get to GA, this is going to be uh, available on main. For now, we have ADU. And here we have a complete description of all the steps needed for uh, anyone to be able to get from zero to a complete deployment on a ESP32 to use as a sample for a possible implementation. And 
I'm going to just start with like the the basics of uh, how that it's done. Once uh, we've cloned the repo, which is that same repo that I showed, uh, we have to navigate to the sample where uh, uh, the directory where the sample is. And we are using here uh, configuration uh, to be able to provide um, the sample with information like, for example, how to connect to your Wi-Fi and what is your IoT hub and your device ID. And to provide this configuration, we're using the standard way of uh, that is uh, used for the samples in the ESPIDF, which is using menu config. So right here, I'm going to run menu config. And uh, it, it goes a little faster because I've built it before, but it usually takes a, a few uh, seconds to get there. So we have uh, two sets of information. One is going to be the Wi-Fi information that you need to run to, to provide. Uh, here I'm using a, a generic Wi-Fi spot that is just with a generic set of password, uh, user uh, SSID and password. And just to remind that these boards that we're using, the ESP32, they need uh, a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi connection. So a 5 gigahertz connection will not work. So once these are provided, we go back here to the information we need to provide in ter terms of uh, what is your IoT hub and uh, device ID and the authentication method. So I'm going to provide the information that I have for IoT hub, which is my own IoT hub. And I am going to provide the other Uh, the other details for this device, which is uh, that I'm using here, OTA SAS 6. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to insert this information here. And for this samples, we're using symmetric keys for authentication. Uh, authentication can also be done with IoT Hub through uh, X509 or even using device provisioning. But for this sample, we're keeping it simple uh, and using uh, SAS tokens. And for that, we use the primary key for the generation. So once these are provided, we can save that information into a file, quit, and then we go ahead and build our solution. Uh, build usually takes about uh, like two minutes two and a half minutes to complete on my machine. And uh, in this case, it's going to run a little faster because I've also built it previously. So most of the components are already uh, pre-compiled. I thought it would be faster, but looks like it decided not to. All right, so now that the bid has uh, completed, uh, the next thing we need to do is to flash this image uh, of the sample into the device. So just to give a little more uh, uh, clarity of what is going on here. When the sample is compiled for the first time, the version that is uh, uh, hard-coded in the sample is the version 1.0. So if uh, when you follow the steps on that guide that we just shown uh, on the page, uh, you will see that you first will flash your device with version 1.0, and then it will generate a second image with version 1.1 or uh, the following. And then you are going to use Azure Device Update to uh, trigger the update to the device so it can uh, uh, consume that request and update itself. So here I am connecting uh, one ESP32 based board, which is the Azure IoT Kit. And after uh, verifying on device manager, 
I see that this device is connected to a COM5 port. So the next thing I'm going to do is just uh, uh, flash this device, and I'm going to monitor it as functionality. So here, uh, the, the rest of this uh, process uh, actually can be seen on a video that we have available on YouTube uh, that shows uh, we're going through all the steps on the guide that is also on the, on, on the samples repo. Uh, and you can see how this whole thing works from beginning to end with the device connecting and uh, uh, updating itself. And uh, what we're going to do here is uh, I'm going to turn back to Wellington and he's going to show a, another project that he has done that shows this in a much bigger scale, not just with one device. And uh, that's going to be pretty cool. Wellington? OK, thank you, Everton. So for this demo, what I'm going to be showing you is this set of eight ESP32 devices. They're all the same model. So this is a, a, a design that I did for this board. These devices are divided in three groups. One is the test lab, the second one building 17, the third one is called San Diego. They are divided like this. So I have a lab group, which is running uh, the firmware version 1.7. Uh, building 17 group is already updated to version 1.7. And then what, what we're gonna be doing is updating the San Diego group which is currently running version 1.6. So as you can see, is one version behind. And the way we can tell uh, which version each device is running is that all these devices have two LEDs, one yellow and one blue. So the version, the current version, which is uh, the previous version, which is 1.6, it turns the blue LEDs on. And as soon as these devices get updated and they get a new version, which is 1.7, they will actually turn the yellow LED on. So we can visually see that these devices are now in a different uh, version. Also, as you can see here, I have only three devices within each of these groups, but you can have many more according to your needs. And most likely, this is a scenario that will be happening in real life as well in which you would first deploy your new firmware to a small controlled group of devices, make sure that everything is fine. And once you can validate that's fine, then you can start deploying it to the next group and to the next group and to the next one. So you see that everything is fine. But don't worry, if something goes wrong, you can always revert it back. You can always downgrade these updates on the devices. Let me show you the real devices. All right, so in this, this camera view, you can see all of these devices. They're right here by my side. So as you can see here, uh, the test labs devices, both of them already have the yellow LED on. The building 17 also have the yellow LED on. And you see here that the SD02 and 03 both have the blue LED on. Uh, I just had a small issue with the SD01, so for now it is uh, unplugged, but I can still show you this working with two devices. Let me move now to the ADU portal to show you how that works. Okay, so now we are seeing the same window that Everton was showing before. However, here I have all three of my groups, the lab group, the building 17 group, and the San Diego group. Also, you can see that this first group here, it has two devices and it's already on the current deployment, as you can see by the last column, which says current deployment. Same thing goes to the building 17 group, it's also on the current deployment. And you can see by this chart on top here that shows the green part saying that five devices are already on the latest update and three devices still need to be updated to the latest version. So what we're gonna be doing now is deploying. So I'm gonna hit deploy. When we do that, we have the option of start this update immediately or schedule this update to happen in a certain sometime in the future. So in this case, I'm gonna go and hit 
create right now to start this immediately. And with that, we will revert the camera now so we can see what's going on on these devices. All right, now let's take a look at what's going on here. So I hit the deploy and deploy now. And as you can see here, this is uh, the terminal looking at one of the devices that's one of the devices. And it was showing previously uh, the version 1.6. So remember, we asked it to update to version 1.7. So what happens here is once we start uh, the, the, pro the update process, the device will get the um, twin patch saying that, hey, this is the new desired version of your uh, firmware that you need to update. So it gets all of this uh, information so that it will verify if this manifest is the JWS manifest to see if the signature of that is a good one. And once it does that and, and it makes sure that the, the SHA-256 for that matches, so what it does is accept the update request. So it will create the HTTP uh, handle for that. It will download all of these packages. So just breaking uh, the download into smaller uh, chunks. So to make it uh, better to use, we get the whole image. We assemble it back. We check the hash once again, this time for the image. Once uh, that's completed. So now we're good to start uh, saving um, this update in a different uh, memory bank. Once we have that, the device boots up and then it would wake up, get the credentials and voila, it's already showing that it's on the version 1.7. So if we go back now, if we go back now to the ADU and I hit refresh, what we'll see is that now seven of the devices are on the latest update. And yeah, if I click here to bring the devices again, you see that, yeah, that makes sense. One of the devices that is off camera is already updated. And I also have here, as you can see, this uh, device here in the middle is also uh, with the yellow LED on, meaning that this is also uh, updated. And we have only one missing right now, which is the SD03, which is absolutely normal. So the service won't, once you hit deploy, it won't just send the same information down to all of your devices because we don't want you know, a massive amount of devices trying to stop what they're doing, trying to get the bits and then upgrading. It will also, it will actually, uh, wait a couple of minutes so we will send the messages to the different devices within the group uh, with some time interval between them, right? So this is absolutely normal. And as you can see, two of these devices are already updated. All right, with that, we end our presentation. So the call to action for you is if you have an ESP32, please go ahead and try uh, the sample. You will find the description here below on this link uh, that takes you to the ESP32 sample for over the update. And please let us know if you or your customers have questions or if you need any help. You also can file an issue or send questions for us on that GitHub repo. And with that, we end our presentation. Uh, thank you for your time, right, Everton? Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Hi, I'm back. And now I'd like to invite Wellington and Dane to join us for the Q&A session. Hey, guys, how are you today? Good, how about you, Pedro? Actually, it's good morning for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, so uh, we have one question here. So um, when ADU will become available? Oh, that's a oh, good question. question. Yes, so the service is already available. Uh, that's from the, the cloud part, from the Azure service is already available. 
our library, which goes along with the free RTOS uh, middleware, is currently in preview. So as Everton showed, they're still living on a separate branch. It's not part of main quite yet. But hey, it's open. Anyone can take a look at that. As all of the things we do from our team, it's open source and it is free uh, to use and modify and do however you need to change it. And it will become GA, meaning it will be incorporated to main uh, in a month. So we're close to that. Okay, so and it, it'd be ready for like commercial commercial use. Exactly for production scenarios. Yes. Production. Yes. Yes. Right now, what's live? It's not really meant for uh, production scenarios because it might change a little uh, still. Uh, but yeah, in a month, it will be good to go for for production scenarios, so folks can, I don't know, maybe design their own circuits you know and and have and have uh, over the head updates go into their esp 32s yeah i have one more question uh we had this morning like this morning here in europe a talk about the, the component manager and do you have any plans or ideas about like adding the uh the adu into the the component manager yes and actually not only the the adu because adu is part of a bigger strategy we have for the the expressive chips right so it will be more than that it will be uh the free artos uh, middleware we created so free artos middleware is just a you know kind of a set of libraries that you can add to your free artos implementation and will make your esp32 to connect to azure and all of the azure services so yeah it will be part of that and i'm, I'm curious about the development board you are using so uh it is open source. Can you can you tell me a little bit more about the board that you are using? Because I, this is the first time that I'm seeing. Okay. This, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the the thing is, we from from the team, we needed some device to test what we we're doing. And personally, I don't like to work with uh, simulators, right? So if I if I can have a real sensor. I would rather go with a real sensor than with simulated ones, right? So we took here, you know, cheap uh, temperature humidity sensor with the DHT11. Uh, uh, I added, so there's an LDR here, so a light sensor, a buzzer, NeoPixel, that kind of stuff, so very, very basic uh, sensors. So we could have not only one, but as you can see here, <laughs> that I still have those, right? So I can have a bunch of these devices manufactured. I can build them myself leave them all on so I can always test what we're doing. So every time uh, Dane comes up with a new version of the, the ADU for over the uh, updates, I can I can run this on all of my devices. So yeah, um, I don't have this published anywhere, but I can, it's, it's a simple design, yeah. Nice, and is there any other uh, like update or uh, roadmap, that, roadmap that you could share with us uh, I know from from the talk, but do you have any any news since the talk? Um, yes, actually we do. Uh, so because we know over the updates are so important for so many IoT scenarios, and also we know that not everyone is currently using a free RTOS. So we know free RTOS is, is super cool, but not everyone uses that. So we're also bringing the over the air capability for the ESP32 using Arduino. Right. So if you use Arduino, I don't know. I don't want to get into free RTOS. It's too complex. It's OK. You can use the ESP32 libraries for Azure on the Arduino. And it will also get uh, over the ad updates there. So it's much Yeah, bare, bare metal scenarios. You can import the Arduino library. Um, and then we'll have a sample there for people to use um, as well. Nice. And when you say like ESP32, it also includes like S3, S2 uh c3 eventually uh and new other uh any other like uh family that we have currently it should work honestly we test and our our in our lab we only have the the esp32 right that's the only one we are testing with nothing should prevent it from working on the other ones especially given that most of our libraries they do they don't do um io so our libraries would require external uh, MQTT client and TLS and socket connection anyway. So it should work. It's just that we don't test for them and we don't have 
specific samples for that yet. That's something we might need to work on the future, Pedro. Yeah, we have one one comment here from Tiago. One common problem when you have thousands of device, thousand devices installed, it's to upgrade them. But not all devices can be updated usually, or you have to take care to update the device during a no critical activity. So this is like pretty cool. Yeah. Comment. Yeah, and actually on that point, so the last point about the update the device during a non-critical activity. So what you can do on the device is uh, essential, essentially read that the service has an update for the device, and the device can choose when to apply that update. So the the basics are there, so the, the endpoint, the verification, and you can send a response to the service saying, you know, I accept this update, I verified it, this is an update that I want to take. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm going to off put it when, you know, let's say the device isn't uh, under a huge load. Uh, maybe it's late at night or, or whatever the scenario is. So you can, the user can actually take, uh, take advantage of, of updating it when uh, it's best for that device specifically. That's one more question from Tiago. In ADU, can you classify the equipments in different groups and manage different versions? Yes, yes. So you can group your devices uh, with a handful of tags. So you can have a, a certain, um, let's say, a, a certain set of ESP 32s or, or whatever other devices you have. Um, and let's say the devices are specific for different boards. You can group those different boards into different update groups and deploy the updates to those groups separately. Um, and even if, the, let's say, the boards are, are uh, the same type, but they're getting different updates or they're in different areas, um, you can deploy those separately. So you can group your devices however you want based on tags, which we should have um, in our in our readme and our instructions. That's a great point. Yeah. As you can see on the video too, right? On, on my device, on my sample, which I have these two devices in a group, this device in a group, this device in another group. So I could you know, define what was the best time to deploy to each of these groups. In this case, all of these devices were the same. So same firmware for all of the devices. But yeah, as Dane said, you could have different groups with different types of devices. And so you have different firmware uh, uh, upgrades going to different devices. But yeah, great question, Tiago. Thank you. It's OK. And one, I think we have time for one more question. And how can ID, ADU integrate with the new announced matter 1.0 uh, specification? Or are these competing, compatible schemes? That's a good question. Uh, I'm no matter expert, but I can tell you right now that the, the protocols that ADU uh, is using, as you could see on the video, will be pretty much the device connects using MQTT for all of its basic connection with the cloud and notification and things like that. And it's using HTTP to download the, the firmware image and things like that. So it's to say that it's kind of a different approach. It's not to say that we won't ever look at matter because we know it's it's getting more and more uh, popular. But currently, this is, this is how uh, the service works. Great. Okay, so I'd like to thank you for the talk and being here for the, the question and answers. So have thank a nice day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, you too. Everyone else, appreciate it. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, and we have no more talks today. And now we have uh, the QA session. The general q a session with our vp of software uh, platforms eva so now i'd like to invite eva to join us hey eva how are you hi Peter. uh still good very happy about the conference yeah so we have a couple of questions here so we Picked some of the questions during the today, and now we will uh, try to like uh, answer all of them. So let's start for the first one here. So ESP thirty two C five dual band Wi Fi was announced was announced last June, but nothing visible 
has happened about since then. Uh, when can we get specs or when can we get chips? So C5 at the moment is uh, internally available in Espresso in the form of engineering samples. Uh, we don't have the fixed date of mass production yet, uh, but uh, my best guess at the moment is that we will have the uh, engineering samples available to our customers in around April next year. Uh, you can contact, contact Espresso uh, sales at espresso.com uh, in the meantime, and they will uh, put you in the queue to get the samples when they become available. Okay, one more question about new chips. Uh, Feltsam ESP32 C6 supported in IDF uh, 5.1 uh, dev, but cannot find any uh, data sheet of uh, ESP32 C6. When, it'll, when will the ESP32 C6 release? Uh, for C6, the timeline is a bit more clear at the moment. Uh, I think we will be able to ship samples to customers in Q1 next year. So same as for C5, please do contact sales at espressive.com if you're interested, and they will put you in the queue. Okay. Next, next question. Are the C++ 20 features uh, that would not be supported like uh, cool routines, uh, file systems, file systems, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, so for C++20, I think coroutines can be used at the moment um, to the extent that you can find a library that implements them. Um, I think some of our colleagues are working on the ASIO port, ASIO library port for ESP IDF, and uh, as far as I know, coroutines do work there. Uh, as for C++, uh, as for C++ uh, file system library, yes, this is indeed not supported yet. Uh, there are a few limitations in how uh, we integrate our virtual file system. So we will resolve this, but probably not in, definitely not in 5.0, might be 5.1 or one of the later releases. Uh, aside from that, I think uh, all the features that are supported by GCC uh, in GCC 11 at the moment, uh, they will work. Uh, keep in mind that GCC 11 does not implement all C++ uh, 20 features. Okay. Next is not a question, but we have uh, some feedback for you. So ESP32DE said, your WASP3 example works like a charm in IDF 5.1. Few things must be uh, re-headed, retyped. Thanks for the example. Oh yeah, happy, happy that you found it. Um, this was an example that I did for one of our internal um, hands-on workshops here at Espressive, uh, just to demonstrate WebAssembly on embedded devices to uh, our colleagues. I haven't updated the example for 5.0 or 5.1, uh, so it's a good reminder. And generally, I think WebAssembly is a pretty interesting technology. We are kind of always on the look of how to use it, how to deploy it in embedded devices, but the capabilities for isolation and uh, uh, also being able to compile from many different languages into WebAssembly. That's, that's really cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's an interesting space to watch. Nice. Okay, next one. Uh, will ESP Modbus uh, utilize Modbus TCP or Modbus RTU or both? Uh, both. Uh, the library is the same as uh, the free Modbus library in IDF 4.4 with some improvements that have been done since. Uh, so it supports both TCP and RTU uh, and uh, server and client or master and slave. Okay. Next question. Is there a good TOF, TOF time of flight example for the ESP S3? Also, uh, is it just Wi-Fi TOF or can, can be used uh, with other sources? Uh, an example like emitter, uh, sensor, so functions like high resolution timer and ADC. Uh, there is a Wi Fi time of flight example in ESP IDF. You can find it under examples Wi Fi FTM. 
uh, FTM stands for fine time measurement, and that's the kind of official name of this feature. Uh, maybe even Pedro knows more about FTM than I do, because I remember that uh, you, Pedro, did some experiments with it. Um, so yeah, we'll take a look at the readme of that example. It uh, does explain how to set up the responder and uh, initiator. And then you can flash to development boards. Uh, this feature is supported from ESP32S2 and later. Uh, as for other protocols or like physical physical connectivity, I think this is not going to work with Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi uses very specific hardware. Uh, if you have some time scale that uh, is on the um, on the range of times that can be measured at the APB clock of ESPersif chip, like 80 megahertz typically. Uh, then you can use something like an RMT peripheral. So for example, you can set up one RMT channel to generate just a very narrow pulse, uh, sort of one sample at 80 megahertz, and then use another RMT channel as receiving channel where you will receive both the generated pulse and the response. And then you can use RMT to measure. So the resolution in this case will be uh, uh, whatever is one, one cycle at 80 uh, megahertz of 12.5 nanoseconds. Okay, so next, very nice updates. If I'm using uh, Arduino IDE, do I get the new features of IDF? Yeah, I think this was a question after the talk about IDF 5.0. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer at the moment is no, you don't yet. Uh, Arduino IDE, the Espressive Arduino Core is currently using the version 4.4.x, uh, 4.4.2 uh, at the moment. Uh, there is a plan to upgrade the uh, IDF version used in Arduino Core to something more recent. And uh, I think at the moment, the plan is to upgrade directly to 5.1 when 5.1 is going to be released. So sometime in the future, there will probably be a branch on Arduino ESP32 GitHub repository, uh, which will allow using IDF master branch. And eventually, we will try to converge so that by the time that IDF 5.1 releases, Arduino ESP32 core will also support the 5.1 release. So you'll have to wait a bit. OK. Um, next one. Do you think you will switch ESP IDF to C++ in the future? Uh, yeah, this is a, a question that I think was raised after Jacob's talk about C++. Uh, C++ brings a lot of nice features, and uh, it can help redu or reduce the chance of making some mistakes that are common in C proje projects. Um, however, at the moment, we probably will not switch to C++ uh, because uh, there are still quite a lot of projects where developers write C code, and using C++ code from C would require uh, creating wrappers, essentially the same as our C APIs right now. And that means that losing a lot of those safety guarantees that you can get from C++ if you use uh, different good practices in d designing C++ APIs. So effectively, we would still have to provide the same C APIs as we do right now to satisfy the needs of uh, some of our users and uh, yeah, plus work on C++. So we decided to approach the program, uh, sorry, the problem in the other way um, at, at the moment. So we will have the C-based SDK, and then the C++ will be, C++ classes will be provided uh, as a separate repository that will be wrapping the C APIs. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, what I can tell so far about C and C++. OK, so last one. Unrelated to this specific talk, but does anyone know when chip switched from the default date of uh, January 8th 2013 to January 8th, 2016, and then Ju July 9th, 2019. <laughs> oh, yeah, those dates I know really well. Um, so the, the the dates actually, to give some context, the dates, those are the dates that are printed uh, on UART when you reset the ESP chip. So if you take an ESP8266, it will print January 18, 2013. And if you take an ESP32, then it will print June 8, 2016. But if you take a slightly newer ESP32, then it will print July 9, 2019. And essentially, it's just the 
uh, the timestamp, date stamp, um, when the ROM code inside the ESP chip has been compiled. So uh, ESP8266 ROM code was compiled in some January 2013. And then for the ESP32, we compiled the final ROM code in June 2016. And then we had ESP32 ECO3, revision 3, which uh, contained uh, some security fixes and generally some improvements. And then we had to compile the ROM code again, and that was in July 9, 2019. And other chips, like for example, ESP32 S2, it will have some other date, like uh, I don't know, some some date in autumn 2019, I suppose. Okay, so now I'd like to know if you have any other question, like from from your side to be answered. I'm not sure if you have some or anything that you'd like to share with us. So. I, I'm looking at the YouTube chat right now and seeing if there is uh, there have been any other questions uh, posted recently. <clears throat> there is a question about what about ESP32 H2? Is mass production already happening? Um, I think this was answered yesterday in the general Q and A by Ame. Uh, so H2 will H2 samples will be available, I think, in Q2 uh, or end of Q1, early Q2. Uh, next year so uh, yeah basically slightly after the c6 and same thing that i said about c6 and c5 apply you can uh, contact sales at com and they will put you in the queue uh, for getting the uh, the samples when they become available okay. um, and another uh, one i see in the chat uh, oh yeah was... uh, go ahead Pedro. Yep. so one from uri when a developer should choose OS for ESP32, there are options like ESP, IDF, Nautics, or Zephyr. Are there specific use cases when one of these systems is better? Uh, yeah, there are probably several, um, several things that you need to consider. Um, we have a blog post on Espressif website about support of third party operating systems, Zephyr and Nautics, and the answer is to some extent given there. Um, very briefly, uh, you probably would want to choose Nautics if you're interested in a POSIX uh, compatible operating system. So Nautics is probably the closest out of three uh, uh, compared to Linux. So if you are, have some Linux-based uh, code already and you would like to have the sort of gentle migration into embedded space, so if you want to use the same uh, programming model as you would use on Linux, then probably Nautics is uh, the right choice. Um, Zephyr is supported by a lot of other, um, or rather Zephyr supports a lot of other hardware from other manufacturers. So if you have uh, projects which need to target different chips, or you already have some code base that has been written for other microcontrollers on Zephyr, or you have multiple chips in your design or maybe you have multiple products and Zephyr covers all the chips and Zephyr is a really good choice. <clears throat> uh, as for ESP IDF, uh, choosing ESP IDF probably be if you are interested in getting the fastest um, fastest updates from Espressive. So if uh, you are uh, if you need uh, quick support then we will be able to provide that for ESP IDF uh, better than for um, other frameworks at the moment. Um, also, ESP IDF is primarily optimized at IoT applications. So, if you're building something IoT related, then you will find uh, that ESP IDF plus the components around it, they kind of come with all batteries included. So, we believe that if you want to build a production application, then uh, you will primarily need to only write your business logic and all the other features, um, the cloud connectivity, over the air updates, uh, diagnostics, everything will be provided uh, for you. Okay, not sure if it was this question you tried to mention, but not sure if you have it. Yeah, that is the blog post. Yeah. Yeah, so Sergio, he shared the, uh, the blog post. I think it's this one. Okay, so I think we have a, here a question about uh, the S3 with the LX7 is very interesting, but the RAM, the RAM is still small. Can can you increase it in a new chip? <laughs> um, yeah, we have some some 
devices in our pipeline that uh, probably will have more RAM than S3. Um, so far, what I can say is that uh, S3 luckily supports PS RAM, so you can connect quite a lot of, I think, up to 32 megabytes of PS RAM uh, to an ESP32 S3, and for a lot of application applications, uh, PS RAM can be fast enough, especially if you use octal PS RAM and run it at higher uh, frequency. Um, generally, putting more RAM on the chip is possible, but it makes the chip uh, more expensive. And uh, to be able to justify making a new product, we also need to make sure that it will we will be able to sell it in sufficient quantities. So that's kind of uh, one of the limiting factors here. Uh, so for some products, it will definitely make sense to uh, uh, to have more RAM. And uh, when we have a right use case, we will increase the amount. Okay, thank you. So I I think we have no more time for for question, but. Uh, we will try to answer on, right on the chat. So I'd like to thank you to, for, for this special Q&A session. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so uh, today uh, we make history. As we finish the first Expressive Conference, marking an important milestone in Sprecif story. In the last two days, we covered content about many Sprecif products and third-party solutions. Before we finish the conference, I will share with you some numbers about the last two days. Two special keynotes, 31 talks, 43 speakers, two special Q&A. There are more than 20 hours of streaming. The number of registered attendees was over 1,600. I'd like to thank you all in the backstage that made this conference possible. Ioannis for being an outstanding host, and Voita for all your help, dedication, and also moderating this conference with me. The marketing team for preparing all the material that we use during the conference. The documentation team for supporting us with subtitles and translations, and Embarcados Brazil for helping us preparing the talks. A big thank you to all the amazing expressive developers, the people behind the scenes who have spent so many hours preparing the talks, bring expressive products and solutions closer to the community. Thank you all for the external speakers for being part of this. You guys are amazing. And now a special big thank you to Theo Suya our CEO for believing in this project, and Eva, VP of Software Platforms, for supporting this event. I should say goodbye. However, I will say see you next, next year. Thank you.